The Old Wives' Tale by Arnold Bennett Book Three Sophia Chapter One The Elopement One Her soberly rich dress had a countrified air as she waited, ready for the streets, in the bedroom of the London Hotel on the afternoon of the first of July, eighteen sixty six. But there was nothing of the provincial in that beautiful face, nor in the bearing at once shy and haughty, and her eager heart soared beyond geographical boundaries. It was the Hatfield Hotel in Salisbury Street, between the Strand and the River. Both street and hotel are now gone, lost in the vast foundations of the Savoy and the Cecil, but the type of the Hatfield lingers with ever-increasing shabbiness in Jermyn Street. In 1866, with its dark passages and crooked stairs, its candles, its carpets and stuffs which had outlived their patterns, its narrow dining-room, where a thousand busy flies ate together at one long table, its acrid, stagnant atmosphere, and its disturbing sensation of dirt everywhere concealing itself, it stood forth in rectitude as a good average modern hotel. The patched and senile drabness of the bedroom made an environment that emphasised Sophia's flashing youth. She alone in it was unsullied. There was a knock at the door, apparently gay and jaunty, but she thought truly, "'He's nearly as nervous as I am.' And in her sick nervousness she coughed, and then tried to take full possession of herself. The moment had at last come which would divide her life as a battle divides the history of a nation. Her mind, in an instant, swept backwards through an incredible three months. The schemings to obtain and hide Gerald's letters at the shop, and to reply to them, the far more complex and dangerous duplicity practised upon her majestic aunt at Axe, the visits to the Axe post-office, the three divine meetings with Gerald at an early morning by the canal feeder, when he had told her of his inheritance, and of the harshness of his uncle Boldero, and with a rush of words had spread before her the prospect of eternal bliss, the nights of fear, the sudden dizzy acquiescence in his plan, and the feeling of universal unreality which obsessed her, the audacious departure from her aunts, showering a cascade of appalling lies, her dismay at Knipe Station, her blush as she asked for a ticket to London, the ironic, sympathetic glance of the porter who took charge of her trunk, and then the thunder of the incoming train, her renewed dismay when she found that it was very full, and her distracted plunge into a compartment with six people already in it, and the abrupt reopening of the carriage door, and that curt inquisition from an inspector. Wherefore, please? Wherefore? Wherefore? Until her turn was reached. Wherefore, miss? And her weak little reply. Euston! And more violent blushes and then the long, steady beating of the train over the rails, keeping time to the rhythm of the unanswerable voice within her breast, "'Why are you here? Why are you here?' And then Rugby, and the awful ordeal of meeting Gerald, his entry into the compartment, the rearrangement of seats, and their excruciatingly painful attempts at commonplace conversation in the publicity of the carriage. She had felt that that part of the enterprise had not been very well devised by Gerald, and at last London, the thousands of cabs, the fabulous streets, the general roar, all dream-surpassing, intensifying to an extraordinary degree the obsession of unreality, the illusion that she could not really have done what she had done, that she was not really doing what she was doing. Supremely and finally the delicious torture of the clutch of terror at her heart as she moved by Gerald's side through the impossible adventure. Who was this rash, mad Sophia? Surely not herself. The knock at the door was impatiently repeated. "'Come in,' she said timidly. Gerald Scales came in. Yes, beneath that mien of a commercial traveller who has been everywhere and through everything, he was very nervous. It was her privacy that, with her consent, he had invaded. He had engaged the bedroom only, with the intention of using it as a retreat for Sophia until the evening, when they were to resume their travels. It ought not to have had any disturbing significance. But the mere disorder on the washstand, a towel lying on one of the cane chairs, 
made him feel that he was affronting decency, and so increased his jaunty nervousness. The moment was painful, the moment was difficult beyond his skill to handle it naturally. Approaching her with factitious ease, he kissed her through her veil, which he then lifted with an impulsive movement, and he kissed her again more ardently, perceiving that her ardour was exceeding his. This was the first time they had been alone together since her flight from Axe, and yet, with his worldly experience, he was naive enough to be surprised that he could not put all the heat of passion into his embrace, and he wondered why he was not thrilled at the contact with her. However, the powerful clinging of her lips somewhat startled his senses, and also delighted him by its silent promise. He could smell the stuff of her veil, the sarsenet of her bodice, and— as it were wrapped in these odours as her body was wrapped in its clothes, the faint, fleshly perfume of her body itself. Her face, viewed so close that he could see the almost imperceptible down on those fruit-like cheeks, was astonishingly beautiful. The dark eyes were exquisitely misted, and he could feel the secret loyalty of her soul ascending to him. She was very slightly taller than her lover, but somehow she hung from him, her body curved backwards, and her bosom pressed against his, so that instead of looking up at her gaze, he looked down at it. He preferred that. Perfectly proportioned though he was, his stature was a delicate point with him. His spirits rose by the uplift of his senses. His fears slipped away. He began to be very satisfied with himself. He was the inheritor of twelve thousand pounds, and he had won this unique creature. She was his creature— he held her close, permittedly scanning the minutiae of her skin, permittedly crushing her flimsy silks. Something in him had forced her to lay her modesty on the altar of his desire, and the sun brightly shone. So he kissed her yet more ardently, and with the slightest touch of a victor's condescension, and her burning response more than restored the self-confidence which he had been losing. "'I've got no one but you now.' she murmured in a melting voice. She fancied in her ignorance that the expression of this sentiment would please him. She was not aware that a man is usually rather chilled by it, because it proves to him that the other is thinking about his responsibilities, and not about his privileges. Certainly it calmed Gerald, though without imparting to him her sense of his responsibilities. He smiled vaguely. To Sophia his smile was a miracle continually renewed, it mingled dashing gaiety, with a hint of wistful appeal in a manner that never failed to bewitch her. A less innocent girl than Sophia might have divined from that adorable half-feminine smile that she could do anything with Gerald except rely on him. But Sophia had to learn. "'Are you ready?' he asked, placing his hands on her shoulders and holding her away from him. "'Yes,' she said, nerving herself. Their faces were still very near together. "'Well, would you like to go and see the Doré pictures?' A simple enough question, a proposal felicitous enough. Doré was becoming known even in the five towns, not assuredly by his illustration as to the Comte Drolatique of Balzac, but by his shuddering biblical conceits. In pious circles Doré was saving art from the reproach of futility and frivolity. It was indubitably a tasteful idea on Gerald's part to take his love of a summer's afternoon to gaze at the originals of those prints which had so deeply impressed the five towns. It was an idea that sanctified the profane adventure. Yet Sophia showed signs of affliction. Her colour went and came, her throat made the motion of swallowing, there was a muscular contraction over her whole body, and she drew herself from him. Her glance, however, did not leave him, and his eyes fell before hers. "'But what about the wedding?' she breathed. That sentence seemed to cost all her pride, but she was obliged to utter it, and to pay for it. "'Oh!' he said, lightly and quickly, just as though she had reminded him of a detail that might have been forgotten. "'I was just going to tell you. It can't be done here. There's been some change in the rules.' I only found out for certain last night. But I've ascertained that it'll be as simple as ABC before the English consul at Paris. And as I've got the tickets for us to go over to-night, as we arranged—' He stopped. 
She sat down on the towel-covered chair, staggered. She believed what he said. She did not suspect that he was using the classic device of the seducer. It was his casualness that staggered her. Had it really been his intention to set off on an excursion and remark as an afterthought, "'By the way, we can't be married, as I told you at half-past two to-day?' Despite her extreme ignorance and innocence, Sophia held a high opinion of her own common sense and capacity for looking after herself, and she could scarcely believe that he was expecting her to go to Paris, and at night, without being married. She looked pitiably young, virgin, raw, unsophisticated, helpless in the midst of dreadful dangers. Yet her head was full of a blank astonishment at being mistaken for a simpleton. The sole explanation could be that Gerald, in some matters, must himself be a confiding simpleton. He had not reflected. He had not sufficiently realised the immensity of her sacrifice in flying with him even to London. She felt sorry for him. She had the woman's first glimpse of the necessity for some adjustment of outlook as an essential preliminary to uninterrupted happiness. "'It'll be all right,' Gerald persuasively continued. He looked at her, but she was not looking at him. She was nineteen, but she seemed to him utterly mature and mysterious. Her face baffled him. Her mind was a foreign land. Helpless in one sense she might be. Yet she, and not he, stood for destiny. The future lay in the secret and capricious workings of that mind. "'Oh, no!' she exclaimed curtly. "'Oh, no!' "'Oh, no, what? We can't possibly go like that,' she said. "'But don't I tell you it'll be all right?' he protested. "'If we stay here and they come after you. Besides, I've got the tickets and all.' "'Why didn't you tell me sooner?' she demanded. "'But how could I?' he grumbled. "'We haven't had a single minute alone.' This was nearly true. They could not have discussed the formalities of marriage in the crowded train, nor during the hurried lunch with a dozen cocked ears at the same table. He saw himself on sure ground here. "'Now could we?' he pressed. "'And you talk about going to see pictures,' was her reply. Undoubtedly this had been a grave error of tact. He recognised that it was a stupidity, and so he resented it, as though she had committed it and not he. "'My dear girl,' he said, hurt, "'I acted for the best. It isn't my fault if rules are altered and officials silly.' "'You ought to have told me before,' she persisted sullenly. "'But how could I?' He almost believed in that moment that he had really intended to marry her, and that the ineptitudes of red tape had prevented him from achieving his honourable purpose, whereas he had done nothing whatever towards the marriage. "'Oh, no! Oh, no!' she repeated, with heavy lip and liquid eye. "'Oh, no!' He gathered that she was flouting his suggestion of Paris. Slowly and nervously he approached her. She did not stir nor look up. Her glance was fixed on the washstand. He bent down and murmured, "'Come now, it'll be all right. You'll travel in the ladies' saloon on the steam-packet.' She did not stir. He bent lower and touched the back of her neck with his lips. And she sprang up, sobbing and angry. Because she was mad for him, she hated him furiously. All tenderness had vanished. "'I'll thank you not to touch me,' she said fiercely. She had given him her lips a moment ago, but now to graze her neck was an insult. He smiled sheepishly. "'But really, you must be reasonable,' he argued. "'What have I done?' "'It's what you haven't done, I think,' she cried. "'Why didn't you tell me while we were in the cab?' "'I didn't care to begin worrying you just then,' he replied, which was exactly true. The fact was, he had, of course, shirked telling her that no marriage would occur that day. Not being a professional seducer of young girls, he lacked skill to do a difficult thing simply. "'Now come along, little girl.' he went on, with just a trifle of impatience. Let's go out and enjoy ourselves. I assure you that everything will be all right in Paris. That's what you said about coming to London, she retorted sarcastically through her sobs. And look at you! Did he imagine for a single instant that she would have come to London with him, save on the understanding that she was to be married immediately upon arrival? 
This attitude of an indignant question was not to be reconciled with her belief that his excuses for himself were truthful, but she did not remark the discrepancy. Her sarcasm wounded his vanity. "'Oh, very well,' he muttered. "'If you don't choose to believe what I say—' He shrugged his shoulders. She said nothing, but the sobs swept at intervals through her frame, shaking it. Reading hesitation in her face, he tried again. "'Come along, little girl, and wipe your eyes.' And he approached her. She stepped back. "'No, no!' she denied him passionately. He had esteemed her too cheaply, and she did not care to be called little girl. "'Then what shall you do?' he inquired, in a tone which blended mockery and bullying. She was making a fool of him. "'I can tell you what I shan't do.' she said. I shan't go to Paris. Her sobs were less frequent. That's not my question, he said icily. I want to know what you will do. There was now no pretense of affectionateness either on her part or on his. They might, to judge from their attitudes, have been nourished from infancy on mutual hatred. What's that got to do with you? she demanded. It's got everything to do with me, he said. Well, you can go and find out, she said. It was girlish, it was childish, it was scarcely according to the canons for conducting a final rupture, but it was not the less tragically serious. Indeed, the spectacle of this young girl, absurdly behaving like one in a serious crisis, increased the tragicalness of the situation, even if it did not heighten it. The idea that ran through Gerald's brain was the ridiculous folly of having anything to do with young girls. He was quite blind to her beauty. "'Go?' he repeated her word. "'You mean that?' "'Of course I mean it,' she answered promptly. The coward in him urged him to take advantage of her ignorant, helpless pride, and leave her at her word. He remembered the scene she had made at the pit-shaft, and he said to himself that her charm was not worth her temper, and that he was a fool ever to have dreamt that it was, and that he would be doubly a fool now not to seize the opportunity of withdrawing from an insane enterprise. "'I'm to go?' he asked, with a sneer. She nodded. "'Of course, if you order me to leave you, I must. Can I do anything for you?' She signalled that he could not. "'Nothing. You're sure?' She frowned. "'Well, then, good-bye,' he turned towards the door. "'I suppose you'd leave me here without money or anything,' she said in a cold, cutting voice, and her sneer was far more destructive than his. It destroyed in him the last trace of compassion for her. "'Oh, I beg pardon,' he said, and swaggeringly counted out five sovereigns onto a chest of drawers. She rushed at them. "'Do you think I'd take your odious money?' she snarled, gathering the coins in her gloved hand. Her first impulse was to throw them in his face, but she paused, and then flung them into a corner of the room. "'Pick them up,' she commanded him. "'No, thanks.' he said briefly, and left, shutting the door. Only a very little while, and they had been lovers, exuding tenderness with every gesture, like a perfume. Only a very little while, and she had been deciding to telegraph condescendingly to her mother that she was all right. And now the dream was utterly dissolved. And the voice of that hard common sense, which spake to her in her wildest moods, grew loud in asserting that the enterprise could never have come to any good, that it was from its inception an impossible enterprise, unredeemed by the slightest justification. An enormous folly. Yes, an elopement, but not like a real elopement, always unreal. She had always known that it was only an imitation of an elopement, and must end in some awful disappointment. She had never truly wanted to run away, but something within her had pricked her forward in spite of her protests. The strict notions of her elderly relatives were right after all. It was she who had been wrong, and it was she who would have to pay. "'I've been a wicked girl,' she said to herself grimly, in the midst of her ruin. She faced the fact, but she would not repent. At any rate, she would never sit on that stool— she would not exchange the remains of her pride for the means of escape to the worst misery that life could offer. On that point she knew herself, and she set to work to repair and renew her pride. Whatever happened, she would not return to the five towns. 
She could not, because she had stolen money from her Aunt Harriet. As much as she had thrown back at Gerald, she had filched from her aunt, but in the form of a note. A prudent, mysterious instinct had moved her to take this precaution, and she was glad. She would never have been able to dart that sneer at Gerald about money if she had really needed money. So she rejoiced in her crime, though, since Aunt Harriet would assuredly discover the loss at once, the crime eternally prevented her from going back to her family. Never, never would she look at her mother with the eyes of a thief. In truth, Aunt Harriet did discover the loss, and very creditably said naught about it to anybody. The knowledge of it would have twisted the knife in the maternal heart. Sophia was also glad that she had refused to proceed to Paris. The recollection of her firmness in refusing flattered her vanity as a girl convinced that she could take care of herself. To go to Paris unmarried would have been an inconceivable madness. The mere thought of the enormity did outrage to her moral susceptibilities. No, Gerald had most perfectly mistaken her for another sort of girl, as, for instance, a shop assistant or a barmaid. With this the catalogue of her satisfactions ended. She had no idea at all as to what she ought to do, or could do. The mere prospect of venturing out of the room intimidated her. Had Gerald left her trunk in the hall? Of course he had. What a question! But what would happen to her? London had merely dazed her. She could do nothing for herself. She was as helpless as a rabbit in London. She drew aside the window-curtain, and had a glimpse of the river. It was inevitable that she should think of suicide, for she could not suppose that any girl had ever got herself into a plight more desperate than hers. "'I could slip out at night and drown myself,' she thought seriously. "'A nice thing that would be for Gerald.' Then loneliness, like a black midnight, overwhelmed her, swiftly wasting her strength, disintegrating her pride in its horrid flood. She glanced about for support, as a woman in the open street who feels she is going to faint, and went blindly to the bed, falling on it with the upper part of her body in an attitude of abandonment. She wept, but without sobbing. 2. Gerald Scales walked about the Strand, staring up at its high, narrow houses, crushed one against another, as though they had been packed, unsorted, by a packer who thought of nothing but economy of space. Except by Somerset House, King's College, and one or two theatres and banks, the monotony of mean shops, with several stories unevenly perched over them, was unbroken. Then Gerald encountered Exeter Hall, and examined its prominent façade with a provincial's eye, for despite his travels he was not very familiar with London. Exeter Hall naturally took his mind back to his uncle Boldero, that great and ardent nonconformist, and his own godly youth. It was laughable to muse upon what his uncle would say and think, did the old man know that his nephew had run away with a girl, meaning to seduce her in Paris. It was enormously funny. However, he had done with all that. He was well out of it. She had told him to go, and he had gone. She had money to get home. She had nothing to do but use the tongue in her head. The rest was her affair. He would go to Paris alone and find another amusement. It was absurd to have supposed that Sophia would ever have suited him. Not in such a family as the Baineses could one reasonably expect to discover an ideal mistress. No, there had been a mistake. The whole business was wrong. She had nearly made a fool of him. But he was not the man to be made a fool of. He had kept his dignity intact. So he said to himself. Yet all the time his dignity and his pride also were bleeding— dropping invisible blood along the length of the Strand pavements. He was at Salisbury Street again. He pictured her in the bedroom. Damn her! He wanted her. He wanted her with an excessive desire. He hated to think that he had been balked. He hated to think that she would remain immaculate. And he continued to picture her in the exciting privacy of that cursed bedroom. Now he was walking down Salisbury Street. He did not wish to be walking down Salisbury Street, but there he was. "'Oh, hell!' he murmured. "'I suppose I must go through with it.' He felt desperate. He was ready to pay any price in order to be able to say to himself that he had accomplished what he had set his heart on. "'My wife hasn't gone out, has she?' he asked of the hall-porter. "'I'm not sure, sir. 
"'I think not,' said the hall-porter. The fear that Sophia had already departed made him sick. When he noticed her trunk still there, he took hope and ran upstairs. He saw her, a dark, crumpled, sinuous piece of humanity, half on and half off the bed, silhouetted against the bluish-white counterpane. Her hat was on the floor, with the spotted veil trailing away from it. This sight seemed to him to be the most touching that he had ever seen, though her face was hidden. He forgot everything except the deep and strange emotion which affected him. He approached the bed. She did not stir. Having heard the entry, and knowing that it must be Gerald who had entered, Sophia forced herself to remain still. A wild, splendid hope shot up in her. Constrained by all the power of her will not to move, she could not stifle a sob that had lain in ambush in her throat. The sound of the sob fetched tears to the eyes of Gerald. So fire, he appealed to her. But she did not stir. Another sob shook her. "'Very well, then,' said Gerald. "'We'll stay in London till we can be married. I'll arrange it. I'll find a nice boarding-house for you, and I'll tell the people you're my cousin. I shall stay on at this hotel, and I'll come and see you every day.' A silence. "'Thank you,' she blubbered. "'Thank you.' He saw that her little gloved hand was stretching out towards him, like a feeler, and he seized it and knelt down and took her clumsily by the waist. Somehow he dared not kiss her yet. An immense relief surged very slowly through them both. "'I—I I really—' she began to say something, but the articulation was lost in her sobs. "'What? What do you say, dearest?' he questioned eagerly, and she made another effort. "'I really couldn't have gone to Paris with you without being married,' she succeeded at last. "'I, I really couldn't.' "'No, no,' he soothed her. "'Of course you couldn't. It was I who was wrong. But you didn't know how I felt. So far it's all right now, isn't it?' She sat up and kissed him fairly. It was so wonderful and startling that he burst openly into tears. She saw in the facile intensity of his emotion a guarantee of their future happiness. And as he had soothed her, so now she soothed him. They clung together, equally surprised at the sweet, exquisite, blissful melancholy which drenched them through and through. It was remorse for having quarrelled, for having lacked faith in the supreme rightness of the high adventure. Everything was right and would be right, and they had been criminally absurd. It was remorse, but it was pure bliss and worth the quarrel. Gerald resumed his perfection again in her eyes. He was the soul of goodness and honour, and for him she was again the ideal mistress, who would, however, be also a wife. As in his mind he rapidly ran over the steps necessary to their marriage, he kept saying to himself, far off in some remote cavern of the brain, I shall have her, I shall have her. He did not reflect that this fragile slip of the bane stock, unconsciously drawing upon the accumulated strength of generations of honest living, had put a defeat upon him. After tea, Gerald, utterly content with the universe, redeemed his word, and found an irreproachable boarding-house for Sophia in Westminster, near the Abbey. She was astonished at the glibness of his lies to the landlady about her, and about their circumstances generally. He also found a church and a parson close by, and in half an hour the formalities preliminary to a marriage were begun. He explained to her that, as she was now resident in London, it would be simpler to recommence the business entirely. She sagaciously agreed. As she by no means wished to wound him again, she made no inquiry about those other formalities which, owing to red tape, had so unexpectedly proved abortive. She knew she was going to be married, and that sufficed. The next day she carried out her filial idea of telegraphing to her mother. CHAPTER Two, SUPPER 1. They had been to Versailles, and had dined there. A tram had sufficed to take them out, but for the return Gerald, who had been drinking champagne, would not be content with less than a carriage. Further, he insisted on entering Paris by way of the Bois and the Arc de Triomphe. Thoroughly to appease his conceit, it would have been necessary to swing open the gates of honour in the Ark, and allow his fiacre to pass through. 
to be forced to drive round the monument instead of under it hurt the sense of fitness which champagne engenders. Gerald was all in his pride that day. He had been displaying the wonders to Sophia, and he could not escape the Cicerone's secret feeling that he himself was somehow responsible for the wonders. Moreover, he was exceedingly satisfied with the effect produced by Sophia. Sophia, on arriving in Paris, with the ring on her triumphant finger, had timidly mentioned the subject of frocks. None would have guessed from her tone that she was possessed by the desire for French clothes, as by a devil. She had been surprised and delighted by the eagerness of Gerald's response. Gerald, too, was possessed by a devil. He thirsted to see her in French clothes. He knew some of the shops and ateliers in the Rue de la Paix, the Rue de la Chaussée d'Antin, and the Palais Royal. He was much more skilled in the law of frocks than she, for his previous business in Paris had brought him into relations with the great firms, and Sophia suffered a brief humiliation in the discovery that his private opinion of her dresses was that they were not dresses at all. She had been aware that they were not Parisian, nor even of London, but she had thought them pretty good. It healed her wound, however, to reflect that Gerald had so marvellously kept his own counsel in order to spare her self-love. Gerald had taken her to an establishment in the Chaussée d'Antin. It was not one of what Gerald called Les Grandes Maisons, but it was on the very fringe of them, and the real haute couture was practised therein, and Gerald was remembered there by name. Sophia had gone in trembling and ashamed, yet in her heart courageously determined to emerge uncompromisingly French. But the models frightened her. They surpassed even the most fantastic things that she had seen in the streets. She recoiled before them, and seemed to hide for refuge in Gerald, as it were appealing to him for moral protection, and answering to him instead of the saleswoman, when the saleswoman offered remarks in stiff English. The prices also frightened her. The simplest trifle here cost sixteen pounds, and her mother's historic silk, whose elaborateness had cost twelve pounds, was supposed to have approached the inexpressible. Gerald said that she was not to think about prices. She was, however, forced by some instinct to think about prices. She, who at home had scorned the narrowness of life in the square, in the square she was understood to be quite without common sense, hopelessly imprudent, yet here a spring of sagacity seemed to be welling up in her all the time, a continual antidote against the general madness in which she found herself. With extraordinary rapidity she had formed the habit of preaching moderation to Gerald. She hated to see money thrown away, and her notion of the boundary line between throwing money away and judiciously spending it was still the notion of the square. Gerald would laugh, but she would say, piqued and blushing, but self-sure, "'You can laugh!' It was all deliciously agreeable. On this evening she wore the first of the new costumes. She had worn it all day. Characteristically, she had chosen something which was not too special for either afternoon or evening, for either warm or cold weather. It was of pale blue taffetas, striped in a darker blue, with the corsage cut in basques, and the underskirt of a similar taffetas, but unstriped. The effect of the ornate overskirt falling on the plain underskirt with its small doubled volant was, she thought, and Gerald too, adorable. The waist was higher than any she had had before, and the crinoline expansive. Tied round her head, with a large bow and flying blue ribbons under the chin, was a fragile flat capote, like a baby's bonnet, which allowed her hair to escape in front and her great chignon behind. A large spotted veil flew out from the capote over the chignon. Her doubled skirts waved amply over Gerald's knees in the carriage, and she leant back against the hard cushions, and put an arrogant look into her face, and thought of nothing but the intense throbbing joy of life, longing with painful ardour for more and more pleasure, then and for ever. As the carriage slipped downwards through the wide, empty gloom of the Champs-Élysées, into the brilliant Paris that was waiting for them, another carriage, drawn by two white horses, flashed upwards, and was gone in dust. Its only occupant, except the coachman and footman, was a woman. Gerald stared after it. "'By Jove!' he exclaimed. "'That's Hortense!' It might have been Hortense, or it might not, but he instantly convinced himself that it was. 
Not every evening did one meet Hortense driving alone in the Champs-Élysées, and in August, too. "'Hortense?' Sophia asked simply. "'Yes, Hortense Schneider.' "'Who is she?' "'You've never heard of Hortense Schneider?' "'No.' "'Well, have you ever heard of Offenbach?' "'I, I don't know. I don't think so.' He had the mien of utter incredulity. "'You don't mean to say you've never heard of Bluebeard?' "'I've heard of Bluebeard, of course,' said she. "'Who hasn't? I mean the opera, Offenbach's.' She shook her head, scarce knowing even what an opera was. "'Well, well, what next?' He implied that such ignorance stood alone in his experience. Really, he was delighted at the cleanness of the slate on which he had to write and Sophia was not a bit alarmed. She relished instruction from his lips. It was a pleasure to her to learn from that exhaustless store of worldly knowledge. To the world she would do her best to assume omniscience in its ways, but to him, in her present mood, she liked to play the ignorant, uninitiated little thing. Why, he said, the Schneider has been the rage since last year but one, absolutely the rage. I do wish I'd noticed her said Sophia. "'As soon as the varieties reopens, we'll go and see her,' he replied, and then gave his detailed version of the career of Hortense Schneider. More joys for her in the near future. She had yet scarcely penetrated the crust of her bliss. She exulted in the dazzling destiny which comprised freedom, fortune, eternal gaiety, and the exquisite Gerald. As they crossed the Place de la Concorde, she inquired, "'Are we going back to the hotel?' "'No,' he said. "'I thought we'd go and have supper somewhere, if it isn't too early.' "'After all that dinner?' "'All what dinner? You ate about five times as much as me, anyhow.' "'Oh, I'm ready,' she said. She was. This day, because it was the first day of her French frock, she regarded as her debut in the dizzy life of capitals. She existed in a rapture of bliss, an ecstasy which could feel no fatigue, either of body or spirit. 2. It was after midnight when they went into the restaurant Sylvain. Gerald, having decided not to go to the hotel, had changed his mind and called there, and having called there, had remained a long time. This, of course. Sophia was already accustoming herself to the idea that, with Gerald, it was impossible to predict accurately more than five minutes of the future. As the chasseur held open the door for them to enter, and Sophia passed modestly into the glowing yellow interior of the restaurant, followed by Gerald in his character of man of the world, they drew the attention of Sylvain's numerous and glittering guests. No face could have made a more provocative contrast to the women's faces in those screened rooms than the face of Sophia, so childlike between the baby's bonnet and the huge bow of ribbon, so candid, so charmingly conscious of its own pure beauty, and of the fact that she was no longer a virgin, but the equal in knowledge of any woman alive. She saw around her, clustered about the white tables, multitudes of violently red lips, powdered cheeks, cold, hard eyes, self-possessed, arrogant faces, and insolent bosoms. What had impressed her more than anything else in Paris, more even than the three-horsed omnibuses, was the extraordinary self-assurance of all the women, their unashamed posing, their calm acceptance for the public gaze. They seemed to say, "'We are the renowned Parisiennes!' They frightened her. They appeared to her so corrupt and so proud in their corruption. She had already seen a dozen women, in various situations of conspicuousness, apply powder to their complexions, with no more ado than if they had been giving a pat to their hair. She could not understand such boldness. As for them, they marvelled at the phenomena presented in Sophia's person. They admired, they admitted the style of the gown, but they envied neither her innocence nor her beauty. They envied nothing but her youth and the fresh tint of her cheeks. "'Encore des Anglais,' said some of them, as if that explained it all. Gerald had a very curt way with waiters, and the more obsequious they were, the haughtier he became, and the head-waiter was no more to him than a scullion. He gave loud-voiced orders in French, of which both he and Sophia were proud, and a table was laid for them in a corner near one of the large windows. 
Sophia settled herself on the bench of green velvet, and began to ply the ivory fan which Gerald had given her. It was very hot. All the windows were wide open, and the sounds of the street mingled clearly with the tinkle of the supper-room. Outside, against a sky of deepest purple, Sophia could discern the black skeleton of a gigantic building. It was the new opera-house. "'All sorts here,' said Gerald, contentedly, after he had ordered iced soup and sparkling moselle. Sophia did not know what moselle was, but she imagined that anything would be better than champagne. Sylvain's was then typical of the Second Empire, and particularly famous as a supper-room. Expensive and gay, it provided with its discreet decorations a sumptuous scene, where lorettes, actresses, respectable women, and an occasional grisette in luck, could satisfy their curiosity as to each other. In its Catholicity it was highly correct as a resort. Not many other restaurants in the centre could have successfully fought against the rival attractions of the Bois and the dim groves of the Champs-Élysées on a night in August. The complicated richness of the dresses, the yards and yards of fine stitchery, the endless ruching, the hints, more or less incautious, of nether treasures of embroidered linen, and leaping over all this to the eye, the vivid colourings of silks and muslins, veils, plumes and flowers, piled, as it were, pell-mell in heaps on the universal green cushions to the furthest vista of the restaurant, and all multiplied in gilt mirrors. The spectacle intoxicated Sophia. Her eyes gleamed. She drank the soup with eagerness, and tasted the wine, though no desire on her part to like wine could make her like it. And then, seeing pineapples on a large table covered with fruits, she told Gerald that she would like some pineapple, and Gerald ordered one. She gathered her self-esteem and her wits together, and began to give Gerald her views on the costumes. She could do so with impunity, because her own was indubitably beyond criticism. Some she wholly condemned, and there was not one which earned her unreserved approval. All the absurd fastidiousness of her schoolgirlish provinciality emerged in that eager, affected torrent of remarks. However, she was clever enough to read, after a time, in Gerald's tone and features, that she was making a tedious fool of herself and she adroitly shifted her criticism from the taste to the work. She put a strong accent on the word, and pronounced that to be miraculous beyond description. She reckoned that she knew what dressmaking and millinery were, and her little fund of expert knowledge caused her to picture a whole necessary city full of girls stitching, stitching, and stitching day and night. She had wondered, during the few odd days that they had spent in Paris, between visits to Chantilly and other places, at the massed luxury of the shops. She had wondered, starting with St. Luke's Square as a standard, how they could all thrive. But now, in her first real glimpse of the banal and licentious profusion of one among a hundred restaurants, she wondered that the shops were so few. She thought how splendid was all this expensiveness for trade. Indeed, the notions chasing each other within that lovely and foolish head were a surprising medley. "'Well, what do you think of Sylvain's?' Gerald asked, impatient to be assured that his Sylvain's had duly overwhelmed her. "'Oh, Gerald!' she murmured, indicating that speech was inadequate, and she just furtively touched his hand with hers. The ennui due to her critical disquisition on the shortcomings of Parisian costume cleared away from Gerald's face. "'What do you suppose those people there are talking about?' he said, with a jerk of the head towards a chattering group of three gorgeous lorettes and two middle-aged men at the next table but one. What are they talking about? They are talking about the execution of the murderer Rivain that takes place at Auxerre the day after tomorrow. They are arranging to make up a party to go and see it. Oh, what a horrid idea! said Sophia. Guillotine, you know, said Gerald. But can people see it? Yes, of course. "'Well, I think it's horrible. "'Yes, that's why people like to go and see it. "'Besides, the man isn't an ordinary sort of criminal at all. "'He's very young and good-looking and well-connected. "'And he killed the celebrated Claudine.' "'Claudine?' "'Claudine Jacquinot. "'Of course you wouldn't know. "'She was a tremendous uh, wrong here in the forties, "'made a lot of money and retired to her native town.' 
Sophia, in spite of her efforts to maintain the role of a woman who has nothing to learn, blushed. Then she was older than he is. Thirty-five years older, if a day. What did he kill her for? She wouldn't give him enough money. She was his mistress, or rather one of them. He wanted money for a young lady friend, you see. He killed her and took all the jewels she was wearing. Whenever he went to see her, she always wore all her best jewels. And you may bet a woman like that had a few. It seems she had been afraid for a long time that he meant to do for her. Then why did she see him? And why did she wear her jewels? Because she liked being afraid, Goose. Some women only enjoy themselves when they're terrified. Queer, isn't it? Gerald insisted on meeting his wife's gaze as he finished these revelations. He pretended that such stories were the commonest things on earth, and that to be scandalised by them was infantile. Sophia, thrust suddenly into a strange civilization, perfectly frank in its sensuality and its sensuousness, under the guidance of a young man to whom her half-formed intelligence was a most diverting toy, Sophia felt mysteriously uncomfortable, disturbed by sinister flitting phantoms of ideas which she only dimly apprehended. Her eyes fell. Gerald laughed self-consciously. She would not eat any more pineapple. Immediately afterwards there came into the restaurant an apparition which momentarily stopped every conversation in the room. It was a tall and mature woman who wore, over a dress of purplish black silk, a vast flowing sortie de bal of vermilion velvet, looped and tasselled with gold. No other costume could live by the side of that garment. Arab in shape, Russian in colour, and Parisian in style, it blazed. The woman's heavy coiffure was bound with fillets of gold braid and crimson rosettes. She was followed by a young Englishman in evening dress, and whiskers of the most exact correctness. The woman sailed a little breathlessly to a table next to Gerald's, and took possession of it with an air of use, almost of tedium. She sat down, threw the cloak from her majestic bosom, and expanded her chest. Seeming to ignore the Englishman, who superciliously assumed the seat opposite to her, she let her large, scornful eyes travel round the restaurant, slowly and imperiously meeting the curiosity which she had evoked. Her beauty had undoubtedly been dazzling. It was still effulgent, but the blossom was about to fall. She was admirably rouged and powdered. Her arms were glorious, her lashes were long. There was little fault, save the excessive ripeness of a blonde who fights in vain against obesity, and her clothes combined audacity with the propriety of fashion. She carelessly deposed costly trinkets on the table, and then, having intimidated the whole company, she accepted the menu from the head waiter and began to study it. "'That's one of them,' Gerald whispered to Sophia. "'One of what?' Sophia whispered. Gerald raised his eyebrows warningly and winked. The Englishman had overheard, and a look of frigid displeasure passed across his proud face. Evidently he belonged to a rank much higher than Gerald's, and Gerald, though he could always comfort himself by the thought that he had been to a university with the best, felt his own inferiority, and could not hide that he felt it. Gerald was wealthy, he came of a wealthy family, but he had not the habit of wealth. When he spent money furiously, he did it with bravado, too conscious of grandeur, and too conscious of the difficulties of acquiring that which he threw away— for Gerald had earned money. This whiskered Englishman had never earned money, never known the value of it, never imagined himself without as much of it as he might happen to want. He had the face of one accustomed to give orders, and to look down upon inferiors. He was absolutely sure of himself. That his companion chiefly ignored him did not appear to incommode him in the least. She spoke to him in French. He replied in English, very briefly— and then, in English, he commanded the supper. As soon as the champagne was served, he began to drink. In the intervals of drinking, he gently stroked his whiskers. The woman spoke no more. Gerald talked more loudly. With that aristocratic Englishman observing him, he could not remain at ease. And not only did he talk more loudly, he brought into conversation references to money, travels, and worldly experiences. While seeking to impress the Englishman, he was merely becoming ridiculous to the Englishman, 
and obscurely he was aware of this. Sophia noticed and regretted it. Still, feeling very unimportant herself, she was reconciled to the superiority of the whiskered Englishman as to a natural fact. Gerald's behaviour slightly lowered him in her esteem. Then she looked at him, at his well-shaped neatness, his vivacious face, his excellent clothes, and decided that he was much to be preferred to any heavy-jawed, long-nosed aristocrat alive. The woman, whose vermilion cloak lay around her like a fortification, spoke to her escort. He did not understand. He tried to express himself in French, and failed. Then the woman recommenced, talking at length. When she had done, he shook his head. His acquaintance with French was limited to the vocabulary of food. Guillotine he murmured, the sole word of her discourse that he had understood. Ah, oui, oui, guillotine, enfin! cried the woman excitedly. Encouraged by her success in conveying even one word of her remarks, she began a third time. Excuse me, said Gerald, madame is talking about the execution at Auxerre the day after tomorrow. N'est-ce pas, madame, que vous parlez du rivain? The Englishman glared angrily at Gerald's officious interruption, but the woman smiled benevolently on Gerald, and insisted on talking to her friend through him, and the Englishman had to make the best of the situation. "'There isn't a restaurant in Paris tonight where they aren't talking about that execution,' said Gerald, on his own account. "'Indeed,' observed the Englishman. Wine affected them in different ways. Now a fragile, short Frenchman, with an extremely pale face, sending in a thin black imperial, appeared at the entrance. He looked about, and, recognising the woman of the scarlet cloak, very discreetly saluted her. Then he saw Gerald, and his worn, fatigued features showed a sudden, startled smile. He came rapidly forward, hat in hand, seized Gerald's palm, and greeted him effusively. "'My wife,' said Gerald with the solemn care of a man who is determined to prove that he is entirely sober. The young man became grave and excessively ceremonious. He bowed low over Sophia's hand and kissed it. Her impulse was to laugh, but the gravity of the young man's deference stopped her. She glanced at Gerald, blushing, as if to say, "'This comedy is not my fault.' Gerald said something. The young man turned to him, and his face resumed its welcoming smile. "'This is Monsieur Chirac,' Gerald at length completed the introduction, "'a friend of mine when I lived in Paris.' He was proud to have met by accident an acquaintance in a restaurant. It demonstrated that he was a Parisian, and improved his standing with the whiskered Englishman and the vermilion cloak. "'It is the first time you come to Paris, madame,' Chirac addressed himself to Sophia in limping, timorous English. "'Yes,' she giggled. He bowed again. Chirac, with his best compliments, felicitated Gerald upon his marriage. "'Don't mention it,' said the humorous Gerald in English, amused at his own wit. And then, "'What about this execution?' "'Ah!' replied Chirac, breathing out a long breath and smiling at Sophia. "'Rivain! Rivain!' He made a large, important gesture with his hand. It was at once to be seen that Gerald had touched the topic which secretly ravaged the supper-world as a subterranean fire ravages a mine. "'I go,' said Chirac, with pride, glancing at Sophia, who smiled self-consciously. Chirac entered upon a conversation with Gerald in French. Sophia comprehended that Gerald was surprised and impressed by what Chirac told him, and that Chirac in turn was surprised. Then Gerald laboriously found his pocket-book, and, after some fumbling with it, handed it to Chirac, so that the latter might write in it. "'Madame,' murmured Chirac, resuming his ceremonious stiffness in order to take leave. "'Alors, c'est entendu, mon cher ami,' he said to Gerald, who nodded phlegmatically. And Chirac went away to the next table but one, where were the three lorettes and the two middle-aged men. He was received there with enthusiasm. Sophia began to be teased by a little fear that Gerald was not quite his usual self. She did not think of him as tipsy. The idea of his being tipsy would have shocked her. She did not think clearly at all. 
She was lost and dazed in the labyrinth of new and vivid impressions into which Gerald had led her. But her prudence was awake. "'I think I'm tired,' she said in a low voice. "'You don't want to go, do you?' he asked, hurt. "'Well—' "'Oh, wait a bit.' The owner of the vermilion cloak spoke again to Gerald, who showed that he was flattered. While talking to her, he ordered a brandy and soda, and then he could not refrain from displaying to her his familiarity with Parisian life, and he related how he had met Hortens Schneider behind a pair of white horses. The vermilion cloak grew even more sociable at the mention of this resounding name, and chattered with the most agreeable vivacity. Her friend stared inimically. "'Do you hear that?' Gerald explained to Sophia, who was sitting silent, about Hortense Schneider. You know, we met her to-night. It seems she made a bet of a louis with some fellow, and when he lost he sent her the louis, set in diamonds worth a hundred thousand francs. That's how they go on here. Oh! cried Sophia, further than ever in the labyrinth. Excuse me! the Englishman put in heavily. He had heard the words Hortense Schneider, Hortense Schneider, repeating themselves in the conversation, and at last it had occurred to him that the conversation was about Hortense Schneider. "'Excuse me,' he began again, "'are you—do you mean Hortense Schneider?' "'Yes,' said Gerald, "'we met her to-night.' "'She is in Trouville,' said the Englishman flatly. Gerald shook his head positively. "'I gave a supper to her in Trouville last night.' said the Englishman, and she plays at the Casino Theatre to-night. Gerald was repulsed, but not defeated. "'What is she playing to-night? Tell me that,' he sneered. "'I don't see why I should tell you.' Hm, Gerald retorted. "'If what you say is true, it's a very strange thing I should have seen her in the Champs-Élysées to-night, isn't it?' The Englishman drank more wine. "'If you want to insult me, sir—' he began coldly. "'Gerald!' Sophia urged in a whisper. "'Be quiet!' Gerald snapped. A fiddler, in fancy costume, plunged into the restaurant at that moment, and began to play wildly. The shock of his strange advent momentarily silenced the quarrel, but it soon leapt up again, under the shelter of the noisy music, the common, tedious, tippler's quarrel. It rose higher and higher. The fiddler looked askance at it over his fiddle. Chirac cautiously observed it. Instead of attending to the music, the festal company attended to the quarrel. Three waiters in a group watched it with an impartial sporting interest. The English voices grew more menacing. Then suddenly the whiskered Englishman, jerking his head towards the door, said more quietly, "'Hadn't we better settle this outside?' "'At your service,' said Gerald, rising." The owner of the vermilion cloak lifted her eyebrows to Chirac in fatigued disgust, but she said nothing. Nor did Sophia say anything. Sophia was overcome by terror. The swain of the cloak, dragging his coat after him across the floor, left the restaurant without offering any apology or explanation to his lady. "'Wait here for me,' said Gerald defiantly to Sophia. "'I shall be back in a minute.' "'But Gerald!' she put her hand on his sleeve. He snatched his arm away. "'Wait here for me, I tell you,' he repeated. The doorkeeper obsequiously opened the door to the two unsteady carousers, for whom the fiddler drew back, still playing. Thus Sophia was left side by side with the vermilion cloak. She was quite helpless. All the pride of a married woman had abandoned her. She stood transfixed by intense shame, staring painfully at a pillar to avoid the universal assault of eyes. She felt like an indiscreet little girl, and she looked like one. No youthful radiant beauty of features, no grace and style of a Parisian dress, no certificate of a ring, no premature initiation into the mysteries could save her from the appearance of a raw fool whose foolishness had been her undoing. Her face changed to its reddest, and remained at that, and all the fundamental innocence of her nature, which had been overlaid by the violent experiences of her brief companionship with Gerald, rose again to the surface with that blush. Her situation drew pity from a few hearts, and a careless contempt from the rest. But since once more it was a question of ces anglais, 
nobody could be astonished. Without moving her head, she twisted her eyes to the clock, half-past two. The fiddler ceased his dance and made a collection in his tasselled cap. The vermilion cloak threw a coin into the cap. Sophia stared at it, moveless, until the fiddler, tired of waiting, passed to the next table and relieved her agony. She had no money at all. She set herself to watch the clock, but its fingers would not stir. With an exclamation, the lady of the cloak got up and peered out of the window, chatted with waiters, and then removed herself and her cloak to the next table, where she was received with amiable sympathy by the three Lorettes, Chirac, and the other two men. The party surreptitiously examined Sophia from time to time. Then Chirac went outside with the head waiter, returned, consulted with his friends, and finally approached Sophia. It was twenty minutes past three. He renewed his magnificent bow. Uh, madame, he said carefully, will you allow me to bring you to your hotel? He made no reference to Gerald, partly doubtless because his English was treacherous on difficult ground. Sophia had not sufficient presence of mind to thank her saviour. But the bill, she stammered, the bill is not paid. He did not instantly understand her, but one of the waiters had caught the sound of a familiar word, and sprang forward with a slip of paper on a plate. "'I have no money,' said Sophia, with a feeble smile. "'Je vous arrangerai ça, he said. "'What name of the hotel? Le Maurice, is it not?' "'Hotel Maurice,' said Sophia. "'Yes.' He spoke to the head waiter about the bill which was carried away like something obscene, and on his arm, which he punctiliously offered and she could not refuse, Sophia left the scene of her ignominy. She was so distraught that she could not manage her crinoline in the doorway. No sign anywhere outside of Gerald or his foe. He put her into an open carriage, and in five minutes they had clattered down the brilliant silence of the Rue de la Paix, through the Place Vendôme into the Rue de Rivoli and the night-porter of the hotel was at the carriage-step. "'I tell them at the restaurant where you are gone,' said Chirac, bareheaded under the long colonnade of the street. "'If your husband is there, I tell him. Till tomorrow.' His manners were more wonderful than any that Sophia had ever imagined. He might have been in the dark Tuileries on the opposite side of the street, saluting an empress instead of taking leave of a raw little girl, who was still too disturbed even to thank him. She fled, candle in hand, up the wide, many-cornered stairs. Gerald might be already in the bedroom, drunk. There was a chance. But the gilt-fringed bedroom was empty. She sat down at the velvet-covered table amid the shadows cast by the candle that wavered in the draught from the open window, and she set her teeth and a cold fury possessed her in the hot and languorous night. Gerald was an imbecile. That he should have allowed himself to get tipsy was bad enough, but that he should have exposed her to the horrible situation from which Chirac had extricated her was unspeakably disgraceful. He was an imbecile. He had no common sense. With all his captivating charm, he could not be relied upon not to make himself and her ridiculous, tragically ridiculous. Compare him with Mr. Chirac. She leant despairingly on the table. She would not undress. She would not move. She had to realise her position. She had to see it. Folly! Folly! Fancy a commercial traveller throwing a compromising piece of paper to the daughter of his customer in the shop itself. That was the incredible folly with which their relations had begun. And his mad gesture at the pit-shaft, and his scheme for bringing her to Paris unmarried. And then to-night, monstrous folly! Alone in the bedroom, she was a wise and a disillusioned woman, wiser than any of those dolls in the restaurant. And had she not gone to Gerald, as it were, over the dead body of her father, through lies and lies and again lies? That was how she phrased it to herself, over the dead body of her father. How could such a venture succeed? How could she ever have hoped that it would succeed? In that moment she saw her acts with the terrible vision of a Hebrew prophet. She thought of the square, and of her life there with her mother and Constance. Never would her pride allow her to return to that life, not even if the worst happened to her that could happen. She was one of those who are prepared to pay without grumbling for what they have had. 
There was a sound outside. She noticed that the dawn had begun. The door opened and disclosed Gerald. They exchanged a searching glance, and Gerald shut the door. Gerald affected the air, but she perceived at once that he was sobered. His lip was bleeding. "'Mr. Chirac brought me home,' she said. "'So it seems,' said Gerald curtly. "'I asked you to wait for me. Didn't I say I should come back?' He was adopting the injured magisterial tone of the man who is ridiculously trying to conceal from himself and others that he has recently behaved like an ass. She resented the injustice. "'I don't think you need talk like that,' she said. "'Like what?' He bullied her, determined that she should be in the wrong, and what a hard look on his pretty face. Her prudence bade her accept the injustice. She was his. Wrapped away from her own world, she was utterly dependent on his good nature. "'I knocked my chin against the damn balustrade coming upstairs,' said Gerald gloomily. She knew that that was a lie. "'Did you?' she replied kindly. "'Let me bathe it.' Chapter Three, An Ambition Satisfied. One. She went to sleep in misery. All the glory of her new life had been eclipsed. But when she woke up a few hours later in the large velvety stateliness of the bedroom for which Gerald was paying so fantastic a price per day, she was in a brighter mood, and very willing to reconsider her verdicts. Her pride induced her to put Gerald in the right and herself in the wrong for she was too proud to admit that she had married a charming and irresponsible fool. And indeed, ought she not to put herself in the wrong? Gerald had told her to wait, and she had not waited. He had said that he should return to the restaurant, and he had returned. Why had she not waited? She had not waited because she had behaved like a simpleton. She had been terrified about nothing. Had she not been frequenting restaurants now for a month past? Ought not a married woman to be capable of waiting an hour in a restaurant for her lawful husband without looking a ninny? And as for Gerald's behaviour, how could he have acted differently? The other Englishman was obviously a brute, and had sought a quarrel. His contradiction of Gerald's statements was extremely offensive. On being invited by the brute to go outside, what could Gerald do but comply? Not to have complied might have meant a fight in the restaurant, as the brute was certainly drunk. Compared to the brute, Gerald was not at all drunk, merely a little gay and talkative. Then Gerald's fib about his chin was natural. He simply wished to minimise the fuss and to spare her feelings. It was, in fact, just like Gerald to keep perfect silence as to what had passed between himself and the brute. However, she was convinced that Gerald, so lithe and quick, had given that great brute with his supercilious ways as good as he received, if not better. And if she were a man, and had asked her wife to wait in a restaurant, and the wife had gone home under the escort of another man, she would most assuredly be much more angry than Gerald had been. She was very glad that she had controlled herself, and exercised a meek diplomacy. A quarrel had thus been avoided. Yes, the finish of the evening could not be called a quarrel. After her nursing of his chin, nothing but a slight coolness on his part had persisted. She arose silently, and began to dress, full of a determination to treat Gerald as a good wife ought to treat her husband. Gerald did not stir. He was an excellent sleeper, one of those organisms that never want to go to bed, and never want to get up. When her toilet was complete, save for her bodice, there was a knock at the door. She started. Gerald! She approached the bed, and leant her nude bosom over her husband, and put her arms round his neck. This method of being brought back to consciousness did not displease him. The knock was repeated. He gave a grunt. "'Someone's knocking at the door,' she whispered. "'Then why don't you open it?' he said dreamily. "'I'm not dressed, darling,' he looked at her. "'Stick something on your shoulders, girl,' said he. "'What does it matter?' There she was, being a simpleton again, despite her resolution. She obeyed, and cautiously opened the door, standing behind it. A middle-aged, whiskered servant, in a long white apron, announced matters in French, which passed her understanding. But Gerald had heard from the bed, and he replied, "'Bien, monsieur!' The servant departed. 
with a bow, down the obscure corridor. "'It's Chirac,' Gerald explained when she had shut the door. "'I was forgetting. I asked him to come and have lunch with us early. He's waiting in the drawing-room. Just put your bodice on and go and talk to him till I come.' He jumped out of bed, and then, standing in his night-garb, stretched himself and terrifically yawned. "'Me?' Sophia questioned. "'Who else?' said Gerald, with that curious satiric dryness which he would sometimes import into his tone. "'But I can't speak French,' she protested. "'I didn't suppose you could,' said Gerald, with an increase of dryness. "'But you know as well as I do that he can speak English.' "'Oh, very well, then,' she murmured, with agreeable alacrity. Evidently Gerald had not yet quite recovered from his legitimate displeasure of the night. He minutely examined his mouth in the glass of the Louis-Philippe wardrobe. It showed scarcely a trace of battle. "'I say,' he stopped her, as, nervous at the prospect before her, she was leaving the room, "'I was thinking of going to Auxerre to-day.' "'Auxerre?' she repeated, wondering under what circumstances she had recently heard that name. Then she remembered it was the place of execution of the murderer Rivain. "'Yes,' he said, "'Chirac has to go. He's on a newspaper now. He was an architect when I knew him. He's got to go, and he thinks himself jolly lucky, so I thought I'd go with him.' The truth was that he had definitely arranged to go. "'Not to, to see the execution,' she stammered. "'Why not? I've always wanted to see an execution, especially with the guillotine. An execution's a public in France. It's quite the proper thing to go to them.' "'But why do you want to see an execution?' "'It just happens that I do want to see an execution. It's a fancy of mine, that's all. I don't know that any reason is necessary,' he said, pouring out water into the diminutive ewer. She was aghast. "'And shall you leave me here alone?' "'Well,' said he, "'I don't see why my being married should prevent me from doing something that I've always wanted to do. Do you?' "'Oh, no!' She eagerly concurred. "'That's all right,' he said. "'You can do exactly as you like. Either stay here, or come with me. If you go to Auxerre, there's no need at all for you to see the execution. It's an interesting old town, cathedral, and so on. But, of course, if you can't bear to be in the same town as a guillotine, I'll go alone. I shall come back to-morrow.' It was plain where his wish lay. She stopped the phrases that came to her lips, and did her best to dismiss the thoughts which prompted them. "'Of course I'll go,' she said quietly. She hesitated, and then went up to the washstand and kissed a part of his cheek that was not soapy. That kiss, which comforted and somehow reassured her, was the expression of a surrender whose monstrousness she would not admit to herself. In the rich and dusty drawing-room, Chirac and Chirac's exquisite formalities awaited her. Nobody else was there. Uh, "'My husband,' she began, smiling and blushing. She liked Chirac. It was the first time she had had the opportunity of using that word to other than a servant. It soothed her and gave her confidence. She perceived after a few moments that Chirac did genuinely admire her, more that she inspired him with something that resembled awe. Speaking very slowly and distinctly, she said that she should travel with her husband to Auxerre, as he saw no objection to that course, implying that if he saw no objection, she was perfectly satisfied. Chirac was concurrence itself. In five minutes it seemed to be the most natural and proper thing in the world that, on her honeymoon, she should soon be going with her husband to a particular town, because a notorious murderer was about to be decapitated there in public. "'My husband has always wanted to see an execution,' she said later. "'It would be a pity to—' "'As psychological experience,' replied Chirac, pronouncing the P of the adjective, "'it would be very interessant to observe one's self in such circumstances.' He smiled enthusiastically. She thought how strange even nice Frenchmen were. Imagine going to an execution in order to observe yourself. 2. What continually impressed Sophia as strange, in the behaviour not only of Gerald but of Chirac and other people with whom she came into contact, 
was its quality of casualness. She had all her life been accustomed to see enterprises, even minor ones, well pondered and then carefully schemed beforehand. In St. Luke's Square there was always, in every head, a sort of timetable of existence, prepared at least one week in advance. But in Gerald's world nothing was prearranged. Elaborate affairs were decided in a moment, and undertaken with extraordinary lightness. Thus the excursion to Auxerre. During lunch scarcely a word was said as to it, the conversation, in English for Sophia's advantage, turning, as usual under such circumstances, upon the difficulty of languages and the differences between countries. Nobody would have guessed that any member of the party had any preoccupation whatever for the rest of the day. The meal was delightful to Sophia. Not merely did she find Chirac comfortably kind and sincere, but Gerald was restored to the perfection of his charm and his good humour. Then, suddenly, in the midst of coffee, the question of trains loomed up like a swift crisis. In five minutes Shirak had departed. Whether to his office or his home, Sophia did not understand, and within a quarter of an hour she and Gerald were driving rapidly to the Gare de Lyon. Gerald, stuffing into his pocket a large envelope full of papers which he had received by registered post. They caught the train by about a minute, and Chirac by a few seconds. Yet neither he nor Gerald seemed to envisage the risk of inconvenience and annoyance which they had incurred and escaped. Chirac chattered through the window with another journalist in the next compartment. When she had leisure to examine him, Sophia saw that he must have called at his home to put on old clothes. Everybody except herself and Gerald seemed to travel in his oldest clothes. The train was hot, noisy, and dusty. But one after another all three of them fell asleep and slept heavily, calmly, like healthy and exhausted young animals. Nothing could disturb them for more than a moment. To Sophia it appeared to be by simple chance that Chirac aroused himself and them at La Roche, and sleepily seized her valise and got them all out on the platform, where they yawned and smiled, full of the deep, half-realized satisfaction of repose. They drank nectar from a wheeled buffet drank it eagerly in thirsty gulps, and sighed with pleasure and relief, and Gerald threw down a coin, refusing change with a lord's gesture. The local train to Auxerre was full, and with a varied and sinister cargo. At length they were in the zone of the waiting guillotine. The rumour ran that the executioner was on the train. No one had seen him, no one was sure of recognising him, but everyone hugged the belief that he was on the train. Although the sun was sinking, the heat seemed not to abate. Attitudes grew more limp, more abandoned. Soot and prickly dust flew in unceasingly at the open windows. The train stopped at Bonnard, Chemilly, and Monito, each time before a waiting crowd that invaded it. And at last, in the great station at Auxerre, it poured out an incredible mass of befouled humanity that spread over everything like an inundation. Sophia was frightened. Gerald left the initiative to Chirac, and Chirac took her arm and led her forward, looking behind him to see that Gerald followed with the valise. Frenzy seemed to reign in Auxerre. The driver of a cab demanded ten francs for transporting them to the Hotel de l'Epée. Bah! scornfully exclaimed Chirac, in his quality of experienced Parisian, who is not to be exploited by heavy-witted provincials but the driver of the next cab demanded twelve francs. "'Jump in,' said Gerald to Sophia. Chirac lifted his eyebrows. At the same moment a tall, stout man with the hard face of a flourishing scoundrel, and a young, pallid girl on his arm, pushed aside both Gerald and Chirac, and got into the cab with his companion. Chirac protested, telling him that the cab was already engaged. The usurper scowled and swore, and the young girl laughed boldly. Sophia, shrinking, expected her escort to execute justice, heroic and final, but she was disappointed. "'Brut!' murmured Chirac, and shrugged his shoulders as the carriage drove off, leaving them foolish on the curb. By this time all the other cabs had been seized. They walked to the Hotel de l'Epée, jostled by the crowd, Sophia and Chirac in front, and Gerald following with the valise, whose weight caused him to lean over to his right and his left arm to rise. The avenue was long, straight, and misty with a floating dust. Sophia had a vivid sense of the romantic. 
They saw towers and spires, and Chirac talked to her slowly and carefully of the cathedral and the famous churches. He said that the stained glass was marvellous, and with much care he catalogued for her all the things she must visit. They crossed a river. She felt as though she was stepping into the Middle Age. At intervals Gerald changed the valise from hand to hand. Obstinately he would not let Chirac touch it. They struggled upwards through narrow, curving streets. Voilà, said Chirac. They were in front of the Hotel de l'Epe. Across the street was a café crammed with people. Several carriages stood in front. The Hotel de l'Epe had a reassuring air of mellow respectability, such as Chirac had claimed for it. He had suggested this hotel for Madame Scales, because it was not near the place of execution. Gerald had said, of course, of course. Chirac, who did not mean to go to bed, required no room for himself. The Hotel de l'Epe had one room to offer, at the price of twenty-five francs. Gerald revolted at the attempted imposition. A nice thing, he grumbled, that ordinary travellers can't get a decent room at a decent price just because someone's going to be guillotined tomorrow. We'll try elsewhere. His features expressed disgust, but Sophia fancied that he was secretly pleased. They swaggered out of the busy stir of the hotel, as those must who, having declined to be swindled, wished to preserve their importance in the face of the world. In the street a cabman solicited them, and filled them with hope by saying that he knew of a hotel that might suit them, and would drive them there for five francs. He furiously lashed his horse. The mere fact of being in a swiftly moving carriage, which wayfarers had to avoid nimbly, maintained their spirits. They had a near glimpse of the cathedral. The cab halted with a bump in a small square in front of a repellent building which bore the sign Hôtel de Vézilay. The horse was bleeding. Gerald instructed Sophia to remain where she was, and he and Chirac went up four stone steps into the hotel. Sophia, stared at by loose crowds that were promenading, gazed about her, and saw that all the windows of the square were open, and most of them occupied by people who laughed and chattered. Then there was a shout, Gerald's voice. He had appeared at a window on the second floor of the hotel, with Chirac and a very fat woman. Chirac saluted, and Gerald laughed carelessly and nodded. "'It's all right,' said Gerald, having descended. "'How much do they ask?' Sophia inquired, indiscreetly. Gerald hesitated and looked self-conscious. Thirty-five francs, he said, but I've had enough of driving it about. It seems we're lucky to get it even at that. And Chirac shrugged his shoulders, as if to indicate that the situation and the price ought to be accepted philosophically. Gerald gave the driver five francs. He examined the piece and demanded a pourboire. Oh, damn, said Gerald and because he had no smaller change, parted with another two francs. "'Is anyone coming out for this damn valise?' Gerald demanded, like a tyrant whose wrath would presently fall if the populace did not instantly set about minding their P's and Q's. But nobody emerged, and he was compelled to carry the bag himself. The hotel was dark and malodorous, and every room seemed to be crowded with giggling groups of drinkers. "'We can't both sleep in this bed, surely,' said Sophia, when, Chirac having remained downstairs, she faced Gerald in a small, mean bedroom. "'You don't suppose I shall go to bed, do you?' said Gerald, rather brusquely. "'It's for you. We're going to eat now. Look sharp!' Three. It was night. She lay in the narrow, crimson-draped bed. The heavy crimson curtains had been drawn across the dirty lace curtains of the window, for the lights of the little square faintly penetrated through chinks into the room. The sounds of the square also penetrated, extraordinarily loud and clear, for the unabated heat had compelled her to leave the window open. She could not sleep. Exhausted though she was, there was no hope of her being able to sleep. Once again she was profoundly depressed. She remembered the dinner with horror the long, crowded table with semicircular ends, in the oppressive and reeking dining-room, lighted by oil-lamps. There must have been at least forty people at that table. Most of them ate disgustingly, as noisily as pigs, with the end of large, coarse napkins tucked in at their necks. All the service was done by the fat woman whom she had seen at the window with Gerald, and a young girl, 
whose demeanour was candidly brazen. Both these creatures were slatterns. Everything was dirty, but the food was good. Chirac and Gerald were agreed that the food was good as well as the wine. Remarquable, Chirac had said of the wine. Sophia, however, could neither eat nor drink with relish. She was afraid. The company shocked her by its gestures alone. It was very heterogeneous in appearance, some of the diners being well-dressed, approaching elegance, and others shabby. But all the faces, to the youngest, were brutalised, corrupt, and shameless. The juxtaposition of old men and young women was odious to her, especially when those pairs kissed, as they did frequently towards the end of the meal. Happily, she was placed between Chirac and Gerald. That situation seemed to shelter her even from the conversation. She would have comprehended nothing of the conversation, had it not been for the presence of a middle-aged Englishman who sat at the opposite end of the table, with a youngish, stylish Frenchwoman, whom she had seen at Sylvain's on the previous night. The Englishman was evidently under a promise to teach English to the Frenchwoman. He kept translating for her into English, slowly and distinctly, and she would repeat the phrases after him, with strange contortions of the mouth. Thus Sophia gathered that the talk was exclusively about assassinations, executions, criminals, and executioners. Some of the people there made a practice of attending every execution. They were fountains of interesting gossip and the lions of the meal. There was a woman who could recall the dying words of all the victims of justice for twenty years past. The table roared with hysteric laughter at one of this woman's anecdotes. Sophia learnt that she had related how a criminal had said to the priest, who was good-naturedly trying to screen the sight of the guillotine from him with his body, "'Stand away now, parson. Haven't I paid to see it?' Such was the Englishman's rendering. The wages of the executioners and their assistants were discussed, and differences of opinion led to ferocious arguments. A young and dandiacal fellow told as a fact which he was ready to vouch for with a pistol how Cora Pearl, the renowned English courtesan, had, through her influence over a prefect of police, succeeded in visiting a criminal alone in his cell during the night preceding his execution, and had only quitted him an hour before the final summons. The tale won the honours of the dinner. It was regarded as truly impressive, and inevitably it led to the general inquiry, what could the highest personages in the empire see to admire in that red-haired Englishwoman? And, of course, Rivain himself, the handsome homicide, the centre and hero of the fate, was never long out of the conversation. Several of the diners had seen him, one or two knew him, and could give amazing details of his prowess as a man of pleasure. Despite his crime, he seemed to be the object of sincere idolatry. It was said positively that a niece of his victim had been promised a front place at the execution. Apropos of this, Sophia gathered, to her intense astonishment and alarm, that the prison was close by, and that the execution would take place at the corner of the square itself in which the hotel was situated. Gerald must have known. He had hidden it from her. She regarded him sideways with distrust. As the dinner finished, Gerald's pose of a calm, disinterested, scientific observer of humanity gradually broke down. He could not maintain it in front of the increasing license of the scene round the table. He was, at length, somewhat ashamed of having exposed his wife to the view of such an orgy. His restless glance carefully avoided both Sophia and Chirac. The latter, whose unaffected simplicity of interest in the affair had more than anything helped to keep Sophia in countenance, observed the change in Gerald, and Sophia's excessive discomfort, and suggested that they should leave the table without waiting for the coffee. Gerald agreed quickly. Thus had Sophia been released from the horror of the dinner. She did not understand how a man so thoughtful and kindly as Chirac, he had bidden her good night with the most distinguished courtesy could tolerate, much less pleasurably savour, the gluttonous, drunken, and salacious debauchery of the Hotel de Vézelay. But his theory was, so far as she could judge from his imperfect English, that whatever existed might be admitted and examined by serious persons interested in the study of human nature. His face seemed to say, Why not? His face seemed to say to Gerald and to herself, If this incommodes you, what did you come for? Gerald had left her at the bedroom door with a self-conscious nod. She had partly undressed and lain down. 
and instantly the hotel had transformed itself into a kind of sounding-box. It was as if, beneath and within, all the noises of the square, every movement of the hotel reached her ears through cardboard walls. Distant shoutings and laughter below, rattlings of crockery below, stampings up and down stairs, stealthy creepings up and down stairs, brusque calls, fragments of song, whisperings, long sighs suddenly stifled, mysterious groans as of torture broken by a giggle, quarrels and bickering. She was spared nothing in the strangely resonant darkness. Then there came out of the little square a great uproar and commotion, with shrieks, and under the shrieks a confused din. In vain she pressed her face into the pillow, and listened to the irregular prodigious noise of her eyelashes as they scraped the rough linen. The thought had somehow introduced itself into her head that she must arise and go to the window, and see all that was to be seen. She resisted. She said to herself that the idea was absurd, that she did not wish to go to the window. Nevertheless, while arguing with herself, she well knew that resistance to the thought was useless, and that ultimately her legs would obey its command. When, ultimately, she yielded to the fascination, and went to the window, and pulled aside one of the curtains, she had a feeling of relief. The cool grey beginnings of dawn were in the sky, and every detail of the square was visible. Without exception all the windows were wide open, and filled with sightseers. In the background of many windows were burning candles or lamps, that the far distant approach of the sun was already killing. In front of these, on the frontier of two mingling lights, the attentive figures of the watchers were curiously silhouetted. On the red-tiled roofs, too, was a squatted population. Below, a troop of gendarmes, mounted on caracoling horses stretched in line across the square, was gradually sweeping the entire square of a packed, gesticulating, cursing crowd. The operation of this immense besom was very slow. As the spaces of the square were cleared, they began to be dotted by privileged persons, journalists or law officers or their friends, who walked to and fro in conscious pride. Among them Sophia descried Gerald and Chirac, strolling arm in arm, and talking to two elaborately clad girls, who were also arm in arm. Then she saw a red reflection coming from one of the side streets, of which she had a vista. It was the swinging lantern of a wagon, drawn by a gaunt grey horse. The vehicle stopped at the end of the square from which the besom had started, and it was immediately surrounded by the privileged, who, however, were soon persuaded to stand away. The crowd amassed now at the principal inlets of the square gave a formidable cry and burst into the refrain, La voilà, Nicolas! Ah! Ah! ah. The clamour became furious as a group of workmen in blue blouses drew piece by piece all the components of the guillotine from the wagon and laid them carefully on the ground, under the superintendence of a man in a black frock coat and a silk hat with broad flat brims, a little fussy man of nervous gestures. And presently the red columns had risen upright from the ground, and were joined at the top by an acrobatic climber. As each part was bolted and screwed to the growing machine, the man in the high hat carefully tested it. In a short time that seemed very long, the guillotine was finished, save for the triangular steel blade which lay shining on the ground, a sinusure. The executioner pointed to it, and two men picked it up and slipped it into its groove and hoisted it to the summit of the machine. The executioner peered at it interminably, amid a universal silence. Then he actuated the mechanism, and the mass of metal fell with a muffled reverberating thud. There were a few faint shrieks, blended together, and then an overpowering racket of cheers, shouts, hootings, and fragments of song. The blade was again lifted, instantly reproducing silence, and again it fell, liberating a new bedlam. The executioner made a movement of satisfaction. Many women at the windows clapped enthusiastically, and the gendarmes had to fight brutally against the fierce pressure of the crowd. The workmen doffed their blouses and put on coats, and Sophia was disturbed to see them coming in single file towards the hotel, followed by the executioner in the silk hat. 4. There was a tremendous opening of doors in the Hotel de Vézelay, and much whispering on thresholds, as the executioner and his band entered solemnly. Sophia heard them tramp upstairs, 
They seemed to hesitate, and then apparently went into a room on the same landing as hers. A door banged, but Sophia could hear the regular sound of new voices talking, and then the rattling of glasses on a tray. The conversation which came to her from the windows of the hotel now showed a great increase of excitement. She could not see the people at these neighbouring windows without showing her own head, and this she would not do. The boom of a heavy bell striking the hour vibrated over the roofs of the square. She supposed that it might be the cathedral clock. In a corner of the square she saw Gerald, talking vivaciously alone with one of the two girls who had been together. She wondered vaguely how such a girl had been brought up, and what her parents thought, or knew and she was conscious of an intense pride in herself, of a measureless, haughty feeling of superiority. Her eye caught the guillotine again, and was held by it. Guarded by gendarmes, that tall and simple object did most menacingly dominate the square with its crude red columns. Tools and a large open box lay on the ground beside it. The enfeebled horse in the wagon had an air of dozing on his twisted legs. Then the first rays of the sun shot lengthwise across the square, at the level of the chimneys, and Sophia noticed that nearly all the lamps and candles had been extinguished. Many people at the windows were yawning. They laughed foolishly after they had yawned. Some were eating and drinking. Some were shouting conversations from one house to another. The mounted gendarmes were still pressing back the feverish crowds that growled at all the inlets to the square. She saw Chirac walking to and fro alone, but she could not find Gerald. He would not have left the square. Perhaps he had returned to the hotel, and would come up to see if she was comfortable, or if she needed anything. Guiltily she sprang back into bed. When last she had surveyed the room it had been dark. Now it was bright, and every detail stood clear. Yet she had the sensation of having been at the window only a few minutes. She waited, but Gerald did not come. She could hear chiefly the steady hum of the voices of the executioner and his aides. She reflected that the room in which they were must be at the back. The other sounds in the hotel grew less noticeable. Then, after an age, she heard a door open, and a low voice say something commandingly in French, and then a, Oui, monsieur, and a general descent of the stairs. The executioner and his aides were leaving. You! cried a drunken English voice from an upper floor. It was the middle-aged Englishman translating what the executioner had said. "'You, you will take the head.' Then a rough laugh, and the repeating voice of the Englishman's girl, still pursuing her studies in English. "'You will take the head. Yes, sir.' And another laugh. At length quiet reigned in the hotel. Sophia said to herself, "'I won't stir from this bed till it's all over and Gerald comes back. She dozed under the sheet, and was awakened by a tremendous shrieking, growling, and yelling, a phenomenon of human bestiality that far surpassed Sophia's narrow experiences. Shut up though she was in a room, perfectly secure, the mad fury of that crowd, balked at the inlets to the square, thrilled and intimidated her. It sounded as if they would be capable of tearing the very horses to pieces. "'I must stay where I am,' she murmured and even while saying it she rose and went to the window again and peeped out. The torture involved was extreme, but she had not sufficient force within her to resist the fascination. She stared greedily into the bright square. The first thing she saw was Gerald coming out of a house opposite, followed after a few seconds by the girl with whom he had previously been talking. Gerald glanced hastily up at the façade of the hotel and then approached as near as he could to the red columns, in front of which were now drawn a line of gendarmes with naked swords. A second and larger wagon, with two horses, waited by the side of the other one. The racket beyond the square continued and even grew louder, but the couple of hundred persons within the cordons, and all the inhabitants of the windows, drunk and sober, gazed in a fixed and sinister enchantment at the region of the guillotine, as Sophia gazed. I cannot stand this, she told herself in horror, but she could not move. She could not move even her eyes. At intervals the crowd would burst out in a violent staccato. Le voilà, Nicolas! Ah, ah, ah! And the final ah was devilish. Then a gigantic, passionate roar, 
the culmination of the mob's fierce savagery crashed against the skies. The line of maddened horses swerved and reared, and seemed to fall on the furious multitude, while the statue-like gendarmes rocked over them. It was a last effort to break the cordon, and it failed. From the little street at the rear of the guillotine appeared a priest, walking backwards, and holding a crucifix high in his right hand. And behind him came the handsome hero, his body all crossed with cords, between two warders, who pressed against him and supported him on either side. He was certainly very young. He lifted his chin gallantly, but his face was incredibly white. Sophia discerned that the priest was trying to hide the sight of the guillotine from the prisoner with his body, just as in the story which she had heard at dinner. Except the voice of the priest, indistinctly rising and falling in the prayer for the dying, there was no sound in the square or its environs. The windows were now occupied by groups turned to stone, with distended eyes fixed on the little procession. Sophia had a tightening of the throat and the hand trembled by which she held the curtain. The central figure did not seem to her to be alive, but rather a doll, a marionette wound up to imitate the action of a tragedy. She saw the priest offer the crucifix to the mouth of the marionette, which, with a clumsy, unhuman shoving of its corded shoulders, butted the thing away, and as the procession turned and stopped, she could plainly see that the marionette's nape and shoulders were bare, his shirt having been slit. It was horrible. "'Why do I stay here?' she asked herself hysterically, but she did not stir. The victim had disappeared now in the midst of a group of men. Then she perceived him prone under the red column, between the grooves. The silence was now broken only by the tinkling of the horses' bits in the corner of the square. The line of gendarmes in front of the scaffold held their swords tightly and looked over their noses, ignoring the privileged groups that peered almost between their shoulders. And Sophia waited, horror-struck. She saw nothing but the gleaming triangle of metal that was suspended high above the prone attendant victim. She felt like a lost soul, torn too soon from the shelter, and exposed for ever to the worst hazards of destiny. Why was she in this strange, incomprehensible town, foreign and inimical to her, watching with agonised glance this cruel, obscene spectacle? Her sensibilities were all a bleeding mass of wounds. Why? Only yesterday, and she had been an innocent, timid creature in Bursley, in Axe, a foolish creature who deemed the concealment of letters a supreme excitement. Either that day or this day was not real. Why was she imprisoned alone in that odious, indescribably odious hotel, with no one to soothe and comfort her and carry her away? The distant bell boomed once. Then a monosyllabic voice sounded, sharp, low, nervous. She recognised the voice of the executioner, whose name she had heard but could not remember. There was a clicking noise. She shrank down to the floor in terror and loathing, and hid her face and shuddered. Shriek after shriek from various windows rang on her ears in a fusillade, and then the mad yell of the penned crowd, which, like herself, had not seen, but had heard, extinguished all other noise. Justice was done. The great ambition of Gerald's life was at last satisfied. Later, amid the stir of the hotel, there came a knock at her door, impatient and nervous. Forgetting in her tribulation that she was without her bodice, she got up from the floor in a kind of miserable dream, and opened. Chirac stood on the landing, and he had Gerald by the arm. Chirac looked worn out, curiously fragile and pathetic. But Gerald was the very image of death. The attainment of his ambition had utterly destroyed his equilibrium. His curiosity had proved itself stronger than his stomach. Sophia would have pitied him, had she in that moment been capable of pity. Gerald staggered past her into the room, and sank with a groan onto the bed. Not long since he had been proudly conversing with impudent women. Now, in a swift collapse, he was as flaccid as a sick hound, and as disgusting as an aged drunkard. "'He is some little souffrant,' said Chirac weakly. Sophia perceived in Chirac's tone the assumption that, of course, her present duty was to devote herself to the task of restoring her shamed husband to his manly pride. "'And what about me?' 
she thought bitterly. The fat woman ascended the stairs like a tottering blancmange, and began to gabble to Sophia, who understood nothing whatever. Uh, she wants uh, sixty francs, uh, Chirac said, and in answer to Sophia's startled question, he explained that Gerald had agreed to pay a hundred francs for the room, which was the landlady's own, fifty francs in advance, and the fifty after the execution. The other ten was for the dinner. The landlady, distrusting the whole of her clientele, was collecting her accounts instantly on the completion of the spectacle. Sophia made no remark as to Gerald's lie to her. Indeed, Chirac had heard it. She knew Gerald for a glib liar to others. Indeed, Chirac had heard it. She knew Gerald for a glib liar to others. But she was naively surprised when he practised upon herself. "'Gerald, do you hear?' she said coldly. The amateur of severed heads only groaned. With a moment of irritation she went to him, and felt in his pockets for his purse. He acquiesced, still groaning. Chirac helped her to choose and count the coins. The fat woman, appeased, pursued her way. A "'Good bye, madame,' said Chirac, with his customary courtliness, transforming the landing of the hideous hotel into some imperial antechamber. "'Are you going away?' she asked, in surprise. Her distress was so obvious that it tremendously flattered him. He would have stayed if he could, but he had to return to Paris to write and deliver his article. "'Tomorrow I hope,' he murmured sympathetically, kissing her hand. The gesture atoned somewhat for the sordidness of her situation, and even corrected the faults of her attire. Always afterwards it seemed to her that Chirac was an old and intimate friend. He had successfully passed through the ordeal of seeing the wrong side of the stuff of her life. She shut the door on him with a lingering glance, and reconciled herself to her predicament. Gerald slept. Just as he was, he slept heavily. This was what he had brought her to, then, the horrors of the night, of the dawn, and of the morning, ineffable suffering and humiliation, anguish and torture that could never be forgotten. And after a fatuous vigil of unguessed license, he had tottered back, an offensive beast, to sleep the day away in that filthy chamber. He did not possess even enough spirit to play the role of roisterer to the end, and she was bound to him, far, far from any other human aid, cut off irrevocably by her pride from those who perhaps would have protected her from his dangerous folly. The deep conviction henceforward formed a permanent part of her general consciousness that he was simply an irresponsible and thoughtless fool. He was without sense. Such was her brilliant and godlike husband, the man who had given her the right to call herself a married woman. He was a fool. With all her ignorance of the world, she could see that nobody but an arrant imbecile could have brought her to the present pass. Her native sagacity revolted. Gusts of feeling came over her, in which she could have thrashed him into the realisation of his responsibilities. Sticking out of the breast pocket of his soiled coat was the packet which he had received on the previous day. If he had not already lost it, he could only thank his luck. She took it. There were English banknotes in it for two hundred pounds, a letter from a banker, and other papers. With precautions against noise, she tore the envelope and the letters and papers into small pieces, and then looked about for a place to hide them. A cupboard suggested itself. She got on a chair and pushed the fragments out of sight on the topmost shelf, where they may well be to this day. She finished dressing, and then sewed the notes into the lining of her skirt. She had no silly, delicate notions about stealing. She obscurely felt that, in the care of a man like Gerald, she might find herself in the most monstrous, the most impossible dilemmas. Those notes, safe and secret in her skirt, gave her confidence, reassured her against the perils of the future, and endowed her with independence. The act was characteristic of her enterprise and of her fundamental prudence. It approached the heroic, and her conscience hotly defended its righteousness. She decided that when he discovered his loss, she would merely deny all knowledge of the envelope, for he had not spoken a word to her about it. He never mentioned the details of money. He had a fortune. However, the necessity for this untruth did not occur. 
he made no reference whatever to his loss. The fact was, he thought he had been careless enough to let the envelope be filched from him during the excesses of the night. All day till evening, Sophia sat on a dirty chair without food while Gerald slept. She kept repeating to herself in amazed resentment, "'A hundred francs for this room! A hundred francs! And he hadn't the pluck to tell me!' She could not have expressed her contempt. Long before sheer ennui forced her to look out of the window again, every sign of justice had been removed from the square. Nothing whatever remained in the heavy August sunshine, save gathered heaps of filth, where the horses had reared and caracoled. CHAPTER Four, A CRISIS FOR GERALD One. For a time there existed in the minds of both Gerald and Sophia the remarkable notion that twelve thousand pounds represented the infinity of wealth, that this sum possessed special magical properties, which rendered it insensible to the process of subtraction. It seemed impossible that twelve thousand pounds, while continually getting less, could ultimately quite disappear. The notion lived longer in the mind of Gerald than in that of Sophia, for Gerald would never look at a disturbing fact, whereas Sophia's gaze was morbidly fascinated by such phenomena. In a life devoted to travel and pleasure, Gerald meant not to spend more than six hundred a year, the interest on his fortune. Six hundred a year is less than two pounds a day, yet Gerald never paid less than two pounds a day in hotel bills alone. He was hoping that he was living on a thousand a year, had a secret fear that he might be spending fifteen hundred, and was really spending about two thousand five hundred. Still, the remarkable notion of the inexhaustibility of twelve thousand pounds always reassured him. The faster the money went, the more vigorously this notion flourished in Gerald's mind. When twelve had unaccountably dwindled to three, Gerald suddenly decided that he must act, and in a few months he lost two thousand on the Paris Bourse. The adventure frightened him and in his panic he scattered a couple of hundred in a frenzy of high living. But even with only twenty thousand francs left out of three hundred thousand, he held closely to the belief that natural laws would, in his case, somehow be suspended. He had heard of men who were once rich, begging bread and sweeping crossings, but he felt quite secure against such risks, by simple virtue of the axiom that he was he. However, he meant to assist this axiom by efforts to earn money. When these continued to fail, he tried to assist the axiom by borrowing money, but he found that his uncle had definitely done with him. He would have assisted the axiom by stealing money, but he had neither the nerve nor the knowledge to be a swindler. He was not even sufficiently expert to cheat at cards. He had thought in thousands. Now he began to think in hundreds, in tens daily and hourly. He paid two hundred francs in railway fares in order to live economically in a village, and shortly afterwards another two hundred francs in railway fares in order to live economically in Paris. And to celebrate the arrival in Paris, and the definite commencement of an era of strict economy and serious search for a livelihood, he spent a hundred francs on a dinner at the Maison Dorée, and two balcony stalls at the Gymnase. In brief, he omitted nothing, no act, no resolve, no self-deception of the typical fool in his situation, always convinced that his difficulties and his wisdom were quite exceptional. In May 1870, on an afternoon, he was ranging nervously to and fro in a three-cornered bedroom of a little hotel at the angle of the Rue Fontaine and the Rue Laval, now the Rue Victor Masse, within half a minute of the Boulevard de Clichy. This had come to that— an exchange of the Grand Boulevard for the Boulevard Extérieur. Sophia sat on a chair at the grimy window, glancing down in idle disgust of life at the Clichy Odéon omnibus, which was casting off its tip-horse at the corner of the Rue Chaptal. The noise of petty, hurried traffic over the bossy paving-stones was deafening. The locality was not one to correspond with an ideal. There was too much humanity crowded into those narrow, hilly streets. Humanity seemed to be bulging out at the windows of the high houses. Gerald healed his pride by saying that this was, after all, the real Paris, and that the cookery was as good as could be got anywhere, pay what you would. 
he seldom ate a meal in the little salons on the first floor without becoming ecstatic upon the cookery. To hear him he might have chosen the hotel on its superlative merits without regard to expense, and with his air of use and custom he did indeed look like a connoisseur of Paris, who knew better than to herd with vulgar tourists in the pens of the Madeleine quarter. He was dressed with some distinction. Good clothes, when put to the test, survive a change of fortune, as a Roman arch survives the luxury of a departed empire. Only his collar, large V-shaped front, and wristbands, which bore ineffaceable signs of cheap laundering, reflected the shadow of impending disaster. He glanced sideways, stealthily, at Sophia. She, too, was still dressed with distinction, in the robe of black veil, the cashmere shawl, and the little black hat with its falling veil. There was no apparent symptom of beggary. She would have been judged as just one of those women who content themselves with few clothes but good, and greatly aided by nature, make a little go a long way. Good black will last for eternity. It discloses no secrets of modification and mending, and it is not transparent. At last, Gerald, resuming a suspended conversation, said, as it were doggedly, "'I tell you I haven't got five francs altogether, and you can feel my pockets if you like,' added the habitual liar in him, feeling incredulity. "'Well, and, and what do you expect me to do?' Sophia inquired. The accent, at once ironic and listless, in which she put this question, showed that strange and vital things had happened to Sophia in the four years which had elapsed since her marriage. It did really seem to her, indeed, that the Sophia whom Gerald had espoused was dead and gone, and that another Sophia had come into her body, so intensely conscious was she of a fundamental change in herself, under the stress of continuous experience. And though this was but a seeming, though she was still the same Sophia, more fully disclosed, it was a true seeming, indisputably more beautiful than when Gerald had unwillingly made her his legal wife. She was now nearly twenty-four, and looked perhaps somewhat older than her age. Her frame was firmly set, her waist thicker, neither slim nor stout. The lips were rather hard and she had a habit of tightening her mouth, on the same provocation as sends a snail into its shell. No trace was left of immature gawkiness in her gestures, or of simplicity in her intonations. She was a woman of commanding and slightly arrogant charm, not in the least degree the charm of innocence and ingenuousness. Her eyes were the eyes of one who has lost her illusions too violently and too completely. Her gaze, coldly comprehending, implied familiarity with the abjectness of human nature. Gerald had begun and had finished her education. He had not ruined her, as a bad professor may ruin a fine voice, because her moral force immeasurably exceeded his. He had unwittingly produced a masterpiece, but it was a tragic masterpiece. Sophia was such a woman as, by a mere glance as she utters an opinion, will make a man say to himself, half in desire and half in alarm, lest she reads him too. By Jove, she must have been through a thing or two. She knows what people are. The marriage was, of course, a calamitous folly. From the very first, from the moment when the commercial traveller had, with incomparable rash fatuity, thrown the paper pellet over the counter, Sophia's awakening common sense had told her that in yielding to her instinct she was sowing misery and shame for herself. But she had gone on, as if under a spell. It had needed the irretrievableness of flight from home to begin the breaking of the trance. Once fully awakened out of the trance, she had recognised her marriage for what it was. She had made neither the best nor the worst of it. She had accepted Gerald as one accepts a climate. She saw again and again that he was irreclaimably a fool and a prodigy of irresponsibleness. She tolerated him, now with sweetness, now bitterly, accepting always his caprices, and never permitting herself to have wishes of her own. She was ready to pay the price of pride, and of a moment's imbecility with a lifetime of self-repression. It was high, but it was the price. She had acquired nothing but an exceptionally good knowledge of the French language. She soon learnt to scorn Gerald's glib maltreatment of the tongue, and she had conserved nothing but her dignity. She knew that Gerald was sick of her, that he would have danced for joy to be rid of her, that he was constantly unfaithful, that he had long since ceased to be excited by her beauty. She knew also that at bottom he was a little afraid of her. 
Here was her sole moral consolation. The thing that sometimes struck her as surprising was that he had not abandoned her, simply and crudely walked off one day, and forgotten to take her with him. They hated each other, but in different ways. She loathed him, and he resented her. "'What do I expect you to do?' he repeated after her. "'Why don't you write home to your people and get some money out of them?' Now that he had said what was in his mind, he faced her with a bullying swagger. Had he been a bigger man, he might have tried the effect of physical bullying on her. One of his numerous reasons for resenting her was that she was the taller of the two. She made no reply. "'Now you needn't turn pale and begin all that fuss over again. What I'm suggesting is a perfectly reasonable thing. If I haven't got money, I haven't got it. I can't invent it.' She perceived that he was ready for one of their periodical tempestuous quarrels. But that day she felt too tired and unwell to quarrel. His warning against a repetition of fuss had reference to the gastric dizziness from which he had been suffering for two years. It would take her usually after a meal. She did not swoon, but her head swam, and she could not stand. She would sink down wherever she happened to be, and her face, alarmingly white, murmur faintly, "'My salts!' Within five minutes the attack had gone, and left no trace. She had been through one just after lunch. He resented this affliction. He detested being compelled to hand the smelling-bottle to her, and he would have avoided doing so if her pallor did not always alarm him. Nothing but this pallor convinced him that the attacks were not a deep ruse to impress him. His attitude invariably implied that she could cure the malady if she chose, but that through obstinacy she did not choose. "'Are you going to have the decency to answer my question, or aren't you?' "'What question?' Her vibrating voice was low and restrained. "'Will you write to your people?' "'For money?' The sarcasm of her tone was diabolic. She could not have kept the sarcasm out of her tone. She did not attempt to keep it out. She cared little if it whipped him to fury. Did he imagine, seriously, that she would be capable of going on her knees to her family? She? Was he unaware that his wife was the proudest and most obstinate woman on earth, that all her behaviour to him was the expression of her pride and her obstinacy? Ill and weak though she felt, she marshalled together all the forces of her character to defend her resolve, never, never to eat the bread of humiliation. She was absolutely determined to be dead to her family. Certainly, one December, several years previously, she had seen English Christmas cards in an English shop in the Rue de Rivoli, and in a sudden gush of tenderness towards Constance, she had dispatched a coloured greeting to Constance and her mother, and having initiated the custom, she had continued it. That was not like asking a kindness. It was bestowing a kindness. But except for the annual card, she was dead to St. Luke's Square. She was one of those daughters who disappear and are not discussed in the family circle. The thought of her immense foolishness, the little tender thoughts of Constance, some flitting souvenir, full of unwilling admiration, of a regal gesture of her mother, these things only steeled her against any sort of resurrection after death. And he was urging her to write home for money. Why, she would not even have paid a visit in splendour to St. Luke's Square. Never should they know what she had suffered, and especially her Aunt Harriet, from whom she had stolen. "'Will you write to your people?' he demanded yet again, emphasising and separating each word. No, she said shortly, with terrible disdain. Why not? Because I won't. The curling line of her lips, as they closed on each other, said all the rest, all the cruel truths about his unspeakable, inane, coarse follies, his laziness, his excessive, his lies, his deceptions, his bad faith, his truculence, his improvidence, his shameful waste and ruin of his life and hers. She doubted whether he realised his baseness and her wrongs, but if he could not read them in her silent contumely, she was too proud to recite them to him. She had never complained, save in uncontrolled moments of anger. "'If that's the way you're going to talk, all right,' he snapped, furious. Evidently he was baffled. She kept silence. She was determined to see what he would do in the face of her inaction. 
"'You know I'm not joking,' he pursued. "'We shall starve.' "'Very well,' she agreed. "'We shall starve.' She watched him surreptitiously, and she was almost sure that he really had come to the end of his tether. His voice, which never alone convinced, carried a sort of conviction now. He was penniless. In four years he had squandered twelve thousand pounds, and had nothing to show for it except an enfeebled digestion and a tragic figure of a wife. One small point of satisfaction there was, and all the banes in her clutched at it, and tried to suck satisfaction from it. Their manner of travelling about from hotel to hotel had made it impossible for Gerald to run up debts. A few debts he might have, unknown to her, but they could not be serious. So they looked at one another, in hatred and despair. The inevitable had arrived. For months she had fronted it in bravado, not concealing from herself that it lay in waiting. For years he had been sure that, though the inevitable might happen to others, it could not happen to him. There it was. He was conscious of a heavy weight in his stomach, and she of a general numbness, enwrapping her fatigue. Even then he could not believe that it was true, this disaster. As for Sophia, she was reconciling herself with bitter philosophy to the eccentricities of fate. Who would have dreamed that she, a young girl, brought up, etc.? Her mother could not have improved the occasion more uncompromisingly than Sophia did, behind that disdainful mask. "'Well, if that's it—' Gerald exploded at length, puffing, and he puffed out of the room and was gone in a second. Two. She languidly picked up a book the moment Gerald had departed, and tried to prove to herself that she was sufficiently in command of her nerves to read. For a long time reading had been her chief solace, but she could not read. She glanced round the inhospitable chamber, and thought of the hundreds of rooms, some splendid and some vile but all arid in their unwelcoming aspect, through which she had passed in her progress from mad exaltation to calm and cold disgust. The ceaseless din of the street annoyed her jaded ears, and a great wave of desire for peace, peace of no matter what kind, swept through her, and then her deep distrust of Gerald reawakened. In spite of his seriously desperate air, which had a quality of sincerity quite new in her experience of him, she could not be entirely sure that, in asserting utter penury, he was not, after all, merely using a trick to get rid of her. She sprang up, threw the book on the bed, and seized her gloves. She would follow him, if she could. She would do what she had never done before. She would spy on him. Fighting against her lassitude, she descended the long winding stairs, and peeped forth from the doorway into the street. The ground floor of the hotel was a wine-shop, the stout landlord was lightly flicking one of his three little yellow tables that stood on the pavement. He smiled with his customary benevolence, and silently pointed in the direction of the Rue Notre-Dame de Lorette. She saw Gerald down there in the distance. He was smoking a cigar. He seemed to be a little man without a care. The smoke of the cigar came first round his left cheek and then round his right, sailing away into nothing. He walked with a gay spring, but not quickly, flourishing his cane as freely as the traffic of the pavement would permit, glancing into all the shop windows, and into the eyes of all the women under forty. This was not at all the same man as had, a moment ago, been spitting angry menaces at her in the bedroom of the hotel. It was a fellow of blithe charm, ripe for any adventurous joys that destiny had to offer. Supposing he turned round and saw her, if he turned round and saw her, and asked her what she was doing there in the street, she would tell him plainly, "'I'm following you, to find out what you do.' But he did not turn. He went straight forward, deviating at the church, where the crowd became thicker, into the Rue du Faubourg Montmartre, and so to the boulevard, which he crossed. The whole city seemed excited and vivacious. Cannons boomed in slow succession, and flags were flying. Sophia had no conception of the significance of those guns, for, though she read a great deal, she never read a newspaper. The idea of opening a newspaper never occurred to her. But she was accustomed to the feverish atmosphere of Paris. She had lately seen regiments of cavalry flashing and prancing in the Luxembourg gardens, and had much admired the fine picture. 
she accepted the booming as another expression of the high spirit that had to find vent somehow in this feverish empire. She so accepted it and forgot it, using all the panorama of the capital as a dim background for her exacerbated egoism. She was obliged to walk slowly, because Gerald walked slowly. A beautiful woman, or any woman not positively hag-like or venerable, who walks slowly in the streets of Paris, becomes at once the cause of inconvenient desires, as representing the main objective on earth, always transcending in importance politics and affairs. Just as a true patriotic Englishman cannot be too busy to run after a fox, so a Frenchman is always ready to forsake all in order to follow a woman whom he has never before set eyes on. Many men thought twice about her, with her romantic Saxon mystery of temperament and her Parisian clothes. But all refrained from affronting her, not in the least out of respect for the gloom in her face, but from an expert conviction that those rapt eyes were fixed immovably on another male. She walked unscathed amid the frothing hounds as though protected by a spell. On the south side of the boulevard, Gerald proceeded down the Rue Montmartre, and then turned suddenly into the Rue Croissant. Sophia stopped and asked the price of some combs which were exposed outside a little shop. Then she went on, boldly passing the end of the Rue Croissant. No shadow of Gerald. She saw the signs of newspapers all along the street, Le Bien Public, La Presse Libre, La Patrie. There was a creamery at the corner. She entered it and asked for a cup of chocolate and sat down. She wanted to drink coffee, but every doctor had forbidden coffee to her, on account of her attacks of dizziness. Then, having ordered chocolate, she felt that on this occasion, when she had need of strength in her great fatigue, only coffee could suffice her, and she changed the order. She was close to the door, and Gerald could not escape her vigilance if he emerged at that end of the street. She drank the coffee with greedy satisfaction, and waited in the creamery till she began to feel conspicuous there. And then Gerald went by the door within six feet of her. He turned the corner, and continued his descent of the Rue Montmartre. She paid for her coffee, and followed the chase. Her blood seemed to be up, her lips were tightened, and her thought was, "'Wherever he goes, I'll go, and I don't care what happens.' She despised him, she felt herself above him, she felt that somehow, since quitting the hotel, he had been gradually growing more and more vile and meat to be exterminated. She imagined infamies as to the Rue Croissant. There was no obvious ground for this intensifying of her attitude towards him. It was merely the result of the chase. All that could be definitely charged against him was the smoking of a cigar. He stepped into a tobacco shop, and came out with a longer cigar than the first one, a more expensive article stripped off its collar, and lighted it, as a millionaire might have lighted it. This was the man who swore that he did not possess five francs. She tracked him as far as the Rue de Rivoli, and then lost him. There were vast surging crowds in the Rue de Rivoli, and much bunting, and soldiers, and gesticulatory policemen. The general effect of the street was that all things were brightly waving in the breeze. She was caught in the crowd as in the current of a stream, and when she tried to sidle out of it into a square, a row of smiling policemen barred her passage. She was part of the traffic that they had to regulate. She drifted till the Louvre came into view. After all, Gerald had only strolled forth to see the sight of the day, whatever it might be. She knew not what it was. She had no curiosity about it. In the middle of all that thickening mass of humanity, staring with one accord at the vast monument of royal and imperial vanities, she thought, with her characteristic grimness, of the sacrifice of her whole career as a schoolteacher for the chance of seeing Gerald once a quarter in the shop. She gloated over that, as a sick appetite will gloat over tainted food, and she saw the shop and the curve of the stairs up to the showroom, and the pier-glass in the showroom. Then the guns began to boom again, and splendid carriages swept one after another from under a majestic archway, and glittered westward down a lane of spotless, splendid uniforms. The carriages were laden with still more splendid uniforms, and with enchanting toilettes. Sophia, in her modestly stylish black, mechanically noticed how much easier it was for a tired woman to sit in a carriage now that crinolines had gone. That was the sole impression made upon her by this glimpse of the last fate of the Napoleonic Empire. 
she knew not that the supreme pillars of imperialism were exhibiting themselves before her, and that the eyes of those uniforms and those toilettes were full of the legendary beauty of Eugenie, and their ears echoing to the long phrases of Napoleon the Third about his gratitude to his people for their confidence in him, as shown by the plebiscite, and about the ratification of constitutional reforms guaranteeing order, and about the empire having been strengthened at its base, and about showing force by moderation, and envisaging the future without fear, and about the bosom of peace and liberty, and the eternal continuance of his dynasty. She just wondered vaguely what was afoot. When the last carriage had rolled away, and the guns and acclamations had ceased, the crowd at length began to scatter. She was carried by it into the Place du Palais Royal, and in a few moments she managed to withdraw into the Rue des Bons Enfants, and was free. The coins in her purse amounted to three sous, and therefore, though she felt exhausted to the point of illness, she had to return to the hotel on foot. Very slowly she crawled upwards in the direction of the boulevard, through the expiring gaiety of the city. Near the bourse a fiacre overtook her, and in the fiacre were Gerald and a woman. Gerald had not seen her. He was talking eagerly to his ornate companion. All his body was alive. The fiacre was out of sight in a moment, but Sophia judged instantly the grade of the woman, who was evidently of the discreet class that frequented the big shops of an afternoon with something of their own to sell. Sophia's grimness increased. The pace of the fiacre, her fatigued body, Gerald's delightful, careless vivacity, the attractive streaming veil of the nice, modest courtesan, everything conspired to increase it. 3. Gerald returned to the bedroom which contained his wife and all else that he owned in the world at about nine o'clock that evening. Sophia was in bed. She had been driven to bed by weariness. She would have preferred to sit up to receive her husband, even if it had meant sitting up all night, but her body was too heavy for her spirit. She lay in the dark. She had eaten nothing. Gerald came straight into the room. He struck a match, which burned blue with a stench for several seconds, and then gave a clear yellow flame. He lit a candle and saw his wife. "'Oh,' he said, "'you're there, are you?' She offered no reply. "'Won't speak, eh?' he said. "'Agreeable sort of wife. <laughs> well, have you made up your mind to do as I told you? I've come back especially to know.' She still did not speak. He sat down with his hat on, and stuck out his feet, wagging them to and fro on the heels. "'I'm quite without money,' he went on, "'and I'm sure your people will be glad to lend us a bit till I get some, especially as it's a question of you starving as well as me. If I had enough to pay your fares to Bursley, I'd pack you off. But I haven't.' She could only hear his exasperating voice. The end of the bed was between her eyes and his. "'Liar!' she said, with uncompromising distinctness. The word reached him, barbed with all the poison of her contempt and disgust. There was a pause. "'Oh, I'm a liar, am I? Thanks. I lied enough to get you, I'll admit. But you never complained of that. I remember beginning the new year well with a thumping lie just to have a sight of you, my vixen. But you didn't complain then. I took you with only the clothes on your back, and I've spent every cent I had on you, and now I'm spun. You call me a liar. She said nothing. However, he went on, this is going to come to an end, this is. He rose, changed the position of the candle, putting it on a chest of drawers, and then drew his trunk from the wall and knelt in front of it. She gathered that he was packing his clothes. At first she did not comprehend his reference to beginning the new year. Then his meaning revealed itself. That story to her mother about having been attacked by ruffians at the bottom of King Street had been an invention, a ruse to account plausibly for his presence on her mother's doorstep, and she had never suspected that the story was not true. In spite of her experience of his lying, she had never suspected that that particular statement was a lie. What a simpleton she was! There was a continual movement in the room for about a quarter of an hour. Then a key turned in the lock of the trunk. 
His head popped up over the foot of the bed. "'This isn't a joke, you know,' he said. She kept silence. "'I give you one more chance. Will you write to your mother, or Constance, if you like, or won't you?' She scorned to reply in any way. "'I'm your husband,' he said, "'and it's your duty to obey me, particularly in an affair like this. I order you to write to your mother.' The corners of her lips turned downwards. Angered by her mute obstinacy, he broke away from the bed with a sudden gesture. "'You do as you like,' he cried, putting on his overcoat, "'and I shall do as I like. You can't say I haven't warned you. It's your own deliberate choice, mind you. Whatever happens to you, you've brought it on yourself.' She would not speak a word, not even to insist that she was indisposed. He pushed his trunk outside the door, and returned to the bed. "'You understand?' he said menacingly. "'I'm off.' She looked up at the foul ceiling. "'Hm,' he sniffed, bringing his reserves of pride to combat the persistent silence that was damaging his dignity. And he went off, sticking his head forward like a pugilist. "'Here,' she muttered, "'you're forgetting this.' He turned. She stretched her hand to the night-table, and held up a red circlet. "'What is it?' "'It's the bit of paper off the cigar you bought in the room on March this afternoon,' she answered in a significant tone. He hesitated, then swore violently and bounced out of the room. He had made her suffer, but she was almost repaid for everything by that moment of cruel triumph. She exulted in it, and never forgot it. Five minutes later, the gloomy menial in felt slippers and alpaca jacket, who seemed to pass the whole of his life flitting in and out of bedrooms like a rabbit in a warren, carried Gerald's trunk downstairs. She recognised the peculiar tread of his slippers. Then there was a knock at the door. The landlady entered, actuated by a legitimate curiosity. "'Madame is suffering,' the landlady began. Sophia refused offers of food and nursing. "'Madame knows without doubt that monsieur has gone away.' "'Has he paid the bill?' Sophia asked bluntly. "'But yes, madame, till to-morrow. Then madame has want of nothing?' "'If you will extinguish the candle,' said Sophia. He had deserted her then. All this, she reflected, listening in the dark to the ceaseless rattle of the street, because mother and Constance wanted to see the elephant, and I had to go into father's room. I should never have caught sight of him from the drawing-room window. 4. She passed a night of physical misery, exasperated by the tireless rattling vitality of the street. She kept saying to herself, I'm all alone now, and I'm going to be ill. I am ill. She saw herself dying in Paris, and heard the expressions of facile sympathy and idle curiosity drawn forth by the sight of the dead body of this foreign woman in a little Paris hotel. She reached the stage, in the gradual excruciation of her nerves, when she was obliged to concentrate her agonised mind on an intense and painful expectancy of the next new noise, which, when it came, increased her torture and decreased her strength to support it. She went through all the interminable dilatoriness of the dawn, from the moment when she could scarcely discern the window, to the moment when she could read the word BOT on the red circlet of paper, which had tossed all night on the sea of the counterpane. She knew she would never sleep again. She could not imagine herself asleep. And then she was startled by a sound that seemed to clash with the rest of her impressions. It was a knocking at the door. With a start, she perceived that she must have been asleep. "'Enter,' she murmured. There entered the menial in alpaca. His waxen face showed a morose commiseration. He noiselessly approached the bed. He seemed to have none of the characteristics of a man, but to be a creature infinitely mysterious and aloof from humanity, and held out to Sophia a visiting card in his grey hand. It was Chirac's card. A "'Monsieur asked for Monsieur,' said the waiter. And then, as monsieur had gone away, he demanded to see madame. He says it is very important. Her heart jumped, partly in vague alarm, and partly with a sense of relief at this chance of speaking to someone whom she knew. 
She tried to reflect rationally. "'What time is it?' she inquired. Eleven o'clock, madame.' This was surprising. The fact that it was eleven o'clock destroyed the remains of her self-confidence. How could it be eleven o'clock, with the dawn scarcely finished? "'He says it is very important,' repeated the waiter, imperturbably and solemnly. "'Will madame see him an instant?' Between resignation and anticipation, she said, "'Yes.' "'It is well, madame,' said the waiter, disappearing without a sound. She sat up, and managed to drag her matinee from a chair, and put it around her shoulders. Then she sank back from weakness, physical and spiritual. She hated to receive Chirac in a bedroom, and particularly in that bedroom. But the hotel had no public room except the dining-room, which began to be occupied after eleven o'clock. Moreover, she could not possibly get up. Yes, on the whole she was pleased to see Chirac. He was almost her only acquaintance, assuredly the only being whom she could by any stretch of meaning call a friend in the whole of Europe. Gerald and she had wandered to and fro, skimming always over the real life of nations, and never penetrating into it. There was no place for them, because they had made none, with the exception of Chirac, whom an accident of business had thrown into Gerald's company years before. They had no social relations. Gerald was not a man to make friends. He did not seem to need friends, or at any rate to feel the want of them. But as chance had given him Chirac, he maintained the connection whenever they came to Paris. Sophia, of course, had not been able to escape from the solitude imposed by existence in hotels. Since her marriage she had never spoken to a woman in the way of intimacy, but once or twice she had approached intimacy with Chirac, whose wistful admiration for her always aroused into activity her desire to charm. Preceded by the menial, he came into the room hurriedly, apologetically, with an air of acute anxiety, and as he saw her lying on her back with flushed features, her hair disarranged, and only the grace of the silk ribbons of her matinee to mitigate the melancholy repulsiveness of her surroundings, that anxiety seemed to deepen. "'Dear madame,' he stammered, "'all my excuses.' He hastened to the bedside and kissed her hand, a little peak according to his custom. "'You are ill?' "'I have my migraine,' she said. "'You want Gerald?' "'Yes,' he said diffidently. "'He had promised. He has left me.' Sophia interrupted him in her weak and fatigued voice. She closed her eyes as she uttered the word. "'Left you?' He glanced around to be sure that the waiter had retired. "'Quitted me. Abandoned me. Last night.' "'Not possible!' he breathed. She nodded. She felt intimate with him. Like all secretive persons, she could be suddenly expansive at times. "'It is serious?' he questioned. "'All that is most serious,' she replied. "'And you ill! Ah, oh, the wretch! Ah, oh, the wretch! That, for example!' he waved his hat about. "'What is it you want, Chirac?' she demanded in a confidential tone. "'Eh, well!' said Chirac. You do not know where he has gone? No. What do you want? He was nervous. He fidgeted. She guessed that, though warm with sympathy for her plight, he was preoccupied by interests and apprehensions of his own. He did not refuse her request temporarily to leave the astonishing matter of her situation in order to discuss the matter of his visit. Eh, well— he came to me yesterday afternoon in the Rue Croissant to borrow some money. She understood, then, the object of Gerald's stroll on the previous afternoon. "'I hope you didn't lend him any,' she said. Eh, "'Well, it was like this. He said he ought to have received five thousand francs yesterday morning, but that he had had a telegram that it would not arrive until today, and he had need of five hundred francs at once.' "'I had not five hundred francs.' He smiled sadly, as if to insinuate that he did not handle such sums. "'But I borrowed it from the cash-box of the journal. It is necessary, absolutely, that I should return it this morning.' He spoke with increased seriousness. "'Your husband said he would take a cab and bring me the money immediately on the arrival of the post this morning, about nine o'clock. Pardon me for deranging you with such a—' He stopped. 
She could see that he really was grieved to derange her, but the circumstances pressed. "'At my paper,' he murmured, "'it is not so easy as that to... in fine... Gerald had genuinely been at his last franks. He had not lied when she thought he had lied. The nakedness of his character showed now. Instantly, upon the final and definite cessation of the lawful supply of money, he had set his wits to obtain money unlawfully. He had, in fact, simply stolen it from Chirac, with the ornamental addition of endangering Chirac's reputation and situation, as a sort of reward to Chirac for the kindness. And further, no sooner had he got hold of the money than it had intoxicated him, and he had yielded to the first fatuous temptation. He had no sense of responsibility, no scruple, and as for common prudence, had he not risked permanent disgrace and even prison for a paltry sum which he would certainly squander in two or three days? Yes, it was indubitable that he would stop at nothing, at nothing whatever. "'You did not know he was coming to me?' asked Chirac, pulling his short, silky brown beard. "'No,' Sapphire answered. Uh, "'But he said that you had charged him with your friendliness to me.' He nodded his head once or twice, sadly, but candidly accepting, in the quality of a Latin, the plain facts of human nature, reconciling himself to them at once. Sophia revolted at this crowning detail of the structure of Gerald's rascality. "'It is fortunate that I can pay you,' she said. "'But,' he tried to protest, "'I have quite enough money.' She did not say this to screen Gerald, but merely from amour propre. She would not let Chirac think that she was the wife of a man bereft of all honour. And so she clothed Gerald with the rag of having, at any rate, not left her in destitution as well as in sickness. Her assertion seemed a strange one, in view of the fact that he had abandoned her on the previous evening, that is to say, immediately after the borrowing from Chirac. But Chirac did not examine the statement. "'Perhaps he has the intention to send me the money. Perhaps, after all, he is now at the offices.' "'No,' said Sophia, "'he is gone. Will you go downstairs and wait for me? We will go together to Cook's office. It is English money I have.' "'Cook's?' he repeated. The word, now so potent, had then little significance. "'But you are ill. You cannot.' "'I feel better.' She did. Or rather she felt nothing except the power of her resolve to remove the painful anxiety from that wistful brow. The shame of the trick played on Chirac awakened new forces in her. She dressed in a physical torment, which, however, had no more reality than a nightmare— she searched in a place which even an inquisitive husband would not think of looking, and then, painfully, she descended the long stairs, holding to the rail which swam round and round her, carrying the whole staircase with it. After all, she thought, I can't be seriously ill, or I shouldn't have been able to get up and go out like this. I never guessed early this morning that I could do it. I can't possibly be as ill as I thought I was. And in the vestibule she encountered Chirac's face— lightening at the sight of her, which proved to him that his deliverance was really to be accomplished. Uh, "'Permit me. It's all right,' she smiled, tottering. "'Get a cab.' It suddenly occurred to her that she might as easily have given him the money in English notes. He could have changed them. But she had not thought. Her brain would not operate. She was dreaming and waking together. He helped her into the cab. Five. In the Bureau de Change there was a little knot of English people, with naive, romantic, and honest faces, quite different from the faces outside in the street, no corruption in those faces, but a sort of wondering and infantile sincerity, rather out of its element, and lost in a land too unsophisticated, seeming to belong to an earlier age. Sophia liked their tourist stare, and their plain and ugly clothes. She longed to be back in England, longed for a moment with violence, drowning in that desire. The English clerk behind his brass bars took her notes and carefully examined them, one by one. She watched him, not entirely convinced of his reality, and thought, vaguely, of the detestable morning when she had abstracted the notes from Gerald's pocket. She was filled with pity for the simple ignorance of fire of those days. 
the Sophia, who still had a few ridiculous illusions concerning Gerald's character. Often since she had been tempted to break into the money, but she had always withstood the temptation, saying to herself that an hour of more urgent need would come. It had come. She was proud of her firmness, of the force of will which had enabled her to reserve the fund intact. The clerk gave her a keen look, and then asked her how she would take the French money, and she saw the notes falling down one after another on the counter as the clerk separated them with a snapping sound of the paper. Chirac was beside her. "'Does that make the count?' she said, having pushed towards him five hundred-franc notes. "'I should not know how to thank you.' he said, accepting the notes. Truly! His joy was unmistakably eager. He had had a shock and a fright, and he now saw the danger past. He could return to the cashier of his newspaper, and fling down the money with a lordly and careless air, as if to say, when it is a question of these English, one can always be sure. But first he would escort her to the hotel. She declined. She did not know why, for he was her sole point of moral support in all France. He insisted. She yielded. So she turned her back with regret on that little English oasis in the Sahara of Paris, and staggered to the fiacre. And now that she had done what she had to do, she lost control of her body, and reclined flaccid and inert. Chirac was evidently alarmed. He did not speak, but glanced at her from time to time with eyes full of fear. The carriage appeared to her to be swimming amid waves over great depths. Then she was aware of a heavy weight against her shoulder. She had slipped down upon Chirac, unconscious. Chapter 5 Part 1 Fever 1 Then she was lying in bed in a small room, obscure because it was heavily curtained. The light came through the inner pair of curtains of écru lace, with a beautiful soft silvery quality. A man was standing by the side of the bed, not Chirac. And "'Now, madame,' he said to her, with kind firmness, and speaking with a charming exaggerated purity of the vowels, "'you have the mucus fever. I have had it myself. You will be forced to take baths very frequently. I must ask you to reconcile yourself to that, to be good.' She did not reply. It did not occur to her to reply. But she certainly thought that this doctor—he was probably a doctor—was overestimating her case. She felt better than she had felt for two days. Still, she did not desire to move, nor was she in the least anxious as to her surroundings. She lay quiet. A woman, in a rather coquettish déshabille, watched over her with expert skill. Later, Sophia seemed to be revisiting the sea on whose waves the cab had swum, but now she was under the sea, in a watery gulf terribly deep, and the sounds of the world came to her through the water, sudden and strange. Hands seized her, and forced her from the subaqueous grotto where she had hidden into new alarms, and she briefly perceived that there was a large bath by the side of the bed, and that she was being pushed into it. The water was icy cold. After that her outlook upon things was for a time clearer and more precise. She knew from fragments of talk which she heard that she was put into the cold bath by her bed every three hours, night and day, and that she remained in it for ten minutes. Always, before the bath, she had to drink a glass of wine, and sometimes another glass while she was in the bath. Beyond this wine, and occasionally a cup of soup, she took nothing, had no wish to take anything. She grew perfectly accustomed to these extraordinary habits of life, to this merging of night and day into one monotonous and endless repetition of the same rite, amid the same circumstances on exactly the same spot. Then followed a period during which she objected to being constantly wakened up for this annoying immersion, and she fought against it even in her dreams. Long days seemed to pass, when she could not be sure whether she had been put into the bath or not, when all external phenomena were disconcertingly interwoven, with matters which she knew to be merely fanciful. And then she was overwhelmed by the hopeless gravity of her state. She felt that her state was desperate. She felt that she was dying. 
Her unhappiness was extreme, not because she was dying, but because the veils of sense were so puzzling, so exasperating, and because her exhausted body was so vitiated in every fibre by disease. She was perfectly aware that she was going to die. She cried aloud for a pair of scissors. She wanted to cut off her hair and send part of it to Constance and part of it to her mother in separate packages. She insisted upon separate packages. Nobody would give her a pair of scissors. She implored meekly, haughtily, furiously, but nobody would satisfy her. It seemed to her shocking that all her hair should go with her into her coffin, while Constance and her mother had nothing by which to remember her, no tangible souvenir of her beauty. Then she fought for the scissors. She clutched at someone, always through those baffling veils, who was putting her into the bath by the bedside, and fought frantically. It appeared to her that this someone was the rather stout woman who had supped at Sylvain's with the quarrelsome Englishman four years ago. She could not rid herself of this singular conceit, though she knew it to be absurd. A long time afterwards, it seemed like a century, she did actually and unmistakably see the woman sitting by her bed, and the woman was crying. "'Why are you crying?' Sophia asked, wonderingly. And the other, younger woman, who was standing at the foot of the bed, replied, "'You do well to ask. It is you who have hurt her, in your delirium, when you so madly demanded the scissors.' The stout woman smiled, with the tears on her cheeks. But Sophia wept from remorse. The stout woman looked old, worn, and untidy. The other one was much younger. Sophia did not trouble to inquire from them who they were. That little conversation formed a brief interlude in the delirium, which overtook her again and distorted everything. She forgot, however, that she was destined to die. One day her brain cleared. She could be sure that she had gone to sleep in the morning and not wakened till the evening. Hence she had not been put into the bath. "'Have I had my baths?' she questioned. It was the doctor who faced her. "'No,' he said. "'The baths are finished.' She knew from his face that she was out of danger. Moreover, she was conscious of a new feeling in her body, as though the fount of physical energy within her, long interrupted, had recommenced to flow, but very slowly, a trickling. It was a rebirth. She was not glad, but her body itself was glad. Her body had an existence of its own. She was now often left by herself in the bedroom. To the right of the foot of the bed was a piano in walnut, and to the left a chimney-piece with a large mirror. She wanted to look at herself in the mirror, but it was a very long way off. She tried to sit up, and could not. She hoped that one day she would be able to get as far as the mirror. She said not a word about this to either of the two women. Often they would sit in the bedroom and talk without ceasing. Sophia learnt that the stout woman was named Foucault, and the other Laurence. Sometimes Laurence would address Madame Foucault as Aimé, but usually she was more formal. Madame Foucault always called the other Laurence. Sophia's curiosity stirred and awoke, but she could not obtain any very exact information as to where she was, except that the house was in the Rue Breda, off the Rue Notre-Dame de Lorette. She recollected vaguely that the reputation of the street was sinister. It appeared that on the day when she had gone out with Chirac, the upper part of the Rue Notre-Dame de Lorette was closed for repairs, this she remembered, and that the cabman had turned up the Rue Breda in order to make a detour, and that it was just opposite to the house of Madame Foucault that she had lost consciousness. Madame Foucault happened to be getting into a cab at the moment, but she had told Chirac nevertheless to carry Sophia into the house, and a policeman had helped. Then, when the doctor came, it was discovered that she could not be moved, save to a hospital, and both Madame Foucault and Laurence were determined that no friend of Chirac should be committed to the horrors of a Paris hospital. Madame Foucault had suffered in one as a patient, and Laurence had been a nurse in another. Chirac was now away. The women talked loosely of a war. "'How kind you have been,' murmured Sophia with humid eyes. But they silenced her with gestures. She was not to talk. 
They seemed to have nothing further to tell her. They said Chirac would be returning, perhaps soon, and that she could talk to him. Evidently they both held Chirac in affection. They said often that he was a charming boy. Bit by bit, Sophia comprehended the length and the seriousness of her illness, and the immense devotion of the two women, and the terrific disturbance of their lives, and her own debility. She saw that the women were strongly attached to her, and she could not understand why, as she had never done anything for them, whereas they had done everything for her. She had not learnt that benefits rendered, not benefits received, are the cause of such attachments. All the time she was plotting, and gathering her strength to disobey orders, and get as far as the mirror. Her preliminary studies and her preparations were as elaborate as those of a prisoner arranging to escape from a fortress. The first attempt was a failure. The second succeeded. Though she could not stand without support, she managed, by clinging to the bed, to reach a chair, and to push the chair in front of her until it approached the mirror. The enterprise was exciting and terrific. Then she saw a face in the glass, white, incredibly emaciated, with great wild staring eyes, and the shoulders were bent as though with age. It was a painful, almost a horrible sight. It frightened her, so that in her alarm she recoiled from it. Not attending sufficiently to the chair, she sank to the ground. She could not pick herself up and she was caught there, miserably, by her angered jailers. The vision of her face taught her more efficiently than anything else the gravity of her adventure. As the women lifted her inert, repentant mass into bed, she reflected, "'How queer my life is!' It seemed to her that she ought to have been trimming hats in the showroom, instead of being in that curtained, mysterious Parisian interior. Two. One day, Madame Foucault knocked at the door of Sophia's little room. The ceremony of knocking was one of the indications that Sophia, convalescent, had been reinstated in her rights as an individual, and cried, "'Madame, one is going to leave you all alone for some time.' "'Come in,' said Sophia, who was sitting up in an armchair and reading. Madame Foucault opened the door. "'One is going to leave you all alone for some time.' she repeated in a low, confidential voice, sharply contrasting with her shriek behind the door. Sophia nodded and smiled, and Madame Foucault also nodded and smiled, but Madame Foucault's face quickly resumed its anxious expression. "'The servant's brother marries himself to-day, and she implored me to accord her two days. What would you? Madame Laurence is out, and I must go out. It is four o'clock.' I shall re-enter at six o'clock striking. Therefore, perfectly, Sophia concurred. She looked curiously at Madame Foucault, who was carefully made up and arranged for the street, in a dress of yellow tussaw with blue ornaments, bright lemon-coloured gloves, a little blue bonnet, and a little white parasol, not wider when open than her shoulders. Cheeks, lips, and eyes were heavily charged with rouge, powder, or black and that too abundant waist had been most cunningly confined in a belt that descended beneath, instead of rising above the lower masses of the vast torso. The general effect was worthy of the effort that must have gone to it. Madame Foucault was not rejuvenated by her toilette, but it almost procured her pardon for the crime of being over forty, fat, creased, and worn out. It was one of those defeats that are a triumph. "'You are very chic,' said Sophia, uttering her admiration. Ah, said Madame Foucault, shrugging the shoulders of disillusion, chic, what does that do? But she was pleased. The front door banged. Sophia, by herself for the first time in the flat into which she had been carried unconscious, and which she had never since left, had the disturbing sensation of being surrounded by mysterious rooms and mysterious things. She tried to continue reading, but the sentences conveyed nothing to her. She rose, she could walk now a little, and looked out of the window, through the interstices of the pattern of the lace curtains. The window gave on the courtyard, which was about sixteen feet below her. A low wall divided the courtyard from that of the next house, and the windows of the two houses, only to be distinguished by the different tints of their yellow paint, 
rose tier above tier in level floors, continuing beyond Sophia's field of vision. She pressed her face against the glass, and remembered the St. Luke's Square of her childhood, and just as there from the showroom window she could not even, by pressing her face against the glass, see the pavement, so here she could not see the roof. The courtyard was like the bottom of a well. There was no end to the windows. Six stories she could count, and the sills of a seventh were the limit of her view. Every window was heavily curtained, like her own. Some of the upper ones had green sun-blinds. Scarcely any sound. Mysteries brooded without as well as within the flat of Madame Foucault. Sophia saw a bodiless hand twitch at a curtain and vanish. She noticed a green bird in a tiny cage on a sill in the next house. A woman, whom she took to be the concierge, appeared in the courtyard, deposited a small plant in the track of a ray of sunshine that lighted a corner for a couple of hours in the afternoon, and disappeared again. Then she heard a piano somewhere. That was all. The feeling that secret and strange lives were being lived behind those baffling windows, that humanity was everywhere intimately pulsing around her, oppressed her spirit, yet not quite unpleasantly. The environment softened her glance upon the spectacle of existence, insomuch that sadness became a voluptuous pleasure, and the environment threw her back on herself, into a sensuous contemplation of the fundamental fact of Sophia Scales, formerly Sophia Baines. She turned to the room, with the marks of the bath on the floor by the bed, and the draped piano that was never opened, and her two trunks filling up the corner opposite the door. She had the idea of thoroughly examining those trunks, which Chirac or somebody else must have fetched from the hotel. At the top of one of them was her purse, tied up with old ribbon, and ostentatiously sealed. How comical these French people were when they deemed it necessary to be serious! She emptied both trunks, scrutinizing minutely all her goods, and thinking of the varied occasions upon which she had obtained them. Then she carefully restored them, her mind full of souvenirs newly awakened. She sighed as she straightened her back. A clock struck in another room. It seemed to invite her towards discoveries. She had been in no other room of the flat. She knew nothing of the rest of the flat save by sound, for neither of the other women had ever described it, nor had it occurred to them that Sophia might care to leave her room, though she could not leave the house. She opened her door, and glanced along the dim corridor with which she was familiar. She knew that the kitchen lay next to her little room, and that next to the kitchen came the front door. On the opposite side of the corridor were four double doors. She crossed to the pair of doors facing her own little door, and quietly turned the handle. But the doors were locked, the same with the next pair. The third pair yielded, and she was in a large bedroom, with three windows on the street. She saw that the second pair of doors, which she had failed to unfasten, also opened into this room. Between the two pairs of doors was a wide bed. In front of the central window was a large dressing-table. To the left of the bed, half hiding the locked doors, was a large screen. On the marble mantelpiece, reflected in a huge mirror that ascended to the ornate cornice, was a gilt and basalt clock, with pendants to match. On the opposite side of the room from this was a long, wide couch. The floor was of polished oak, with a skin on either side of the bed. At the foot of the bed was a small writing-table, with a penny bottle of ink on it. A few coloured prints and engravings, representing, for example, Louis-Philippe and his family, and people perishing on a raft, broke the tedium of the walls. The first impression on Sophia's eye was one of sombre splendour. Everything had the air of being richly ornamented, draped, looped, carved, twisted, brocaded into gorgeousness. The dark, crimson bed-hangings fell from massive rosettes in majestic folds. The counterpane was covered with lace. The window-curtains had amplitude beyond the necessary, and they were suspended from behind fringed and pleated valances. The green sofa and its sateen cushions were stiff with applied embroidery. The chandelier, hanging from the middle of the ceiling, modelled to represent cupids holding festoons, was a glittering confusion of gilt and lustres. The lustres tinkled when Sophia stood on a certain part of the floor. The cane-seated chairs were completely gilded. There was an effect of spaciousness. 
and the situation of the bed, between the two double doors, with the three windows in front, and the other pairs of doors communicating with other rooms on either hand, produced in addition an admirable symmetry. But Sophia, with the sharp gaze of a woman brought up in the traditions of a modesty so proud that it scorns ostentation, quickly tested and condemned the details of this chamber that imitated every luxury. Nothing in it, she found, was good, and in St. Luke's Square, goodness meant honest workmanship, permanence, the absence of pretense. All the stuffs were cheap and showy and shabby. All the furniture was cracked, warped, or broken. The clock showed five minutes past twelve at five o'clock, and further dust was everywhere, except in those places where even the most perfunctory cleaning could not have left it. In the obscurer pleatings of draperies it lay thick. Sophia's lip curled, and instinctively she lifted her peignoir. One of her mother's phrases came into her head, a lick and a promise, and then another, if you want to leave dirt, leave it where everybody can see it, not in the corners. She peeped behind the screen, and all the horrible welter of a cabinet de toilette met her gaze, a repulsive medley of foul waters, stained vessels and cloths, brushes, sponges, powders and pastes. Clothes were hung up in disorder on rough nails. Among them she recognised a dressing-gown of Madame Foucault's, and, behind affairs of later date, the dazzling scarlet cloak in which she had first seen Madame Foucault, dilapidated now. So this was Madame Foucault's room. This was the bower from which that elegance emerged, the filth from which had sprung the mature blossom. She passed from that room direct to another, of which the shutters were closed, leaving it in twilight. This room, too, was a bedroom, rather smaller than the middle one, and having only one window, but furnished with the same dubious opulence. Dust covered it everywhere, and small footmarks were visible in the dust on the floor. At the back was a small door, papered to match the wall, and within this door was a cabinet de toilette, with no light and no air, Neither in the room nor in the closet was there any sign of individual habitation. She traversed the main bedroom again, and found another bedroom to balance the second one, but open to the full light of day, and in a state of extreme disorder. The double-pillowed bed had not even been made. Clothes and towels draped all the furniture. Shoes were about the floor, and on a piece of string, tied across the windows, hung a single white stocking, wet. At the back was a cabinet de toilette as dark as the other one, a vile, malodorous mess of appliances, whose familiar forms loomed vague and extraordinarily sinister in the dense obscurity. Sophia turned away with the righteous disgust of one whose preparations for the gaze of the world are as candid and simple as those of a child. Concealed dirt shocked her as much as it would have shocked her mother, and as for the trickeries of the toilet-table, she condemned them as harshly as a young saint who has never been tempted condemns moral weakness. She thought of the strange, flaccid daily life of those two women, whose hours seemed to slip unprofitably away without any result of achievement. She had actually witnessed nothing, but since the beginning of her convalescence her ears had heard, and she could piece the evidences together. There was never any sound in the flat, outside the kitchen, until noon. Then vague noises and smells would commence. And about one o'clock, Madame Foucault, disarrayed, would come to inquire if the servant had attended to the needs of the invalid. Then the odours of cookery would accentuate themselves. Bells rang. Fragments of conversations escaped through doors ajar. Occasionally a man's voice or a heavy step. Then the fragrance of coffee— sometimes the sound of a kiss, the banging of the front door, the noise of brushing or of the shaking of a carpet, a little scream as at some trifling domestic contretemps. Laurence, still in a dressing-gown, would lounge into Sophia's room, dirty, haggard, but polite with a curious stiff ceremony, and would drink her coffee there. This wandering in peignoirs would continue till three o'clock, and then Laurence might say, as if nerving herself to an unusual and immense effort, "'I must be dressed by five o'clock. I have not a moment.' Often Madame Foucault did not dress at all. On such days she would go to bed immediately after dinner, 
with the remark that she didn't know what was the matter with her, but she was exhausted, and then the servant would retire to her seventh floor, and there would be silence until, now and then, faint creepings were heard at midnight or after. Once or twice, through the chinks of her door, Sophia had seen a light at two o'clock in the morning, just before the dawn. Yet these were the women who had saved her life, who between them had put her into a cold bath every three hours, night and day, for weeks. Surely it was impossible after that to despise them for shiftlessness and talkative idling in penoirs. Impossible to despise them for anything whatever. But Sophia, conscious of her inheritance of strong and resolute character, did despise them as poor things. The one point on which she envied them was their formal manners to her, which seemed to become more dignified and graciously distant as her health improved. It was always Madame, Madame, to her, with an intonation of increasing deference. They might have been apologising to her for themselves. She prowled into all the corners of the flat, but she discovered no more rooms, nothing but a large cupboard crammed with Madame Foucault's dresses. Then she went back to the large bedroom, and enjoyed the busy movement and rattle of the sloping street, and had long, vague yearnings for strength and for freedom in wide, sane places. She decided that on the morrow she would dress herself properly, and never again wear a peignoir. The peignoir and all that it represented disgusted her, and while looking at the street she ceased to see it, and saw Cook's office and Chirac helping her into the carriage. Where was he? Why had he brought her to this impossible abode? What did he mean by such conduct? But could he have acted otherwise? He had done the one thing that he could do. Chance! Chance! And why an impossible abode? Was one place more impossible than another? All this came of running away from home with Gerald. It was remarkable that she seldom thought of Gerald. He had vanished from her life as he had come into it, madly preposterously. She wondered what the next stage in her career would be. She certainly could not forecast it. Perhaps Gerald was starving, or in prison. Bah! That exclamation expressed her appalling disdain of Gerald, and of the Sophia who had once deemed him the paragon of men. Bah! A carriage, stopping in front of the house, awakened her from her meditation. Madame Foucault, and a man very much younger than Madame Foucault, got out of it. Sophia fled. After all, this prying into other people's rooms was quite inexcusable. She dropped onto her own bed, and picked up a book in case Madame Foucault should come in. 3. In the evening, just after night had fallen, Sophia on the bed heard the sound of raised and acrimonious voices in Madame Foucault's room. Nothing except dinner had happened since the arrival of Madame Foucault and the young man. These two had evidently dined informally in the bedroom, on a dish or so prepared by Madame Foucault, who had herself served Sophia with her invalid's repast. The odours of cookery still hung in the air. The noise of virulent discussion increased and continued, and then Sophia could hear sobbing, broken by short and fierce phrases from the man. Then the door of the bedroom opened brusquely. jean et soupe exclaimed the man, in tones of angry disgust. "'Laissez-moi, je te prie!' And then a soft, muffled sound, as of a struggle, a quick step, and the very violent banging of the front door. After that there was a noticeable silence, save for the regular sobbing. Sophia wondered when it would cease that monotonous sobbing. "'What is the matter?' she called out from her bed. The sobbing grew louder, like the sobbing of a child who has detected an awakening of sympathy, and instinctively begins to practice upon it. In the end, Sophia arose and put on the peignoir, which she had almost determined never to wear again. The broad corridor was lighted by a small, smelling oil-lamp, with a crimson globe. That soft, transforming radiance seemed to paint the whole corridor with voluptuous luxury so much so that it was impossible to believe that the smell came from the lamp. Under the lamp lay Madame Foucault on the floor, a shapeless mass of lace, frilled linen and corset. Her light brown hair was loose and spread about the floor. At the first glance the creature abandoned to grief made a romantic and striking picture, 
and Sophia thought for an instant that she had at length encountered life on a plane that would correspond to her dreams of romance, and she was impressed with a feeling somewhat akin to that of a middling commoner when confronted with a viscount. There was in the distance something imposing and sensational about that prone, trembling figure. The tragic works of love were therein apparently manifest, in a sort of dignified beauty. But when Sophia bent over Madame Foucault, and touched her flabbiness, this illusion at once vanished, and instead of being dramatically pathetic, the woman was ridiculous. Her face, especially as damaged by tears, could not support the ordeal of inspection. It was horrible not a picture, but a palette, or like the coloured design of a pavement artist after a heavy shower. Her great, relaxed eyelids alone would have rendered any face absurd, and there were monstrous details far worse than the eyelids. Then she was amazingly fat. Her flesh seemed to be escaping at all ends from a corset strained to the utmost limit, and above her boots she was still wearing dainty, high-heeled, tightly-laced boots, the calves bulged suddenly out. As a woman of between forty and fifty, the obese sepulchre of a dead, vulgar beauty, she had no right to passions and tears and homage, or even the means of life. She had no right to expose herself picturesquely beneath a crimson glow in all the panoply of ribboned garters and lacy seductiveness. It was silly, it was disgraceful. She ought to have known that only youth and slimness have the right to appeal to the feelings by indecent abandonments. Such were the thoughts that mingled with the sympathy of the beautiful and slim Sophia, as she bent down to Madame Foucault. She was sorry for her landlady, but at the same time she despised her, and resented her woe. "'What is the matter?' she asked quietly. "'He has chucked me,' stammered Madame Foucault. "'And he's the last. I have no one now.' She rolled over in the most grotesque manner, kicking up her legs, with a fresh outburst of sobs. Sophia felt quite ashamed for her. "'Come and lie down. Come now,' she said, with a touch of sharpness. "'You mustn't lie there like that.' Madame Foucault's behaviour was really too outrageous. Sophia helped her, morally rather than physically, to rise and then persuaded her into the large bedroom. Madame Foucault fell on the bed, of which the counterpane had been thrown over the foot. Sophia covered the lower part of her heaving body with the counterpane. "'Now, calm yourself, please.' This room, too, was lit in crimson by a small lamp that stood on the night-table, and though the shade of the lamp was cracked, the general effect of the great chamber was incontestably romantic. Only the pillows of the wide bed and a small semicircle of floor were illuminated. All the rest lay in shadow. Madame Foucault's head had dropped between the pillows. A tray containing dirty plates and glasses and a wine-bottle was speciously picturesque on the writing-table. Despite her genuine gratitude to Madame Foucault for astounding care during her illness, Sophia did not like her landlady, and the present scene made her coldly wrathful. She saw the probability of having another's troubles piled on top of her own. She did not, in her mind, actively object, because she felt that she could not be more hopelessly miserable than she was, but she passively resented the imposition. Her reason told her that she ought to sympathise with this ageing, ugly, disagreeable, undignified woman, but her heart was reluctant. Her heart did not want to know anything at all about Madame Foucault, nor to enter into any way into her private life. "'I have not a single friend now,' stammered Madame Foucault. "'Oh, if you have,' said Sophia cheerfully, "'you have Madame Laurence.' "'Laurence, that is not a friend. You know what I mean.' "'And me? I am your friend,' said Sophia, in obedience to her conscience. "'You are very kind,' replied Madame Foucault from the pillow. "'But you know what I mean?' The fact was that Sophia did know what she meant. The terms of their intercourse had been suddenly changed. There was no pretentious ceremony now, but the sincerity that disaster brings. The vast structure of make-believe, which between them they had gradually built, had crumbled to nothing. "'I never treated badly any man in my life,' whimpered Madame Foucault. "'I have always been a good girl.' There is not a man who can say I have not been a good girl. 
Never was I a girl like the rest, and every one has said so. Ah, when I tell you that once I had a hotel in the Avenue de la Reine Hortense, four horses. I have sold a horse to Madame Moussard. You know Madame Moussard. But one cannot make economies. Impossible to make economies. Ah, in fifty-six I was spending a hundred thousand francs a year. That cannot last. Always I have said to myself, that cannot last. Always I had the intention. But what would you? I installed myself here, and borrowed money to pay for the furniture. There did not remain to me one jewel. The men are poltroons all. I could let three bedrooms for three hundred and fifty francs a month, and with serving meals and so on, I, I could live. Then that, so far interrupted, pointing to her own bedroom across the corridor, is your room? Yes, said Madame Foucault. I put you in it because at the moment all these were let. They are so no longer only one, Laurence, and she does not pay me always. What would you, tenants? That does not find itself at the present hour. I have nothing, and I owe. And he quits me. He chooses this moment to quit me. And why? For nothing, for nothing. That is not for his money that I regret it. No, oh, no. You know at his age he is twenty-five, and with a woman like me one is not generous. No, I loved him. And then a man is a moral support always. I loved him. It is at my age, mine, that one knows how to love. Beauty goes always, but not the temperament. Ah, oh, that. No, I loved him, I love him. So far as face tingled with a sudden emotion called by the repetition of these last three words, whose spell no usage can mar. But she said nothing. Do you know what I shall become? There is nothing but that for me, and I know of such who are there already. A charwoman. Yes, a charwoman. More soon or more late. Well, that is life. What would you? One exists always. Then, in a different tone, I beg your pardon, madame, for talking like this. I ought to have shame. And Sophia felt that in listening she also ought to be ashamed. But she was not ashamed. Everything seemed very natural and even ordinary. And, moreover, Sophia was full of the sense of her superiority over the woman on the bed. Four years ago, in the restaurant Sylvain, the ingenuous and ignorant Sophia had shyly sat in awe of the resplendent courtesan, with her haughty stare, her large, easy gestures, and her imperturbable contempt for the man who was paying. And now Sophia knew that she, Sophia, knew all that was to be known about human nature. She had not merely youth, beauty, and virtue, but knowledge, knowledge enough to reconcile her to her own misery. She had a vigorous, clear mind and a clean conscience. She could look any one in the face, and judge every one, too, as a woman of the world. Whereas this obscene wreck on the bed had nothing whatever left. She had not merely lost her effulgent beauty. She had become repulsive. She could never have had any common sense nor any force of character. Her haughtiness in the day of glory was simply fatuous, based on stupidity. She had passed the years in idleness, trailing about all day in stuffy rooms and emerging at night to impress nincompoops, continually meaning to do things which she never did, continually surprised at the lateness of the hour, continually occupied with the most foolish trifles. And here she was at over forty, writhing about on the bare floor, because a boy of twenty-five, who must be a worthless idiot, had abandoned her after a scene of ridiculous shoutings and stampings. She was dependent on the caprices of a young scamp, the last donkey to turn from her with loathing. Sophia thought, "'Goodness! If I had been in her place, I shouldn't have been like that. I should have been rich. I should have saved like a miser. I wouldn't have been dependent on anybody at that age. If I couldn't have made a better courtesan than this pitiable woman, I would have drowned myself.' In the harsh vanity of her conscious capableness and young strength, she thought thus, half forgetting her own follies, and half excusing them on the ground of inexperience. Sophia wanted to go round the flat, and destroy every crimson lampshade in it. She wanted to shake Madame Foucault into self-respect and sagacity. 
Moral reprehension, though present in her mind, was only faint. Certainly she felt the immense gulf between the honest woman and the wanton, but she did not feel it as she would have expected to feel it. What a fool you have been, she thought, not what a sinner. With her precocious cynicism, which was somewhat unsuited to the lovely northern youthfulness of that face, she said to herself that the whole situation and their relative attitudes would have been different if only Madame Foucault had had the wit to amass a fortune, as, according to Gerald, some of her rivals had succeeded in doing. And all the time she was thinking in another part of her mind, I ought not to be here. It's no use arguing I ought not to be here. Chirac did the only thing for me there was to do, but I must go now. Madame Foucault continued to recite her woes, chiefly financial, in a weak voice, damp with tears. She also continued to apologise for mentioning herself. She had finished sobbing, and lay looking at the wall away from Sophia, who stood irresolute near the bed, ashamed for her companion's weakness and incapacity. "'You must not forget,' said Sophia, irritated by the unrelieved darkness of the picture drawn by Madame Foucault, that at least I owe you a considerable sum, and that I am only waiting for you to tell me how much it is. I have asked you twice already, I think. "'Oh, you are still suffering,' said Madame Foucault. "'I am quite well enough to pay my debts,' said Sophia. "'I do not like to accept money from you,' said Madame Foucault. "'But why not?' "'You will have the doctor to pay.' "'Please do not talk in that way,' said Sophia. "'I have money, and I can pay for everything, and I shall pay for everything.' She was annoyed, because she was sure that Madame Foucault was only making a pretense of delicacy, and that in any case her delicacy was preposterous. Sophia had remarked this on the two previous occasions when she had mentioned the subject of bills. Madame Foucault would not treat her as an ordinary lodger, now that the illness was past. She wanted, as it were, to complete brilliantly what she had begun, and to live in Sophia's memory as a unique figure of lavish philanthropy. This was a sentiment, a luxury, that she desired to offer herself, the thought that she had played providence to a respectable married lady in distress. She frequently hinted at Sophia's misfortunes and helplessness, but she could not afford the luxury. She gazed at it as a poor woman gazes at costly stuffs through the glass of a shop window. The truth was, she wanted the luxury for nothing. For a double reason, Sophia was exasperated, by Madame Foucault's absurd desire, and by a natural objection to the role of a subject for philanthropy. She would not admit that Madame Foucault's devotion as a nurse entitled her to the satisfaction of being a philanthropist when there was no necessity for philanthropy. "'How long have I been here?' asked the fire. "'I don't know,' murmured Madame Foucault. Eight weeks, or is it nine? "'Suppose we say nine, said Sophia. "'Very well,' agreed Madame Foucault, apparently reluctant. "'Now, how much must I pay you per week? "'I don't want anything. I don't want anything. You are a friend of Chirac's. You—' "'Not at all,' Sophia interrupted, tapping her foot and biting her lip. "'Naturally I must pay.' Madame Foucault wept quietly. "'Shall I pay you seventy-five francs a week?' said Sophia, anxious to end the matter. "'It is too much,' Madame Foucault protested insincerely. "'What, for all you have done for me?' "'I speak not of that,' Madame Foucault modestly replied. If the devotion was not to be paid for, then seventy-five francs a week was assuredly too much, as during more than half the time Sophia had had almost no food— Madame Foucault was therefore within the truth when she again protested at the sight of the bank-notes, which Sophia brought from her trunk. "'I am sure it is too much.' "'Not at all,' Sophia repeated. Nine weeks at seventy-five. That makes six hundred and seventy-five. Here are seven hundreds.' "'I have no change,' said Madame Foucault. "'I have nothing.' "'That will pay for the hire of the bath,' said Sophia. She laid the notes on the pillow. Madame Foucault looked at them gluttonously, as any other person would have done in her place. She did not touch them. After an instant she burst into wild tears. "'But why do you cry?' Sophia asked, softened. "'I don't know,' spluttered Madame Foucault. "'You are so beautiful. I am so content that we saved you.' 
Her great wet eyes rested on Sophia. It was sentimentality. Sophia ruthlessly set it down as sentimentality. But she was touched. She was suddenly moved. Those women, such as they were in their foolishness, probably had saved her life, and she a stranger. Flaccid as they were, they had been capable of resolute perseverance there. It was possible to say that chance had thrown them upon an enterprise which they could not have abandoned till they or death had won. It was possible to say that they hoped vaguely to derive advantage from their labours, but even then, judged by an ordinary standard, those women had been angels of mercy, and Sophia was despising them, cruelly taking their motives to pieces, accusing them of incapacity when she herself stood a supreme proof of their capacity, in, at any rate, one direction. In a rush of emotion she saw her hardness and her injustice. She bent down. "'Never can I forget how kind you have been to me. It is incredible, incredible!' She spoke softly, in tones loaded with genuine feeling. It was all she said. She could not embroider on the theme. She had no talent for thanksgiving. Madame Foucault made the beginning of a gesture, as if she meant to kiss Sophia with those thick, marred lips, but refrained. Her head sank back, and then she had a recurrence of the fit of nervous sobbing. Immediately afterwards there was the sound of a latch-key in the front door of the flat. The bedroom door was open. Still sobbing very violently, she cocked her ear, and pushed the banknotes under the pillow. Madame Laurence, as she was called, Sophia had never heard her surname, came straight into the bedroom, and beheld the scene with astonishment in her dark, twinkling eyes. She was usually dressed in black, because people said that black suited her, and because black was never out of fashion. Black was an expression of her idiosyncrasy. She showed a certain elegance, and by comparison with the extreme disorder of Madame Foucault, at the déshabille of Sophia, her appearance, all fresh from a modish restaurant, was brilliant. It gave her an advantage over the other two, that moral advantage which ceremonial raiment always gives. "'What is it that passes?' she demanded. "'He has chucked me, Laurence!' exclaimed Madame Foucault, in a sort of hysteric scream, which seemed to force its way through her sobs. From the extraordinary freshness of Madame Foucault's woe, it might have been supposed that her young man had only that instant strode out. Laurence and Sophia exchanged a swift glance, and Laurence, of course, perceived that Sophia's relations with her landlady and nurse were now of a different, a more candid order. She indicated her perception of the change by a single slight movement of the eyebrows. "'But listen, Aimée,' she said authoritatively, "'you must not let yourself go like that. He will return.' "'Never!' cried Madame Foucault. "'It is finished, and he is the last.' Laurence, ignoring Madame Foucault, approached Sophia. "'You have an air very fatigued,' she said, caressing Sophia's shoulder with her gloved hand. "'You are pale like everything. All this is not for you. It is not reasonable to remain here.' you still suffering at this hour, truly not reasonable. Her hands persuaded Sophia towards the corridor, and in fact Sophia did then notice her own exhaustion. She departed from the room with the ready obedience of physical weakness, and shut her door. After about half an hour, during which she heard confused noises and murmurings, her door half opened. "'May I enter, since you are not asleep?' It was Laurence's voice. Twice now she had addressed Sophia without adding the formal madame. "'Enter, I beg you,' Sophia called from the bed. "'I am reading.' Laurence came in. Sophia was both glad and sorry to see her. She was eager to hear gossip, which, however, she felt she ought to despise. Moreover, she knew that if they talked that night they would talk as friends, and that Laurence would ever after treat her with the familiarity of a friend. This she dreaded. Still, she knew that she would yield, at any rate, to the temptation to listen to gossip. "'I have put her to bed,' said Laurence, in a whisper, as she cautiously closed the door. "'The poor woman! Oh, what a charming bracelet! It is a true pearl, naturally!' Her roving eye had immediately, with an infallible instinct, caught sight of a bracelet, which, in taking stock of her possessions, Sophia had accidentally left on the piano. She picked it up, and then put it down again. 
"'Yes,' said Sophia. She was about to add, "'It's nearly all the jewellery I possess,' but she stopped. Laurence moved towards Sophia's bed, and stood over it as she had often done in her quality as nurse. She had taken off her gloves, and she made a piquant pretty show with her thirty years, and her agreeable, slightly roguish face, in which were mingled the knowingness of a street-boy, and the confidence of a woman who has ceased to be surprised at the influence of her snub nose on a highly intelligent man. "'Did she tell you what they had quarrelled about?' Laurence inquired abruptly, and not only the phrasing of the question, but the assured tone in which it was uttered, showed that Laurence meant to be the familiar of Sophia. "'Not a word,' said Sophia. In this brief question and reply, all was crudely implied that had previously been supposed not to exist. The relations between the two women were altered irretrievably in a moment. "'It must have been her fault,' said Laurence. "'With men she is insupportable. I have never understood how that poor woman has made her way. With women she is charming, but she seems to be incapable of not treating men like dogs. Some men adore that, but they are few, is it not?' Sophia smiled. I have told her, how many times have I told her, but it is useless. It is stronger than she is, and if she finishes on straw, one will be able to say that it was because of that. But truly she ought not to have asked him here. Truly that was too much, if he knew. Why not? asked Sophia awkwardly. The answer startled her. Because her room has not been disinfected. But I thought all the flat had been disinfected. "'All except her room. "'But why not her room?' "'Laurent shrugged her shoulders. "'She did not want to disturb her things. "'It is that, I know. I, I... "'She is like that. Uh, "'She takes an idea, and then uh, there you are. "'She told me every room had been disinfected. "'She told the same to the police and the doctor. "'Then all the disinfection is useless.' "'Perfectly. But she is like that. This flat might be very remunerative, but with her, never. She has not even paid for the furniture, after two years.' "'But what will become of her?' Sophia asked. "'Ah, that!' Another shrug of the shoulders. "'All that I know is that it will be necessary for me to leave here. The last time I brought Monsieur Serf here, she was excessively rude to him. She has doubtless told you about Monsieur Serf.' Uh, no. Who is Monsieur Cerf? Ah, she has not told you. That astonishes me. Monsieur Cerf, that is my friend, uh, you know. Oh, murmured Sophia. Yes, Laurence proceeded, impelled by a desire to impress Sophia and to gossip at large. That is my friend. I knew him at the hospital. It was to please him that I left the hospital. After that we quarrelled for two years, but at the end he gave me right. I did not budge. Two years. It is long. And I had left the hospital. I could have gone back, but I would not. That is not a life, to be nurse in a Paris hospital. No, I drew myself out as well as I could. He is the most charming boy you can imagine, and rich now, that is to say, relatively. He has a cousin infinitely more rich than he. I dined with them both to-night at the Maison Dorée. For a luxurious boy, he is a luxurious boy, the cousin, I mean. It appears that he has made a fortune in Canada. Truly, said Sophia, with politeness. Laurence's hand was playing on the edge of the bed, and Sophia observed for the first time that it bore a wedding ring. You remark my ring? Laurence laughed. That is he, the cousin. What, he said, you do not wear an alliance? An alliance is more proper. We are going to arrange that after dinner. I said that all the jeweller shops would be closed. Oh, that is all the same to me, he said. We will open one. And, in fact, it passed like that. He succeeded. Is it not beautiful? She held forth her hand. Yes, said Sophia, it is very beautiful. Yours also is beautiful, said Laurence, with an extremely puzzling intonation. "'It is just the ordinary English wedding-ring,' said Sophia. In spite of herself she blushed. 
now i have married you it is i the, the cure said he the cousin when he put the ring on my finger oh he is excessively amusing he pleases me much and he is all alone he asked me whether i knew among my friends a sympathetic pretty girl to make four with us three for a picnic i said i was not sure but i thought not whom do i know nobody i am not a woman like the rest i am always discreet i do not like casual relations but he is very well the cousin brown eyes it is an idea will you come one day he speaks english he loves the english he is all that is most correct the perfect gentleman he would arrange a dazzling fate i am sure he would be enchanted to make your acquaintance enchanted as for my charles happily he is completely mad about me otherwise uh, i should have fear she smiled and in her smile was a genuine respect for sophia's face i fear i cannot come said sophia she honestly endeavoured to keep out of her reply any accent of moral superiority but she did not quite succeed she was not at all horrified by laurence's suggestion she meant simply to refuse it but she could not do so in a natural voice it is true you are not yet strong enough said the imperturbable laurence quickly and with a perfect imitation of naturalness but soon you must make a little promenade she stared at her ring after all it is more proper she observed judicially with a wedding ring one is less likely to be annoyed what is curious is that the idea never before came to me yet you like jewellery said sophia oh if i like jewellery with a gesture of the hands will you pass me that bracelet laurence obeyed and sophia clasped it round the girl's wrist keep it sophia said for me laurence exclaimed ravished it is too much it is not enough said sophia for me laurence exclaimed ravished it is too much it is not enough said sophia and when you look at it you must remember how kind you were to me and how grateful i am how nicely you say that laurence said ecstatically and sophia felt that she had indeed said it rather nicely this giving of the bracelet souvenir of one of the few capricious follies that gerald had committed for her and not for himself pleased sophia very much i am afraid your nursing of me forced you to neglect monsieur cerf she added oh, yes a little said laurence impartially with a small pout of haughtiness it is true that he used to complain but i soon put him straight what an idea he knows there are things upon which i do not joke it is not he who will quarrel the second time believe me laurence's absolute conviction of her power was what impressed sophia to sophia she seemed to be a vulgar little piece of goods with dubious charm and a glance that was far too brazen her movements were vulgar and sophia wondered how she had established her empire and upon what it rested i, I shall not show this to emmy whispered laurence indicating the bracelet as you wish said sophia by the way have i told you that war is declared laurence casually remarked no said sophia what war the scene with emmy made me forget it with the germany the city is quite excited an immense crowd in front of the new opera they say we shall be at berlin in a month or at most two months oh sophia muttered why is there a war ah it is i who ask that nobody knows it is those prussians don't you think we ought to begin again with the disinfecting sophia asked anxiously i must speak to madame foucault laurence told her not to worry and went off to show the bracelet to madame foucault she had privately decided that this was a pleasure which after all she could not deny herself End of book three chapter five part one chapter five part two four about a fortnight later it was a fine saturday in early august sophia with a large pinafore over her dress was finishing the portentous preparations for disinfecting the flat. Part of the affair was already accomplished, her own room and the corridor having been fumigated on the previous day, in spite of the opposition of Madame Foucault, who had taken amiss Laurence's tale-telling to Sophia. 
Laurence had left the flat, under exactly what circumstances Sophia knew not, but she guessed that it must have been in consequence of a scene elaborating the tiff caused by Madame Foucault's resentment against Laurence. The brief, factitious friendliness between Laurence and Sophia had gone like a dream, and Laurence had gone like a dream. The servant had been dismissed. In her place, Madame Foucault employed a charwoman each morning for two hours. Finally, Madame Foucault had been suddenly called away that morning by a letter to her sick father, and she was expecting more serious trouble when the moment arrived for ejecting Madame Foucault, as well as all her moving belongings, from Madame Foucault's own room. Nevertheless, Sophia had been determined, whatever should happen, to complete an honest fumigation of the entire flat. Hence the eagerness with which, urging Madame Foucault to go to her father, Sophia had protested that she was perfectly strong, and could manage by herself for a couple of days. Owing to the partial suppression of the ordinary railway services in favour of military needs, Madame Foucault could not hope to go and return on the same day. Sophia had lent her a louis. Pans of sulphur were mysteriously burning in each of the three front rooms, and two pairs of doors had been pasted over with paper to prevent the fumes from escaping. The charwoman had departed. Sophia, with brush, scissors, flower-paste, and news-sheets, was sealing the third pair of doors when there was a ring at the front door. She had only to cross the corridor in order to open. It was Chirac. She was not surprised to see him. The outbreak of war had induced even Sophia and her landlady to look through at least one newspaper during the day and she had in this way learnt from an article signed by Chirac that he had returned to Paris after a mission into the Vosges country for his paper. He started on seeing her. Ah! He breathed out the exclamation slowly, and then smiled, seized her hand, and kissed it. The sight of his obvious extreme pleasure in meeting her again was the sweetest experience that had fallen to Sophia for years. Then you are cured. Quite. He sighed. You know, this is an enormous relief to me, to know veritably that you are no longer in danger. You gave me a fright, but a fright, my dear madame. She smiled in silence. As he glanced inquiringly up and down the corridor, she said, I'm all alone in the flat. I'm disinfecting it. Then that is sulphur that I smell. She nodded. Excuse me while I finish this door, she said. He closed the front door. "'But you seem to be quite at home here,' he observed. "'I ought to be,' said she. He glanced again inquiringly up and down the corridor. Uh, "'And you are really all alone now?' he asked, as though to be doubly sure. She explained the circumstances. "'I owe you my most sincere excuses for bringing you here,' he said confidentially. "'But why?' she replied, looking intently at her door. They have been most kind to me. Nobody could have been kinder, and Madame Laurence being such a good nurse. It is true, said he. That was a reason. In effect, they are both very good-natured little women. You comprehend, as a journalist, it arrives to me to know all kinds of people. He snapped his fingers. And as we were opposite the house, in fine, I pray you to excuse me. "'Hold me this paper,' she said. "'It is necessary that every crack should be covered, also between the floor and the door.' "'You English are wonderful,' he murmured as he took the paper. "'Imagine you doing that.' Then he added, resuming the confidential tone, "'I suppose you will leave the Foucault now, hein?' "'I suppose so,' she said carelessly. "'You go to England?' She turned to him, as she patted the creases out of a strip of paper with a duster, and shook her head. "'Not to England? No. If it is not indiscreet, where are you going?' "'I don't know,' she said candidly. And she did not know. She was without a plan. Her brain told her that she ought to return to Bursley, or at least write, but her pride would not hear of such a surrender. Her situation would have to be far more desperate than it was before she could confess her defeat to her family, even in a letter. A thousand times, no. That was a point which she had for ever decided. She would face any disaster and any other shame, rather than the shame of her family's forgiving reception of her. "'And you?' she asked. "'How does it go, this war?' 
He told her in a few words a few leading facts about himself. "'It must not be said,' he added, of the war, "'but that will turn out ill. I, I know you comprehend.' "'Truly?' she answered, with casualness. "'You have heard nothing of him?' Chirac asked. "'Who? Gerald?' He gave a gesture. "'Nothing. Not a word. Nothing. He will have gone back to England.' "'Never.' she said positively. "'But why not?' "'Because he prefers France. He really does like France. I think it is the only real passion he ever had.' "'It is astonishing,' reflected Chirac, "'how France is loved. And yet... But to live, what will he do? Must live.' Sophia merely shrugged her shoulders. "'Then it is finished between you two? he muttered awkwardly. She nodded. She was on her knees at the lower crack of the doors. "'There,' she said, rising. "'It's well done, isn't it? That is all.' She smiled at him, facing him squarely in the obscurity of the untidy and shabby corridor. Both felt that they had become very intimate. He was intensely flattered by her attitude, and she knew it. "'Now,' she said, "'I will take off my pinafore. Where can I niche you? There is only my bedroom, and I want that. Uh, what are we to do?' Listen, he suggested diffidently, will you do me the honour to come for a drive? That will do you good. There is sunshine, and you are always very pale. With pleasure, she agreed cordially. While dressing, she heard him walking up and down the corridor. Occasionally they exchanged a few words. Before leaving, Sophia pulled off the paper from one of the keyholes of the sealed suite of rooms, and they peered through one after the other and saw the green glow of the sulphur, and were troubled by its uncanniness. And then Sophia refixed the paper. In descending the stairs of the house she felt the infirmity of her knees, but in other respects, though she had been out only once before since her illness, she was conscious of a sufficient strength. Her disinclination for any enterprise had prevented her from taking the air as she ought to have done, but within the flat she had exercised her limbs in many small tasks. The little Chirac, nervously active and restless, wanted to take her arm, but she would not allow it. The concierge and part of her family stared curiously at Sophia as she passed under the archway, for the course of her illness had excited the interest of the whole house. Just as the carriage was driving off, the concierge came across the pavement and paid her compliments, and then said— "'You do not know by hazard why Madame Foucault has not returned for lunch, madame?' "'Returned for lunch?' said Sophia. "'She will not come back till to-morrow.' The concierge made a face. "'Ah! How curious it is! She told my husband that she would return in two hours. It is very grave. Question of business.' "'I know nothing, madame,' said Sophia. She and Chirac looked at each other. The concierge murmured thanks, and went off, muttering indistinctly. The fiacre turned down the Rue La Ferrière, the horse slipping and sliding as usual over the cobblestones. Soon they were on the boulevard, making for the Champs-Élysées and the Bois de Boulogne. The fresh breeze and bright sunshine, and the large freedom of the streets, quickly intoxicated Sophia. Intoxicated her, that is to say, in quite a physical sense. She was almost drunk with the heady savour of life itself. A mild ecstasy of well-being overcame her. She saw the flat as a horrible, vile prison, and blamed herself for not leaving it sooner and oftener. The air was medicine for body and mind, too. Her perspective was instantly corrected. She was happier, living neither in the past nor in the future, but in and for that hour and beneath her happiness moved a wistful melancholy for the Sophia who had suffered such a captivity and such woes. She yearned for more and yet more delight, for careless orgies of passionate pleasure, in the midst of which she would forget all trouble. Why had she refused the offer of Laurence? Why had she not rushed at once into the splendid fire of joyous indulgence, ignoring everything but the crude, sensuous instinct? Acutely aware as she was of her youth, her beauty, and her charm, she wondered at her refusal. She did not regret her refusal. She placidly observed it as the result of some tremendously powerful motive in herself, which could not be questioned or reasoned with, which was, in fact, the essential, 
her. "'Do I look like an invalid?' she asked, leaning back luxuriously in the carriage among the crowd of other vehicles. Chirac hesitated. "'My faith, yes,' he said at length. "'But it becomes you. If I did not know that you have little love for compliments, I—' "'But I adore compliments!' she exclaimed. "'What made you think that?' "'Well, then,' he youthfully burst out, "'you are more ravishing than ever.' She gave herself up deliciously to his admiration. After a silence he said, "'Ah, if you knew how disquieted I was about you away there, I should not know how to tell you. Veritably disquieted, you comprehend. What could I do? Tell me a little about your illness.' She recounted details. As the fiacre entered the Rue Royale, they noticed a crowd of people in front of the Madeleine, shouting and cheering. The cabman turned towards them. "'It appears there has been a victory,' he said. "'A victory, if only it was true,' murmured Chirac cynically. In the Rue Royale people were running frantically to and fro, laughing and gesticulating in glee. The customers in the cafés stood on their chairs, and even on tables, to watch, and occasionally to join in the sudden fever. The fiacre was slowed to a walking pace. Flags and carpets began to show from the upper stories of houses. The crowd grew thicker and more febrile. "'Victory! Victory!' rang hoarsely, shrilly, and hoarsely again in the air. "'Oh, my God!' said Chirac, trembling. "'It must be a true victory. We are saved! We are saved! Oh, yes, it is true!' "'But naturally it is true. What are you saying?' demanded the driver. At the Place de la Concorde the fiacre had to stop altogether. The immense square was a sea of white hats and flowers and happy faces, with carriages anchored like boats on its surface. Flag after flag waved out from neighbouring roofs in the breeze that tempered the August sun. Then hats began to go up, and cheers rolled across the square, like echoes of firing in an enclosed valley. Chirac's driver jumped madly onto his seat and cracked his whip. "'Vive la France!' he bawled, with all the force of his lungs. A thousand throats answered him. Then there was a stir behind them. Another carriage was being slowly forced to the front. The crowd was pushing it and crying, "'Marseillaise! Marseillaise!' In the carriage was a woman alone, not beautiful, but distinguished, and with the assured gaze of one who is accustomed to homage and multitudinous applause. "'It is Guimard,' said Chirac to Sophia. He was very pale, and he too shouted, "'Marseillaise!' All his features were distorted. The woman rose and spoke to her coachman, who offered his hand, and she climbed to the box-seat and stood on it and bowed several times. Marseillaise! The cry continued. Then a roar of cheers, and the silence spread around the square like an inundation. And amid this silence the woman began to sing the Marseillaise. As she sang, the tears ran down her cheeks. Everybody in the vicinity was weeping or sternly frowning. In the pauses of the first verse could be heard the rattle of horses' bits, or the whistle of a tug on the river. The refrain signalled by a proud, challenging toss of Guimard's head, leapt up like a tropical tempest, formidable, overpowering. Sophia, who had no warning of the emotion gathering within her, sobbed violently. At the close of the hymn, Guimard's carriage was assaulted by worshippers. All around, in the tumult of shouting, men were kissing and embracing each other, and hats went up continually in fountains. Chirac leant over the side of the carriage, and wrung the hand of a man who was standing by the wheel. "'Who is that?' Sophia asked, in an unsteady voice, to break the inexplicable tension within her. "'I don't know,' said Chirac. He was weeping like a child, and he sang out, "'Victory! To Berlin! Victory!' Five. Sophia walked alone, with tired limbs, up the damaged oak stairs to the flat. Chirac had decided that, in the circumstances of the victory, he would do well to go to the offices of his paper rather earlier than usual. He had brought her back to the Rue Breda. They had taken leave of each other in a sort of dream or general enchantment, due to their participation in the vast national delirium which somehow dominated individual feelings. 
They did not define their relations. They had been conscious only of emotion. The stairs, which smelt of damp even in the summer, disgusted Sophia. She thought of the flat with horror, and longed for green places and luxury. On the landing were two stoutish, ill-dressed men of middle age, apparently waiting. Sophia found her key and opened the door. "'Pardon, madame,' said one of the men, raising his hat, and they both pushed into the flat after her. They stared, puzzled, at the strips of paper pasted on the doors. "'What do you want?' she asked haughtily. She was very frightened. The extraordinary interruption brought her down with a shock to the scale of the individual. "'I am the concierge,' said the man who had addressed her. He had the air of a superior artisan. "'It was my wife who spoke to you this afternoon. This,' pointing to his companion, "'this is the law. I, I regret it, but—' The law saluted and shut the front door. Like the concierge, the law emitted an odour, the odour of uncleanliness on a hot August day. "'The rent?' exclaimed Sophia. "'No, madame, not the rent, the furniture.' Then she learnt the history of the furniture. It had belonged to the concierge, who had acquired it from a previous tenant, and sold it on credit to Madame Foucault. Madame Foucault had signed bills and had not met them. She had made promises and broken them. She had done everything except discharge her liabilities. She had been warned and warned again. That day had been fixed as the last limit, and she had solemnly assured her creditor that on that day she would pay. On leaving the house she had stated precisely and clearly that she would return before lunch with all the money. She had made no mention of a sick father. Sophia slowly perceived the extent of Madame Foucault's duplicity and moral cowardice. No doubt the sick father was an invention. The woman, at the end of a tether which no ingenuity of lies could further lengthen, had probably absented herself solely to avoid the pain of witnessing the seizure. She would do anything, however silly, to avoid an immediate unpleasantness. Or perhaps she had absented herself without any particular aim, but simply in the hope that something fortunate might occur. Perhaps she had hoped that Sophia, taken unawares, would generously pay. Sophia smiled grimly. "'Well,' she said, "'I can't do anything. I suppose you must do what you have to do. You will let me pack up my own affairs?' Uh, "'Perfectly, madame.' She warned them as to the danger of opening the sealed rooms. The man of the law seemed prepared to stay in the corridor indefinitely. No prospect of delay disturbed him. Strange and disturbing, the triumph of the concierge. He was a locksmith by trade. He and his wife and their children lived in two little dark rooms by the archway, an insignificant fragment of the house. He was away from home about fourteen hours every day, except Sundays, when he washed the courtyard. All the other duties of the concierge were performed by the wife. The pair always looked poor, untidy, dirty, and rather forlorn. But they were steadily levying toll on everyone in the big house— they amassed money in forty ways. They lived for money, and all men have what they live for. With what arrogant gestures Madame Foucault would descend from a carriage at the great door! What respectful attitudes and tones the ageing courtesan would receive from the wife and children of the concierge! But beneath these conventional fictions the truth was that the concierge held the whip. At last he was using it and he had given himself a half-holiday in order to celebrate his second acquirement of the ostentatious furniture and the crimson lampshades. This was one of the dramatic crises in his career as a man of substance. The national thrill of victory had not penetrated into the flat with the concierge and the law. The emotions of the concierge were entirely independent of the Napoleonic foreign policy. As Sophia, sick with a sudden disillusion, was putting her things together, and wondering where she was to go, and whether it would be politic to consult Chirac, she heard a fluster at the front door, cries, protestations, implorings. Her own door was thrust open, and Madame Foucault burst in. "'Save me!' exclaimed Madame Foucault, sinking to the ground. The feeble theatricality of the gesture offended Sophia's taste. 
She asked sternly what Madame Foucault expected her to do, had not Madame Foucault knowingly exposed her without the least warning to the extreme annoyance of this visit of the law, a visit which meant practically that Sophia was put into the street. "'You must not be hard,' Madame Foucault sobbed. Sophia learnt the complete history of the woman's efforts to pay for the furniture, a farrago of folly and deception. Madame Foucault confessed too much. Sophia scorned confession for the sake of confession. She scorned the impulse which forces a weak creature to insist on its weakness, to revel in remorse, and to find an excuse for its conduct in the very fact that there is no excuse. She gathered that Madame Foucault had in fact gone away in the hope that Sophia, trapped, would pay, and that in the end she had not even the courage of her own trickery, and had run back, driven by panic into audacity, to fall at Sophia's feet, lest Sophia might not have yielded, and the furniture have been seized. From beginning to end the conduct of Madame Foucault had been fatuous and despicable and wicked. Sophia coldly condemned Madame Foucault for having allowed herself to be brought into the world with such a weak and maudlin character, and for having allowed herself to grow old and ugly. As a sight, the woman was positively disgraceful. "'Save me!' she exclaimed again. I, "'I did what I could for you!' Sophia hated her, but the logic of the appeal was irresistible. "'But what can I do?' she asked reluctantly. "'Lend me the money. You can. If you don't, this will be the end of me.' "'And a good thing, too,' thought Sophia's hard sense. "'How much is it?' Sophia glumly asked. "'It isn't a thousand francs,' said Madame Foucault, with eagerness. "'All my beautiful furniture will go for less than a thousand francs. Save me!' She was nauseating Sophia. "'Please rise,' said Sophia, her hands fidgeting undecidedly. "'I shall repay you surely,' Madame Foucault asseverated. "'I swear!' "'Does she take me for a fool?' thought Sophia, with her oaths. "'No,' said Sophia. "'I won't lend you the money. "'But I tell you what I will do. "'I will buy the furniture at that price. "'And I will promise to resell it to you as soon as you can pay me. "'Like that you can be tranquil. "'But I have very little money. "'I must have a guarantee. "'The furniture must be mine till you pay me.' "'You are an angel of charity.' cried Madame Foucault, embracing Sophia's skirts. I will do whatever you wish. Ah, oh, you English women are astonishing. Sophia was not an angel of charity. What she had promised to do involved sacrifice and anxiety without the prospect of reward, but it was not charity. It was part of the price Sophia paid for the exercise of her logical faculty. She paid it unwillingly. I did what I could for you. Sophia would have died sooner than remind any one of a benefit conferred, and Madame Foucault had committed precisely that enormity. The appeal was inexcusable to a fine mind, but it was effective. The men were behind the door, listening. Sophia paid out of her stock of notes. Needless to say, the total was more, and not less, than a thousand francs. Madame Foucault grew rapidly confidential with the man. Without consulting Sophia, she asked the bailiff to draw up a receipt transferring the ownership of all the furniture to Sophia, and the bailiff, struck into obligingness by glimpses of Sophia's beauty, consented to do so. There was much conferring upon forms of words, and flourishing of pens between thick, vile fingers, and scattering of ink. Before the men left, Madame Foucault uncorked a bottle of wine for them, and helped them to drink it. Throughout the evening she was insupportably deferential to Sophia, who was driven to bed. Madame Foucault contentedly went up to the sixth floor to occupy the servant's bedroom. She was glad to get so far away from the sulphur, of which a few faint fumes had penetrated into the corridor. The next morning, after a stifling night of bad dreams, Sophia was too ill to get up. She looked round at the furniture in the little room, and she imagined the furniture in the other rooms, and dismally thought, "'All this furniture is mine. She will never pay me. I am saddled with it.' It was cheaply bought, but she probably could not sell it even for what she had paid. Still, the sense of ownership was reassuring. The charwoman brought her coffee and Chirac's newspaper, 
from which she learnt that the news of the victory which had sent the city mad on the previous day was utterly false. Tears came into her eyes as she gazed absently at all the curtained windows of the courtyard. She had youth and loveliness. According to the rules, she ought to have been irresponsible, gay, and indulgently watched over by the wisdom of admiring age. But she felt towards the French nation as a mother might feel towards adorable, willful children, suffering through their own charming foolishness. She saw France personified in Chirac. How easily, despite his special knowledge, he had yielded to the fever. Her heart bled for France and Chirac on that morning of reaction and of truth. She could not bear to recall the scene in the Place de la Concorde. Madame Foucault had not descended. Chapter Six, The Siege. One. Madame Foucault came into Sophia's room one afternoon with a peculiar, guilty expression on her large face, and she held her peignoir close to her exuberant body in folds consciously majestic, as though endeavouring to prove to Sophia by her carriage that, despite her shifting eyes, she was the most righteous and sincere woman that ever lived. It was Saturday, the third of September. A beautiful day. Sophia, suffering from an unimportant relapse, had remained in a state of inactivity, and had scarcely gone out at all. She loathed the flat, but lacked the energy to leave it every day. There was no sufficiently definite object in leaving it. She could not go out and look for health, as she might have looked for flowers. So she remained in the flat, and stared at the courtyard, and the continual mystery of lives lived behind curtains that occasionally moved and the painted yellow walls of the house, and the papered walls of her room, pressed upon her and crushed her. For a few days Chirac had called daily, animated by the most adorable solicitude. Then he had ceased to call. She had tired of reading the journals. They lay unopened. The relations between Madame Foucault and herself, and her status in the flat, of which she now legally owned the furniture, these things were left unsettled but the question of her board was arranged on the terms that she halved the cost of food and service with Madame Foucault. Her expenses were thus reduced to the lowest possible, about eighteen francs a week. An idea hung in the air, like a scientific discovery on the point of being made by several independent investigators simultaneously, that she and Madame Foucault should co-operate, in order to let furnish rooms at a remunerative profit. Sophia felt the nearness of the idea, and she wanted to be shocked at the notion of any avowed association between herself and Madame Foucault, but she could not be. "'Here are a lady and a gentleman who want a bedroom,' began Madame Foucault, "'a nice large bedroom furnished.' "'Oh,' said Sophia, "'who are they? They will pay a hundred and thirty francs a month in advance for the middle bedroom.' "'You've shown it to them already?' said Sophia, and her tone implied that somehow she was conscious of a right to overlook the affair of Madame Foucault. "'No,' said the other, "'I said to myself that first I would ask you for a counsel. Then will they pay all that for a room they haven't seen?' "'The, the fact is,' said Madame Foucault sheepishly, "'the lady has seen the room before. I, I know her a little. It is a former tenant. She lives here some weeks.' "'In that room?' "'Oh, no, she was poor enough then.' "'Where are they?' "'In the corridor. She is very well, the lady. Naturally, one must live. She like all the world, but she is veritably well, quite respectable. One would never say. Then there would be the meals. We could demand one franc for the café au lait, or two and a half francs for the lunch, and three francs for the dinner.' Without counting other things, that would mean over five hundred francs a month, at least. And what would they cost us? Almost nothing. By what appears, he is a plutocrat. I could thus quickly repay you. Is it a married couple? Ah, you know, one cannot demand the marriage certificate. Madame Foucault indicated by a gesture that the Rue Breda was not the paradise of saints. When she came before this lady, was it with the same man? Sophia asked coldly. "'La, my faith, no!' exclaimed Madame Foucault, bridling. "'It was a bad sort, the other. Ah, ah, no!' 
"'Why do you ask my advice?' Sophia abruptly questioned, in a hard, inimical voice. "'Is it that it concerns me?' Tears came at once into the eyes of Madame Foucault. "'Do not be unkind,' she implored. "'I am not unkind,' said Sophia in the same tone. "'Shall you leave me if I accept this offer?' There was a pause. "'Yes,' said Sophia, bluntly. She tried to be large-hearted, large-minded, and sympathetic, but there was no signs of these qualities in her speech. "'And if you take with you the furniture which is yours?' Sophia kept silence. "'How am I to live, I demand of you?' Madame Foucault asked weakly. "'By being respectable and dealing with respectable people,' said Sophia uncompromisingly, in tones of steel. "'I am unhappy.' murmured the elder woman. However, you are more strong than I. She brusquely dabbed her eyes, gave a little sob, and ran out of the room. Sophia listened at the door, and heard her dismiss the would-be tenants of the best bedroom. She wondered that she should possess such moral ascendancy over the woman, she so young and ingenuous, for of course she had not meant to remove the furniture. She could hear Madame Foucault sobbing quietly in one of the other rooms, and her lips curled. Before evening a truly astonishing event happened. Perceiving that Madame Foucault showed no signs of bestirring herself, Sophia, with good nature in her heart, but not on her tongue, went to her, and said, "'Shall I occupy myself with the dinner?' Madame Foucault sobbed more loudly. "'That would be very amiable on your part,' Madame Foucault managed at last to reply, not very articulately. Sophia put a hat on and went to the grocer's. The grocer, who kept a busy establishment at the corner of the Rue Closel, was a middle-aged and wealthy man. He had sent his young wife and two children to Normandy, until victory over the Prussians should be more assured, and he asked Sophia whether it was true that there was a good bedroom to let in the flat where she lived. His servant was ill of smallpox. He was attacked by anxieties and fears on all sides. He would not enter his own flat on account of possible infection. He liked Sophia, and Madame Foucault had been a customer of his with intervals for twenty years. Within an hour he had arranged to rent the middle bedroom at eighty francs a month, and to take his meals there. The terms were modest, but the respectability was prodigious. All the glory of this tenancy fell upon Sophia. Madame Foucault was deeply impressed. Characteristically, she began at once to construct a theory that Sophia had only to walk out of the house in order to discover ideal tenants for the rooms. Also, she regarded the advent of the grocer as a reward from Providence for her self-denial in refusing the profits of sinfulness. Sophia felt personally responsible to the grocer for his comfort, and so she herself undertook the preparation of the room. Madame Foucault was amazed at the thoroughness of her housewifery, and at the ingenuity of her ideas for the arrangement of furniture. She sat and watched with admiration sycophantic but real. That night, when Sophia was in bed, Madame Foucault came into the room, and dropped down by the side of the bed, and begged Sophia to be her moral support for ever. She confessed herself generally. She explained how she had always hated the negation of respectability, how respectability was the one thing that she had all her life passionately desired. She said that if Sophia would be her partner in the letting of furnished rooms to respectable persons, she would obey her in everything. She gave Sophia a list of all the traits in Sophia's character which she admired. She asked Sophia to influence her, to stand by her. She insisted that she would sleep on the sixth floor in the servant's tiny room, and she had a vision of three bedrooms let to successful tradesmen. She was in an ecstasy of repentance and good intentions. Sophia consented to the business proposition, for she had nothing else whatever in prospect, and she shared Madame Foucault's rosy view about the remunerativeness of the bedrooms. With three tenants who took meals, the two women would be able to feed themselves for nothing, and still make a profit on the food, and the rents would be clear gain and she felt very sorry for the ageing, feckless Madame Foucault, whose sincerity was obvious. The association between them would be strange. It would have been impossible to explain it to St. Luke's Square. And yet 
if there was anything at all in the virtue of Christian charity, what could properly be urged against the association? Ah, murmured Madame Foucault, kissing Sophia's hands, it is to-day, then, that I recommence my life. You will see, you will see, you have saved me. It was a strange sight, the time-worn, disfigured courtesan, half prostrate before the beautiful young creature, proud and unassailable in the instinctive force of her own character. It was almost a didactic tableau, fraught with lessons for the vicious. Sophia was happier than she had been for years. She had a purpose in existence, she had a fluid soul to mould to her will according to her wisdom, and there was a large compassion to her credit. Public opinion could not intimidate her, for in her case there was no public opinion. She knew nobody. Nobody had the right to question her doings. The next day, Sunday, they both worked hard at the bedrooms from early morning. The grocer was installed in his chamber, and the two other rooms were cleansed as they had never been cleansed. At four o'clock, the weather being more magnificent than ever, Madame Foucault said, "'If we took a promenade on the boulevard?' Sophia reflected. They were partners. Very well, she agreed. The boulevard was crammed with gay, laughing crowds. All the cafés were full. None who did not know could have guessed that the news of Sedan was scarcely a day old in the capital. Delirious joy reigned in the glittering sunshine. As the two women strolled along, content with their industry and their resolves, they came to a national guard, who— perched on a ladder, was chipping away the N from the official sign of a court tradesman. He was exchanging jokes with a circle of open mouths. It was in this way that Madame Foucault and Sophia learnt of the establishment of a republic. "'Vive la République!' cried Madame Foucault incontinently, and then apologised to Sophia for the lapse. They listened a long while to a man who was telling strange histories of the Empress. Suddenly, Sophia noticed that Madame Foucault was no longer at her elbow. She glanced about, and saw her in earnest conversation with a young man whose face seemed familiar. She remembered it was the young man with whom Madame Foucault had quarrelled on the night when Sophia found her prone in the corridor, the last remaining worshipper of the courtesan. The woman's face was quite changed by her agitation. Sophia drew away, offended. She watched the pair from a distance for a few moments, and then, furious in disillusion, she escaped from the fever of the boulevards and walked quietly home. Madame Foucault did not return. Apparently Madame Foucault was doomed to be the toy of chance. Two days later Sophia received a scrawled letter from her, with the information that her lover had required that she should accompany him to Brussels, as Paris would soon be getting dangerous. He adores me always. He is the most delicious boy. As I have always said, this is the grand passion of my life. I am happy. He would not permit me to come to you. He has spent two thousand francs on clothes for me, since naturally I had nothing. And so on. No word of apology. Sophia, in reading the letter, allowed for a certain exaggeration and twisting of the truth. Young fool! Fool! She burst out angrily. She did not mean herself. She meant the fatuous adorer of that dilapidated, horrible woman. She never saw her again. Doubtless Madame Foucault fulfilled her own prediction as to her ultimate destiny, but in Brussels. 2. Sophia still possessed about a hundred pounds, and had she chosen to leave Paris and France, there was nothing to prevent her from doing so. Perhaps, if she had chanced to visit the Gare Saint-Lazare, or the Gare du Nord, the sight of tens of thousands of people flying seawards might have stirred in her the desire to flee also from the vague coming danger. But she did not visit those termini. She was too busy looking after Monsieur Nipse, her grocer. Moreover, she would not quit her furniture, which seemed to her to be a sort of rock. With a flat full of furniture, she considered that she ought to be able to devise a livelihood, the enterprise of becoming independent was already indeed begun. She ardently wished to be independent, to utilise in her own behalf the gifts of organisation, foresight, common sense, and tenacity, which she knew she possessed, and which had lain idle, and she hated the idea of flight. 
Chirac returned as unexpectedly as he had gone. An expedition for his paper had occupied him. With his lips he urged her to go, but his eyes spoke differently. He had, one afternoon, a mood of candid despair, such as he would have dared to show only to one in whom he felt a great confidence. "'They will come to Paris,' he said. "'Nothing can stop them. And then?' He gave a cynical laugh. But when he urged her to go, she said, "'And what about my furniture? And I've promised Monsieur Nieps to look after him.' Then Chirac informed her that he was without a lodging, and that he would like to rent one of her rooms. She agreed. Shortly afterwards he introduced a middle-aged acquaintance named Carlier, the secretary-general of his newspaper, who wished to rent a bedroom. Thus, by good fortune, Sophia let all her rooms immediately, and was sure of over two hundred francs a month, apart from the profit on meals supplied. On this latter occasion, Chirac, and his companion too, was quite optimistic, reiterating an absolute certitude that Paris could never be invested. Briefly, Sophia did not believe him. She believed the candidly despairing Chirac. She had no information, no wide theory to justify her pessimism, nothing but the inward conviction that the race capable of behaving as she had seen it behave in the Place de la Concorde was bound to be defeated. She loved the French race but all the practical Teutonic sagacity in her wanted to take care of it in its difficulties, and was rather angry with it for being so unfitted to take care of itself. She let the men talk, and with careless disdain of their discussions and their certainties, she went about her business of preparation. At this period, overworked and harassed by novel responsibilities and risks, she was happier for days together than she had ever been, simply because she had a purpose in life, and was depending upon herself. Her ignorance of the military and political situation was complete. The situation did not interest her. What interested her was that she had three men to feed, wholly or partially, and that the price of eatables was rising. She bought eatables. She bought fifty pecks of potatoes at a franc a peck, and another fifty pecks at a franc and a quarter, double the normal price, ten hams at two and a half francs a pound, a large quantity of tinned vegetables and fruits, a sack of flour, rice, biscuits, coffee, Lyon sausage, dried prunes, dried figs, and much wood and charcoal. But the chief of her purchases was cheese, of which her mother used to say that bread and cheese and water made a complete diet. Many of these articles she obtained from her grocer, all of them, except the flour and the biscuits, she stored in the cellar belonging to the flat. After several days' delay, for the Parisian workmen were too elated by the advent of a republic to stoop to labour, she caused a new lock to be fixed on the cellar door. Her activities were the sensation of the house. Everybody admired, but no one imitated. One morning, on going to do her marketing, she found a notice across the shuttered windows of her creamery, in the Rue Notre-Dame de Lorette, closed for want of milk. The siege had begun. It was in the closing of the creamery that the siege was figured for her, in this, and in eggs at five sous apiece. She went elsewhere for her milk, and paid a franc a litre for it. That evening she told her lodgers that the price of meals would be doubled, and that if any gentleman thought he could get equally good meals elsewhere, her position was strengthened by the appearance of another candidate for a room, a friend of Niepce. She had once offered him her own room, at a hundred and fifty francs a month. "'You see,' she said, "'there is a piano in it.' "'But I, I don't play the piano,' the man protested, shocked at the price. "'That is not my fault,' she said. He agreed to pay the price demanded for the room, because of the opportunity of getting good meals much cheaper than in the restaurants. Like Monsieur Nieps, he was a siege widower, his wife having been put under shelter in Brittany. Sophia took to the servant's bedroom on the sixth floor. It measured nine feet by seven, and had no window save a skylight, but Sophia was in a fair way to realise a profit of at least four pounds a week after paying for everything. On the night when she installed herself in that chamber, amid a world of domestics and poor people, she worked very late and the rays of her candle shot up intermittently through the skylight into a black heaven. At intervals she flitted up and down the stairs with a candle. 
Unknown to her, a crowd gradually formed opposite the house in the street, and about one o'clock in the morning a file of soldiers woke the concierge and invaded the courtyard, and every window was suddenly populated with heads. Sophia was called upon to prove that she was not a spy signalling to the Prussians. Three quarters of an hour passed before her innocence was established and the staircases cleared of uniforms and dishevelled curiosity. The childish, impossible unreason of the suspicion against her completed in Sophia's mind the ruin of the reputation of the French people as a sensible race. She was extremely caustic the next day to her boarders. Except for this episode, the frequency of military uniforms in the streets, the price of food, and the fact that at least one house in four was flying either the ambulance flag or the flag of a foreign embassy, in the absurd hope of immunity from the impending bombardment, the siege did not exist for Sophia. The men often talked about their guard duty and disappeared for a day or two to the ramparts, but she was too busy to listen to them. She thought of nothing but her enterprise, which absorbed all her powers. She arose at six a.m. in the dark, and by seven-thirty Monsieur Niepce and his friend had been served with breakfast, and much general work was already done. At eight o'clock she went out to market. When asked why she continued to buy at a high price articles of which she had a store, she would reply, "'I am keeping all that till things are much dearer.' This was regarded as astounding astuteness. On the 15th of October she paid the quarter's rent of the flat, 400 francs, and was accepted as tenant. Her ears were soon quite accustomed to the sound of cannon, and she felt that she had always been a citizeness of Paris, and that Paris had always been besieged. She did not speculate about the end of the siege. She lived from day to day. Occasionally she had a qualm of fear, when the firing grew momentarily louder, or when she heard that battles had been fought in such and such a suburb. But then she said it was absurd to be afraid when you were with a couple of million people, all in the same plight as yourself. She grew reconciled to everything. She even began to like her tiny bedroom, partly because it was so easy to keep warm. The question of artificial heat was growing acute in Paris, and partly because it ensured her privacy. Down in the flat, Whatever was done or said in one room could be more or less heard in all the others, owing to the prevalence of doors. Her existence in the first half of November had become regular, with a monotony almost absolute. Only the number of meals served to her boarders varied slightly from day to day. All these repasts, save now and then one in the evening, were carried into the bedrooms by the charwoman. Sophia did not allow herself to be seen much, except in the afternoons. Though Sophia continued to increase her prices, and was now selling her stores at an immense profit, she never approached the prices current outside. She was very indignant against the exploitation of Paris by its shopkeepers, who had vast supplies of provender, and were hoarding for the rise. But the force of their example was too great for her to ignore it entirely. She contented herself with about half their gains. Only to Monsieur Nietz did she charge more than to the others, because he was a shopkeeper. The four men appreciated their paradise. In them developed that agreeable feeling of security which solitary males find only under the roof of a landlady who is at once prompt, honest, and a votary of cleanliness. Sophia hung a slate near the front door, and on this slate they wrote their requests for meals, for being called, for laundry work, etc. Sophia never made a mistake, and never forgot. The perfection of the domestic machine amazed these men, who had been accustomed to something quite different, and who every day heard harrowing stories of discomfort and swindling from their acquaintances. They even admired so far for making them pay, if not too high, still high. They thought it wonderful that she should tell them the price of all things in advance, and even show them how to avoid expense, particularly in the matter of warmth. She arranged rugs for each of them, so that they could sit comfortably in their rooms, with nothing but a small charcoal heater for the hands. Quite naturally they came to regard her as the paragon and miracle of women. They endowed her with every fine quality. According to them there had never been such a woman in the history of mankind. There could not have been. She became legendary among their friends, a young and elegant creature, surpassingly beautiful, proud queenly, unapproachable, scarcely visible, a marvellous manager, 
a fine cook and artificer of strange English dishes, utterly reliable, utterly exact, and with habits of order. They adored the slight English accent, which gave a touch of the exotic to her very correct and freely idiomatic French. In short, Sophia was perfect for them, an impossible woman. Whatever she did was right. And she went up to her room every night with limbs exhausted, but with head clear enough to balance her accounts and go through her money. She did this in bed with thick gloves on. If often she did not sleep well, it was not because of the distant guns, but because of her preoccupation with the subject of finance. She was making money, and she wanted to make more. She was always inventing ways of economy. She was so anxious to achieve independence that money was always in her mind. She began to love gold, to love hoarding it, and to hate paying it away. One morning her charwoman, who by good fortune was nearly as precise as Sophia herself, failed to appear. When the moment came for serving Monsieur Neepse's breakfast, Sophia hesitated, and then decided to look after the old man personally. She knocked at his door, and went boldly in with the tray and candle. He started at seeing her. She was wearing a blue apron, as the charwoman did, but there could be no mistaking her for the charwoman. Neepse looked older in bed than when dressed. He had a rather ridiculous, undignified appearance, common among old men before their morning toilette is achieved and a nightcap did not improve it. His rotund paunch lifted the bedclothes, upon which, for the sake of extra warmth, he had spread unmajestic garments. Sophia smiled to herself, but the contempt implied by that secret smile was softened by the thought, poor old man. She told him briefly that she supposed the charwoman to be ill. He coughed and moved nervously. His benevolent and simple face beamed on her paternally as she fixed the tray by the bed. "'I really must open the window for one little second, she said, and did so. The chill air of the street came through the closed shutters, and the old man made a noise as of shivering. She pushed back the shutters and closed the window, and then did the same with the other two windows. It was almost day in the room. "'You will no longer need the candle,' she said, and came back to the bedside to extinguish it. The benign and fatherly old man put his arm round her waist— Fresh from the tonic of pure air, and with the notion of his ridiculous still in her mind, she was staggered for an instant by this gesture. She had never given a thought to the temperament of the old grocer, the husband of a young wife. She could not always imaginatively keep in mind the effect of her own radiance, especially under such circumstances. But after an instant her precocious cynicism, which had slept, sprang up. "'Naturally, I might have expected it,' she thought, with blasting scorn. "'Take away your hand,' she said bitterly to the amiable old fool. She did not stir. He obeyed sheepishly. "'Do you wish to remain with me?' she asked, and as he did not immediately answer, she said in a most commanding tone, "'Answer, then.' "'Yes,' he said feebly. "'Well, behave properly.' She went towards the door. "'I wished only,' he stammered, "'I do not wish to know what you wished.' she said. Afterwards she wondered how much of the incident had been overheard. The other breakfasts she left outside the respective doors, and in future Neepses also. The charwoman never came again. She had caught smallpox, and she died of it, thus losing a good situation. Strangely to say, Sophia did not replace her. The temptation to save her wages and food was too strong. She could not, however, stand waiting for hours at the door of the official baker and the official butcher, one of a long line of frozen women, for the daily rations of bread and tri-weekly rations of meat. She employed the concierge's boy at two sous an hour to do this. Sometimes he would come in with his hands so blue and cold that he could scarcely hold the precious cards which gave the right to the rations, and which cost Chirac an hour or two of waiting at the mayoral offices each week. Sophia might have fed her flock without resorting to the official rations, but she would not sacrifice the economy which they represented. She demanded thick clothes for the concierge's boy, and received boots from Chirac, gloves from Carlier, and a great overcoat from Nieps. The weather increased in severity, and provisions in price. One day 
she sold to the wife of a chemist who lived on the first floor for a hundred and ten francs, a ham for which she had paid less than thirty francs. She was conscious of a thrill of joy in receiving a beautiful banknote and a gold coin in exchange for a mere ham. By this time her total cash resources had grown to nearly five thousand francs. It was astounding, and the reserves in the cellar were still considerable, and the sack of flour that encumbered the kitchen was still more than half full. The death of the faithful charwoman, when she heard of it, produced but little effect on Sophia, who was so overworked, and so completely absorbed in her own affairs, that she had no nervous energy to spare for sentimental regrets. The charwoman, by whose side she had regularly passed many hours in the kitchen, so that she knew every crease in her face and fold of her dress, vanished out of Sophia's memory. Sophia cleaned and arranged two of the bedrooms in the morning, and two in the afternoon. She had stayed in hotels where fifteen bedrooms were in charge of a single chambermaid, and she thought it would be hard if she could not manage four in the intervals of cooking and other work. This, she said to herself, by way of excuse for not engaging another charwoman. One afternoon she was rubbing the brass knobs of the numerous doors in Monsieur Nipsey's room, when the grocer unexpectedly came in. She glanced at him sharply. There was a self-conscious look in his eye. He had entered the flat noiselessly. She remembered having told him, in response to a question, that she now did his room in the afternoon. Why should he have left his shop? He hung up his hat behind the door, with the meticulous care of an old man. Then he took off his overcoat and rubbed his hands. "'You do well to wear gloves, madame,' he said. "'It is dog's weather.' "'I do not wear them for the cold,' she replied. "'I wear them so as not to spoil my hands.' "'Ah, truly, oh, very well, very well. May I demand some wood? Where shall I find it? I do not wish to derange you.' She refused his help, and brought wood from the kitchen, counting the logs audibly before him. "'Shall I light the fire now?' she asked. "'I will light it,' he said. "'Give me a match, please.' As she was arranging the wood and paper, he said, "'Madame, will you listen to me?' "'What is it?' "'Do not be angry,' he said. "'Have I not proved that I am capable of respecting you? I continue in that respect.' It is with all that respect that I say to you that I love you, madame. No, remain calm, I implore you. The fact was that Sophia showed no sign of not remaining calm. It is true that I have a wife, but what do you wish? She is far away. I, I love you madly, he proceeded with a dignified respect. I know I am old, but I am rich. I understand your character. You are a lady. You are decided, direct, sincere, and a woman of business. I have the greatest respect for you. One can talk to you as one could not to another woman. You prefer directness and sincerity. Madame, I will give you two thousand francs a month and all you require from my shop, if you will be amiable to me. I am very solitary. I need the society of a charming creature who would be sympathetic. Two thousand francs a month, it is money. He wiped his shiny head with his hand. Sophia was bending over the fire. She turned her head towards him. "'Is that all?' she said quietly. "'You could count on my discretion,' he said in a low voice. "'I appreciate your scruples. I would come very late to your room on the sixth. One could arrange. You see, I am direct like you.' She had an impulse to order him tempestuously out of the flat. But it was not a genuine impulse. He was an old fool. Why not treat him as such? To take him seriously would be absurd. Moreover, he was a very remunerative boarder. "'Do not be stupid,' she said with cruel tranquillity. "'Do not be an old fool.' And the benign but fatuous middle-aged lecher saw the enchanting vision of Sophia, with her natty apron and her amusing gloves, sweep and fade from the room. He left the house, and the expensive fire warmed an empty room. Sophia was angry with him. He had evidently planned the proposal. If capable of respect, he was evidently also capable of chicane. But she supposed these Frenchmen were all alike, disgusting, and decided that it was useless to worry over a universal fact. They simply had no shame, and she had been very prudent to establish herself far away on the sixth floor. 
She hoped that none of the other boarders had overheard Niepce's outrageous insolence. She was not sure if Chirac was not writing in his room. That night there was no sound of cannon in the distance, and Sophia for some time was unable to sleep. She woke up with a start after a doze, and struck a match to look at her watch. It had stopped. She had forgotten to wind it up, which omission indicated that the grocer had perturbed her more than she thought. She could not be sure how long she had slept. The hour might be two o'clock, or it might be six o'clock, impossible for her to rest. She got up and dressed, in case it should be as late as she feared, and crept down the interminable creaking stairs with the candle. As she descended, the conviction that it was the middle of the night grew upon her, and she stepped more softly. There was no sound save that caused by her footfalls. With her latchkey she cautiously opened the front door of the flat and entered. She could then hear the noisy ticking of the small, cheap clock in the kitchen. At the same moment another door creaked, and Chirac, with hair all tousled but fully dressed, appeared in the corridor. "'So you have decided to sell yourself to him?' Chirac whispered. She drew away instinctively, and she could feel herself blushing. She was at a loss. She saw that Chirac was in a furious rage, tremendously moved. He crept towards her, half-crouching. She had never seen anything so theatrical as his movement and the twitching of his face. She felt that she too ought to be theatrical, that she ought nobly to scorn his infamous suggestion, his unwarrantable attack. Even supposing that she had decided to sell herself to the old pasha, did that concern him? A dignified silence, an annihilating glance, were all that he deserved, but she was not capable of this heroic behaviour. "'What time is it?' she added weakly. Three o'clock! Three o'clock!' Chirac sneered. "'I forgot to wind up my watch,' she said, "'and so I came down to see.' "'In effect,' he spoke sarcastically, "'as if saying, I've waited for you, and here you are.' She said to herself that she owed him nothing, but all the time she felt that he and she were the only young people in that flat, and that she did owe to him the proof that she was guiltless of the supreme dishonour of youth. She collected her forces and looked at him. "'You should be ashamed,' she said. "'You will rake the others. And Monsieur Nieps, will he need to be wakened? Monsieur Nieps is not here,' she said. Nieps's door was unlatched. She pushed it open and went into the room, which was empty, and bore no sign of having been used. "'Come and satisfy yourself,' she insisted. Chirac did so. His face fell. She took her watch from her pocket. "'And now wind my watch, and set it, please.' She saw that he was in anguish. He could not take the watch. Tears came into his eyes. Then he hid his face and dashed away. She heard a sob-impeded murmur that sounded like, "'Forgive me,' and the banging of a door. And in the stillness she heard the regular snoring of Monsieur Carlier. She too cried. Her vision was blurred by a mist and she stumbled into the kitchen and seized the clock and carried it with her upstairs, and shivered in the intense cold of the night. She wept gently for a very long time. "'What a shame! What a shame!' she said to herself. Yet she did not quite blame Chirac. The frost drove her into bed, but not to sleep. She continued to cry. At dawn her eyes were inflamed with weeping. She was back in the kitchen then. Chirac's door was wide open. He had left the flat. On the slate was written, I shall not take meals today. 3. Their relations were permanently changed. For several days they did not meet at all, and when at the end of the week Chirac was obliged at last to face the fire in order to pay his bill, he had a most grievous expression. It was obvious that he considered himself a criminal without any defence to offer for his crime. He seemed to make no attempt to hide his state of mind. But he said nothing. As for Sophia, she preserved a mien of amiable cheerfulness. She exerted herself to convince him by her attitude that she bore no resentment, that she had determined to forget the incident, that, in short, she was the forgiving angel of his dreams. She did not, however, succeed entirely in being quite natural. Confronted by his misery, it would have been impossible for her to be quite natural, and at the same time quite cheerful. A little later, 
the social atmosphere of the flat began to grow querulous, disputatious, and perverse. The nerves of everybody were seriously strained. This applied to the whole city. Days of heavy rains followed the sharp frosts, and the town was, as it were, sodden with woe. The gates were closed, and though nine-tenths of the inhabitants never went outside the gates, the definite and absolute closing of them demoralised all hearts. Gas was no longer supplied. Rats, cats, and thoroughbred horses were being eaten, and pronounced not bad. The siege had ceased to be a novelty. Friends did not invite one another to a siege dinner as to a picnic. Sophia, fatigued by regular overwork, became weary of the situation. She was angry with the Prussians for dilatoriness, and with the French for inaction, and she poured out her English spleen on her boarders. The boarders told each other in secret that the patron was growing formidable. Chiefly, she bore a grudge against the shopkeepers, and when, upon a rumour of peace, the shop windows one day suddenly blossomed with prodigious quantities of all edibles at the highest prices, thus proving that the famine was artificially created, Sophia was furious. Monsieur Nieps, in particular, though he sold goods to her at a special discount, suffered indignities. A few days later that benign and fatherly man put himself lamentably in the wrong by attempting to introduce into his room a charming young creature who knew how to be sympathetic. Sophia, by an accident unfortunate for the grocer, caught them in the corridor. She was beside herself, but the only outward symptoms were a white face and a cold, steely voice that grated like a rasp on the susceptibilities of the adherents of Aphrodite. At this period, Sophia had certainly developed into a termagant, without knowing it. She would often insist now on talking about the siege, and hearing everything that the men could tell her. Her comments, made without the least regard for the justifiable delicacy of their feelings as Frenchmen, sometimes led to heated exchanges. When all Montmartre and the Quartier Breda was impassioned by the appearance from outside of the 32nd Battalion, she took the side of the populace, and would not credit the solemn statement of the journalists, proved by documents, that those maltreated soldiers were not cowards in flight. She supported the women who had spat in the faces of the 32nd. She actually said that if she met them she would have spat too. Really she was convinced of the innocence of the 32nd, but something prevented her from admitting it. The dispute ended with high words between herself and Chirac. The next day Chirac came home at an unusual hour, knocked at the kitchen door, and said, "'I must give notice to leave you.' "'Why?' she demanded curtly. She was kneading flour and water for a potato-cake. Her potato-cakes were the joy of the household. "'My paper has stopped,' said Chirac. "'Oh!' she added thoughtfully, but not looking at him. "'That is no reason why you should leave.' "'Yes,' he said. "'This place is beyond my means. "'I do not need to tell you that in ceasing to appear "'the paper has omitted to pay its debts. "'The house owes me a month's salary, so I must leave.' "'No,' said Sophia, "'you can pay me when you have money.' "'He shook his head. "'I have no intention of accepting your kindness.' "'Haven't you got any money?' she abruptly asked. "'None,' said he. It is the disaster, quite simply. Then you will be forced to get into debt somewhere. Yes, but not here, not to you. Truly, Chirac, she exclaimed with a cajoling voice, you are not reasonable. Nevertheless, it is like that, he said with decision. Eh, well, she turned on him menacingly, it will not be like that. You understand me? You will stay, and you will pay me when you can. Otherwise we shall quarrel. Do you imagine I shall tolerate your childlessness? Just because you were angry last night. It's not that, he protested. You ought to know that it is not that. She did. It is solely that I cannot permit myself to— Enough! She cried, peremptorily, stopping him. And then in a quieter tone, And what about Carlier? Is he also in the ditch? Ah, he has money said Chirac, with sad envy. "'You also, one day,' said she. "'You stop, in any case until after Christmas, or we quarrel. 
"'Is it agreed?' Her accent had softened. "'You are too good,' he yielded. "'I cannot quarrel with you. But it pains me to accept—' "'Oh!' she snapped, dropping into the vulgar idiom. "'You make me sweat with your stupid pride. Is it that you call friendship? Go away now. How do you wish that I should succeed with this cake while you station yourself there to distract me?' Four. But in three days, Chirac, with amazing luck, fell into another situation, and on the Journal des Débats, it was the Prussians who had found him a place, the celebrated Péonville, second great chroniqueur of his time, had caught a cold while doing his duty as a National Guard, and had died of pneumonia. The weather was severe again. Soldiers were being frozen to death at Aubervilliers. Péonville's position was taken by another man, whose post was offered to Chirac. He told Sapphire of his good fortune, with unconcealed vanity. "'You with your smile,' she said impatiently, "'one can refuse you nothing.' She behaved just as though Chirac had disgusted her. She humbled him. But with his fellow lodgers, his airs of importance as a member of the editorial staff of the Debat were comical in their ingenuousness. On the very same day, Callier gave notice to leave Sophia. He was comparatively rich, but the habits which had enabled him to arrive at independence in the uncertain vocation of a journalist would not allow him, while he was earning nothing, to spend a sou more than was absolutely necessary. He had decided to join forces with a widowed sister, who was accustomed to parsimony, as parsimony is understood in France, and who was living on hoarded potatoes and wine. "'There,' said Sophia, "'you have lost me a tenant.' And she insisted, half jocularly and half seriously, that Carlier was leaving because he could not stand Chirac's infantile conceit. The flat was full of acrimonious words. On Christmas morning Chirac lay in bed rather late. The newspapers did not appear that day. Paris seemed to be in a sort of stupor. About eleven o'clock he came to the kitchen door. "'I must speak with you,' he said. His tone impressed Sophia. "'Enter,' said she. He went in, and closed the door like a conspirator. "'We must have a little fate,' he said. "'You and I.' "'Fate?' she repeated. "'What an idea! How can I leave?' If the idea had not appealed to the secrecies of her heart, stirring desires and souvenirs upon which the dust of time lay thick, she would not have begun by suggesting difficulties. She would have begun by a flat refusal. "'That is nothing,' he said vigorously. "'It is Christmas, and I must have a chat with you. We cannot chat here. I have not had a true little chat with you since you were ill. You will come with me to a restaurant for lunch.' She laughed. "'And the lunch of my lodgers?' "'You will serve it a little earlier. We will go out immediately afterwards.' and we will return in time for you to prepare dinner. It is quite simple. She shook her head. You're mad, she said crossly. It is necessary that I should offer you something, he went on, scowling. You comprehend me. I wish you to lunch with me today. I demand it, and you are not going to refuse me. He was very close to her in the little kitchen, and he spoke fiercely, bullyingly, exactly as she had spoken to him when insisting that he should live on credit with her for a while. "'You're very rude,' she parried. "'If I am rude, it is all the same to me,' he held out uncompromisingly. "'You will lunch with me. I hold to it.' "'How can I be dressed?' she protested. "'That does not concern me. Arrange that as you can.' It was the most curious invitation to a Christmas dinner imaginable. At a quarter past twelve they issued forth, side by side, heavily clad, into the mournful streets. The sky, slate-coloured, presaged snow. The air was bitterly cold and yet damp. There were no fiacres in the little three-cornered place which forms the mouth of the Rue Closel. In the Rue Notre-Dame-de-Lorette a single empty omnibus was toiling up the steep, glassy slope, the horses slipping and recovering themselves in response to the whip-cracking which sounded in the streets as in an empty vault. Higher up, in the Rue Fontaine, one of the few shops that were open, displayed this announcement. A large selection of cheeses for New Year's gifts. They laughed. 
"'Last year, at this moment,' said Chirac, "'I was thinking of only one thing, the masked ball at the opera. I could not sleep after it. This year even the churches are not open. And you?' She put her lips together. "'Do not ask me,' she said. They proceeded in silence. "'We are triste, we others,' he said. "'But the Prussians, in their trenches, they cannot be so gay either. "'Their families and their Christmas trees must be lacking to them. "'Let us laugh.' "'The Place Blanche and the Boulevard de Clichy "'were no more lively than the lesser streets and squares. "'There was no life anywhere, scarcely a sound, "'not even the sound of a cannon. "'Nobody knew anything. "'Christmas had put the city into a lugubrious trance of hopelessness.' Chirac took Sophia's arm across the Place Blanche, and a few yards up the Rue Les Piques, he stopped at a small restaurant, famous among the initiated and known as the Little Louis. They entered, descending by two steps into a confined and sombrely picturesque interior. Sophia saw that they were expected. Chirac must have paid a previous visit to the restaurant that morning. Several disordered tables showed that people had already lunched and left but in the corner was a table for two, freshly laid in the best manner of such restaurants, that is to say, with a red and white check cloth, and two other red and white cloths, almost as large as the tablecloth, folded as serviettes, and arranged flat on two thick plates between solid steel cutlery. A salt cellar, out of which one ground rock salt by turning a handle, a pepper caster, two knife rests, and two common tumblers. The phenomena which differentiated this table from the ordinary table were a champagne bottle and a couple of champagne glasses. Champagne was one of the few items which had not increased in price during the siege. The landlord and his wife were eating in another corner, a fat, slatternly pair, whom no privations of a siege could have emaciated. The landlord rose. He was dressed as a chef, all in white, with the sacred cap, but a soiled white. Everything in the place was untidy, unkempt, and more or less unclean, except just the table upon which champagne was waiting. And yet the restaurant was agreeable, reassuring. The landlord greeted his customers as honest friends. His greasy face was honest, and so was the pale, weary, humorous face of his wife. Chirac saluted her. "'You see,' said she, across from the other corner, indicating a bone on her plate, "'This is Diane.' "'Ah, the poor animal!' exclaimed Chirac sympathetically. "'What would you?' said the landlady. "'It cost too dear to feed her, and she was so mignon. "'One could not watch her grow thin.' "'I was saying to my wife,' the landlord put in, "'how she would have enjoyed that bone, Diane!' Oh, he roared with laughter. Sophia and the landlady exchanged a curious sad smile at this pleasantry, which had been rediscovered by the landlord for perhaps the thousandth time during the siege, but which he evidently regarded as quite new and original. "'Eh, hey, well,' he continued confidentially to Chirac, "'I have found for you something very good. Half a duck!' And in a still lower tone, "'And it will not cost you too dear.' No attempt to realise more than a modest profit was ever made in that restaurant. It possessed a regular clientele who knew the value of the little money they had, and who knew also how to appreciate sincere and accomplished cookery. The landlord was the chef, and he was always referred to as the chef, even by his wife. "'How did you get that?' Chirac asked. "'Ah,' said the landlord mysteriously, "'I have one of my friends who comes from Villeneuve-Saint-Georges. Refugee, you know. In fine a wave of a fat hand, suggesting that Chirac should not inquire too closely. "'In effect,' Chirac commented, "'but it is very chic, that.' "'I believe you that it is chic,' said the landlady sturdily. "'It is charming,' Sophia murmured politely. "'And then quite a little salad,' said the landlord. "'But that, that is still more striking,' said Chirac. The landlord winked. The fact was that the commerce which resulted in fresh green vegetables in the heart of a beleaguered town was notorious. "'And then also a quite little cheese,' said Sophia, slightly imitating the tone of the landlord, as she drew from the inwardness of her cloak a small round parcel. It contained a brie cheese, in fairly good condition. 
It was worth at least fifty francs, and it had cost Sophia less than two francs. The landlady joined the landlord in inspecting this wondrous jewel. Sophia seized a knife and cut a slice for the landlady's table. "'Madame is too good,' said the landlady, confused by this noble generosity, and bearing the gift off to her table, as a fox-terrier will hurriedly seek solitude with a sumptuous morsel. The landlord beamed. Chirac was enchanted. In the intimate and unaffected cosiness of that interior, the vast, stupefied melancholy of the city seemed to be forgotten, to have lost its sway. Then the landlord brought a hot brick for the feet of Madame. It was more of an acknowledgment of the slice of cheese than a necessity, for the restaurant was very warm. The tiny kitchen opened directly into it, and the door between the two was open. There was no ventilation whatever. "'It is a friend of mine,' said the landlord proudly, in the way of gossip, as he served an undescribed soup, a butcher in the Faubourg Saint-Honoré, who has bought the three elephants of the Jardin des Plantes for twenty-seven thousand francs. Eyebrows were lifted. He uncorked the champagne. As she drank the first mouthful, she had long lost her youthful aversion for wine. Sophia had a glimpse of herself in a tilted mirror, hung rather high on the opposite wall. It was several months since she had attired herself with ceremoniousness. The sudden unexpected vision of elegance and pallid beauty pleased her, and the instant effect of the champagne was to renew in her mind a forgotten conception of the goodness of life and of the joys which she had so long missed. Five. At half-past two they were alone in the little salon of the restaurant, and vaguely, in their dreamy and feverish minds that were too preoccupied to control with precision their warm, relaxed bodies, there floated the illusion that the restaurant belonged to them, and that in it they were at home. It was no longer a restaurant, but a retreat and shelter from hard life. The chef and his wife were dozing in an inner room, the champagne was drunk, the adorable cheese was eaten, and they were sipping Marc de Bourgogne. They sat at right angles to one another, close to one another, with brains a-swing, full of good nature and quick sympathy, their flesh content and yet expectant. In a pause of the conversation, which, entirely banal and fragmentary, had seemed to reach the acme of agreeableness, Chirac put his hand on the hand of Sophia as it rested limp on the littered table. Accidentally, she caught his eye. She had not meant to do so. They both became self-conscious. His thin, bearded face had more than ever that wistfulness which always softened towards him the uncompromisingness of her character. He had the look of a child. For her, Gerald had sometimes shown the same look. But, indeed, she was now one of those women with whom all men, and especially all men in a tender mood, are invested with a certain incurable quality of childishness. She had not withdrawn her hand at once, and so she could not withdraw it at all. He gazed at her with timid audacity. Her eyes were liquid. "'What are you thinking about?' she asked. "'I was asking myself what I should have done if you had refused to come.' "'And what should you have done?' "'Assuredly something terribly inconvenient.' he replied, with the large importance of a man who was in the domain of pure supposition. He leant towards her. "'My very dear friend,' he said, in a different voice, getting bolder. It was infinitely sweet to her, voluptuously sweet, this basking in the heat of temptation. It certainly did seem to her, then, the one real pleasure in the world. Her body might have been saying to his, "'See how ready I am!' Her body might have been saying to his, Look into my mind. For you I have no modesty. Look and see all that is there. The veil of convention seemed to have been rent. Their attitude to each other was almost that of lover and mistress, between whom a single glance may be charged with the secrets of the past and promises for the future. Morally she was his mistress in that moment. He released her hand and put his arm round her waist. "'I love thee,' he whispered with great emotion. 
Her face changed and hardened. "'You must not do that,' she said. She scowled. She would not abate one crease in her forehead to the appeal of his surprised glance. Yet she did not want to repulse him. The instinct which repulsed him was not within her control. Just as a shy man will obstinately refuse an invitation which he is hungering to accept, so, though not from shyness, she was compelled to repulse Chirac. Perhaps if her desires had not been laid to sleep by excessive physical industry and nervous strain, the sequel might have been different. Chirac, like most men who have once found a woman weak, imagined that he understood women profoundly. He thought of women as the Occidental thinks of the Chinese, as a race apart, mysterious, but capable of being infallibly comprehended by the application of a few leading principles of psychology. Moreover, he was in earnest. He was hard-driven, and he was honest. He continued, respectfully obedient, in withdrawing his arm. "'Very dear friend,' he urged, with undaunted confidence, "'you must know that I love you.' She shook her head impatiently, all the time wondering what it was that prevented her from slipping into his arms. She knew that she was treating him badly by this brusque change of front, but she could not help it. Then she began to feel sorry for him. "'We have been good friends,' he said. "'I have always admired you enormously. I did not think that I should dare to love you until that day when I overheard that old villain Neeps making his advances. Then, when I perceived my acute jealousy, I knew that I was loving you. Ever since I have thought only of you, I swear to you, that if you will not belong to me it is already finished for me, altogether. Never have I seen a woman like you, so strong, so proud, so kind. You are astonishing, yes, astonishing. No other woman could have drawn herself out of an impossible situation as you have done, since the disappearance of your husband. For me you are a woman unique. I am very sincere. Besides, you know it, dear friend. She shook her head passionately. She did not love him, but she was moved, and she wanted to love him. She wanted to yield to him, only liking him, and to love afterwards. But this obstinate instinct held her back. "'I do not say now,' Chirac went on. "'Let me hope.' The Latin theatricality of his gestures and his tone made her sorrowful for him. "'My poor Chirac,' she plaintively murmured and began to put on her gloves. "'I shall hope,' he persisted. She pursed her lips. He seized her violently by the waist. She drew her face away from his, firmly. She was not hard, not angry now. Disconcerted by her compassion, he loosed her. "'My poor Chirac,' she said, "'I ought not to have come. I must go. It is perfectly useless. Believe me.' "'No, no!' he whispered fiercely. She stood up and the abrupt movement pushed the table gratingly across the floor. The throbbing spell of the flesh was snapped like a stretched string, and the scene over. The landlord, roused from his doze, stumbled in. Chirac had nothing but the bill as a reward for his pains. He was baffled. They left the restaurant, silently, with a foolish air. Dusk was falling on the mournful streets, and the lamplighters were lighting the miserable oil lamps that had replaced gas. They, too, and the lamplighters and an omnibus were alone in the streets. The gloom was awful. It was desolating. The universal silence seemed to be the silence of despair. Steeped in woe, Sophia thought wearily upon the hopeless problem of existence— for it seemed to her that she and Chirac had created this woe out of nothing, and yet it was an incurable woe. CHAPTER Seven, SUCCESS 1. Sophia lay awake one night in the room lately quitted by Callier. That silent negation of individuality had come and gone, and left scarcely any record of himself, either in his room or in the memories of those who surrounded his existence in the house. Sophia had decided to descend from the sixth floor, partly because the temptation of a large room, after months in a cubicle, was rather strong, but more because of late she had been obliged to barricade the door of the cubicle with a chest of drawers, owing to the propensities of a new tenant of the sixth floor. It was useless to complain to the concierge. 
The sole effective argument was the chest of drawers, and even that was frailer than Sophia could have wished. Hence, finally, her retreat. She heard the front door of the flat open. Then it was shut with nervous violence. The resonance of its closing would certainly have wakened less accomplished sleepers than Monsieur Niepce and his friend, whose snores continued with undisturbed regularity. After a pause of shuffling, a match was struck, and feet crept across the corridor with the most exaggerated precautions against noise. There followed the unintentional bang of another door. It was decidedly the entry of a man without the slightest natural aptitude for furtive eruptions. The clock in M. Niepce's room, which the grocer had persuaded to exact timekeeping, chimed three with its delicate ting. For several days past, Chirac had been mysteriously engaged very late at the bureau of the Debats. No one knew the nature of his employment. He said nothing except to inform Sophia that he would continue to come home about three o'clock until further notice. She had insisted on leaving in his room the materials and apparatus for a light meal. Naturally he had protested, with the irrational obstinacy of a physically weak man, who sticks to it that he can defy the laws of nature, but he had protested in vain. His general conduct since Christmas Day had frightened Sophia, in spite of her tendency to stifle facile alarms at their birth. He had eaten scarcely anything at all, and he went about with the face of a man dying of a broken heart. The change in him was indeed tragic, and instead of improving he grew worse. "'Have I done this?' Sophia asked herself. "'It is impossible that I should have done this. It is absurd and ridiculous that he should behave so.' Her thoughts were employed alternately in sympathising with him and in despising him, in blaming herself and in blaming him. When they spoke, they spoke awkwardly, as though one or both of them had committed a shameful crime which could not even be mentioned. The atmosphere of the flat was tainted by the horror, and Sophia could not offer him a bowl of soup without wondering how he would look at her, or avoid looking, and without carefully arranging in advance her own gestures and speech. The existence was a nightmare of self-consciousness. "'At last they have unmasked their batteries!' he had exclaimed with painful gaiety two days after Christmas, when the besiegers had recommenced their cannonade. He tried to imitate the strange general joy of the city, which had been roused from apathy by the recurrence of a familiar noise, but the effort was a deplorable failure, and Sophia condemned not merely the failure of Chirac's imitation, but the thing imitated. Childish, she thought, yet despise the feebleness of Chirac's behaviour as she might, she was deeply impressed, genuinely astonished, by the gravity and persistence of the symptoms. He must have been getting himself into a state about me for a long time, she thought. Surely he could not have gone mad like this all in a day or two. But I never noticed anything. No, honestly, I never noticed anything. And just as her behaviour in the restaurant had shaken Chirac's confidence in his knowledge of the other sex, so now the singular behaviour of Chirac shook hers. She was taken aback. She was frightened, though she pretended not to be frightened. She had lived over and over again the scene in the restaurant. She asked herself over and over again if really she had not beforehand expected him to make love to her in the restaurant. She could not decide exactly when she had begun to expect a declaration, but probably a long time before the meal was finished. She had foreseen it, and might have stopped it, but she had not chosen to stop it. Curiosity concerning not merely him, but also herself, had tempted her tacitly to encourage him. She asked herself over and over again why she had repulsed him. Was it because she was a married woman? Was it because she had moral scruples? Was it at bottom because she did not care for him? Was it because she could not care for anybody? Was it because his fervid manner of love-making offended her English phlegm? And did she feel pleased or displeased by his forbearance in not renewing the assault? She could not answer. She did not know. But all the time she knew that she wanted love. Only she conceived a different kind of love, placid, regular, somewhat stern, somewhat above the plane of whims, moods, caresses, and all mere fleshly contacts. Not that she considered she despised these things, though she did. What she wanted was a love that was too proud, too independent, to exhibit frankly either its joy or its pain. 
she hated a display of sentiment. And even in the most intimate abandonments she would have made reserves, and would have expected reserves, trusting to a lover's powers of divination, and to her own. The foundation of her character was a haughty moral independence, and this quality was what she most admired in others. Chirac's inability to draw from his own pride strength to sustain himself against the blow of her refusal, gradually killed in her the sexual desire which he had aroused, and which, during a few days, flickered up under the stimulus of fancy and of regret. Sophia saw with increasing clearness that her unreasoning instinct had been right in saying him nay, and when, in spite of this, regret still visited her, she would comfort herself in thinking, "'I cannot be bothered with all that sort of thing. It is not worth while. What does it lead to? Is not life complicated enough without that? No, no, I will stay as I am. At any rate I know what I am in for as things are.' And she would reflect upon her hopeful financial situation, and the approaching prospect of a constantly sufficient income and a little thrill of impatience against the interminable and gigantic foolishness of the siege would take her. But her self-consciousness, in presence of Chirac, did not abate. As she lay in bed, she awaited accustomed sounds, which should have connoted Chirac's definite retirement for the night. Her ear, however, caught no sound whatever from his room. Then she imagined that there was a smell of burning in the flat. She sat up and sniffed anxiously of a sudden wide awake and apprehensive. And then she was sure that the smell of burning was not in her imagination. The bedroom was in perfect darkness. Feverishly she searched with her right hand for the matches on the night-table, and knocked candlestick and matches to the floor. She seized her dressing-gown, which was spread over the bed, and put it on, aiming for the door. Her feet were bare. She discovered the door. In the passage she could discern nothing at first, and then she made out a thin line of light, which indicated the bottom of Chirac's door. The smell of burning was strong and unmistakable. She went towards the faint light, fumbled for the door-handle with her palm, and opened. It did not occur to her to call out and ask what was the matter. The house was not on fire, but it might have been. She had left on the table at the foot of Chirac's bed a small cooking-lamp and a saucepan of bouillon. All that Chirac had to do was to ignite the lamp and put the saucepan on it. He had ignited the lamp, having previously raised the double wicks, and had then dropped into the chair by the table just as he was, and sunk forward, and gone to sleep with his head lying sideways on the table. He had not put the saucepan on the lamp, he had not lowered the wicks, and the flames, capped with thick black smoke, were waving slowly to and fro within a few inches of his loose hair. His hat had rolled along the floor. He was wearing his great overcoat and one woollen glove. The other glove had lodged on his slanting knee. A candle was also burning. Sophia hastened forward, as it were surreptitiously, and with a forward-reaching movement turned down the wicks of the lamp. Black specks were falling on the table. Happily the saucepan was covered, or the bouillon would have been ruined. Chirac made a heart-rending spectacle and Sophia was aware of the deep and painful emotion in seeing him thus. He must have been utterly exhausted and broken by loss of sleep. He was a man incapable of regular hours, incapable of treating his body with decency. Though going to bed at three o'clock, he had continued to rise at his usual hour. He looked like one dead, but more sad, more wistful. Out in the street a fog reigned, and his thin, draggled beard was jewelled with the moisture of it. His attitude had the unconsidered and violent prostration of an overspent dog. The beaten animal in him was expressed in every detail of that posture. It showed even in his white drawn eyelids, and in the falling of a finger. All his face was very sad. It appealed for mercy, as the undefended face of sleep always appeals. It was so helpless, so exposed, so simple. It recalled Sophia to a sense of the inner mysteries of life reminding her somehow that humanity walked ever on a thin crust over terrific abysses. She did not physically shudder, but her soul shuddered. She mechanically placed the saucepan on the lamp, and the noise awakened Chirac. He groaned. At first he did not perceive her. When he saw that someone was looking down at him, 
he did not immediately realise who this someone was. He rubbed his eyes with his fists, exactly like a baby, and sat up, and the chair cracked. "'What, then?' he demanded. "'Oh, madame, I, I ask for pardon. What?' "'You have nearly destroyed the house,' she said. "'I smelt fire, and I came in. I was just in time. There is no danger now, but please be careful.' She made as if to move towards the door. "'But what did I do?' he asked, his eyelids wavering. She explained. He rose from his chair unsteadily. She told him to sit down again, and he obeyed, as though in a dream. "'I can go now,' she said. "'Wait one moment,' he murmured. "'I ask pardon. I should not know how to thank you. You are truly too good. Will you wait one moment?' His tone was one of supplication. He gazed at her, a little dazzled by the light and by her. The lamp and the candle illumined the lower part of her face theatrically, and showed the texture of her blue flannel peignoir. The pattern of a part of the lace collar was silhouetted in shadow on her cheek. Her face was flushed, and her hair hung down unconfined. Evidently he could not recover from his excusable astonishment at the apparition of such a figure in his room. "'What is it now?' she said. The faint quizzical emphasis which she put on the now indicated the essential of her thought. The sight of him touched her, and filled her with a womanly sympathy. But that sympathy was only the envelope of her disdain of him. She could not admire weakness. She could but pity it, with a pity in which scorn was mingled. Her instinct was to treat him as a child. He had failed in human dignity, and it seemed to her as if she had not previously been quite certain whether she could not love him, but that now she was quite certain. She was close to him. She saw the wounds of a soul that could not hide its wounds, and she resented the sight. She was hard. She would not make allowances. And she revelled in her hardness. Contempt, a good-natured, kindly, forgiving contempt, that was the kernel of the sympathy which exteriorly warmed her. Contempt for the lack of self-control which had resulted in this swift degeneration of a man into a tortured victim. Contempt for the lack of perspective, which magnified a mere mushroom passion till it filled the whole field of life. Contempt for this feminine slavery to sentiment. She felt that she might have been able to give herself to Chirac as one gives a toy to an infant. But of loving him? No. She was conscious of an immeasurable superiority to him for she was conscious of the freedom of a strong mind. I, "'I wanted to tell you,' said he, "'I am going away.' "'Where?' she asked. "'Out of Paris.' "'Out of Paris? How?' "'By balloon. My journal. It is an affair of great importance. You understand, I offered myself. What would you?' "'It is dangerous,' she observed waiting to see if he would put on the silly air of one who does not understand fear. "'Oh!' the poor fellow muttered, with the fatuous intonation and the snapping of the fingers. Oh, "'That is all the same to me. Yes, it is dangerous. Yes, it is dangerous,' he repeated. "'But what would you? For me?' She wished that she had not mentioned danger. It hurt her to watch him incurring her ironic disdain. "'It will be the night after to-morrow.' he said, in the courtyard with the garde you know. I want you to come and see me go. I particularly want you to come and see me go. I have asked Carlier to escort you. He might have been saying, I am offering myself to martyrdom, and you must assist at the spectacle. She despised him yet more. Oh, be tranquil, he said. I shall not worry you. Never shall I speak to you again of my love. I know you. I know it would be useless. "'But I hope you will come and wish me bon voyage.' "'Of course, if you really wish it,' she replied with cheerful coolness. He seized her hand and kissed it. Once it had pleased her when he kissed her hand, but now she did not like it. It seemed hysterical and foolish to her. She felt her feet to be stone cold on the floor. "'I'll leave you now,' she said. "'Please eat your soup.' She escaped hoping he would not espy her feet. 2. The courtyard of the Nord railway station was lighted by oil lamps taken from locomotives. 
their silvered reflectors threw dazzling rays from all sides on the under portion of the immense yellow mass of the balloon. The upper portion was swaying to and fro with gigantic ungainliness in the strong breeze. It was only a small balloon, as balloons are measured, but it seemed monstrous as it wavered over the human forms that were agitating themselves beneath it. The cordage was silhouetted against the yellow taffetas as high up as the widest diameter of the balloon, but above that all was vague, and even spectators standing at a distance could not clearly separate the summit of the great sphere from the darkly moving sky. The car, held by ropes fastened to stakes, rose now and then a few inches uneasily from the ground. The sombre and severe architecture of the station buildings enclosed the balloon on every hand. It had only one way of escape. Over the roofs of that architecture, which shut out the sounds of the city, came the irregular booming of the bombardment. Shells were falling in the southern quarters of Paris, doing perhaps not a great deal of damage, but still plunging occasionally into the midst of some domestic interior, and making a sad mess of it. The Parisians were convinced that the shells were aimed maliciously at hospitals and museums, and when a child happened to be blown to pieces, their unspoken comments upon the Prussian savagery were bitter. Their faces said, "'Those barbarians cannot even spare our children.' They amused themselves by creating a market in shells, paying more for a live shell than a dead one, and modifying the tariff according to the supply. And as the cattle market was empty, and the vegetable market was empty, and beasts no longer pastured on the grass of the parks, and the twenty-five million rats of the metropolis were too numerous to furnish interest to spectators, and the bourse was practically deserted, the traffic in shells sustained the starving mercantile instinct during a very dull period. But the effect on the nerves was deleterious. The nerves of everybody were like nothing but a raw wound. Violent anger would spring up magically out of laughter, and blows out of caresses. This indirect consequence of the bombardment was particularly noticeable in the group of men under the balloon. Each behaved as if he were controlling his temper in the most difficult circumstances. Constantly they all gazed upwards into the sky, though nothing could possibly be distinguished there, save the blurred edge of a flying cloud. But the booming came from that sky, the shells that were dropping on Mont Rouge came out of that sky, and the balloon was going up into it. The balloon was ascending into its mysteries, to brave its dangers, to sweep over the encircling ring of fire and savages. Sophia stood apart with Carlier. Carlier had indicated a particular spot, under the shelter of the colonnade, where he said it was imperative that they should post themselves. Having guided Sophia to this spot, and impressed upon her that they were not to move, he seemed to consider that the activity of his role was finished, and spoke no word. With the very high silk hat which he always wore, and a thin old-fashioned overcoat whose collar was turned up, he made rather a grotesque figure. Fortunately the night was not very cold, or he might have passively frozen to death on the edge of that feverish group. Sophia soon ignored him. She watched the balloon. An aristocratic old man leant against the car, watch in hand. At intervals he scowled or stamped his foot. An old sailor, tranquilly smoking a pipe, walked round and round the balloon, staring at it. Once he climbed up into the rigging, and once he jumped into the car and angrily threw out a bag which someone had placed in it. But for the most part he was calm. Other persons of authority hurried about, talking and gesticulating, and a number of workmen waited idly for orders. "'Where is Chirac?' suddenly cried the old man with the watch. Several voices deferentially answered, and a man ran away into the gloom on an errand. Then Chirac appeared, nervous, self-conscious, restless. He was enveloped in a fur coat that Sophia had never seen before, and he carried, dangling in his hand, a cage containing six pigeons, whose whiteness stirred uneasily within it. The sailor took the cage from him, and all the persons of authority gathered round to inspect the wonderful birds, upon which, apparently, momentous affairs depended. When the group separated, the sailor was to be seen bending over the edge of the car to deposit the cage safely. He then got into the car, still smoking his pipe, and perched himself negligently on the wickerwork. The man with the watch was conversing with Chirac. 
Chirac nodded his head frequently in acquiescence, and seemed to be saying all the time, "'Yes, sir. Perfectly, sir. I understand, sir. Yes, sir.' Suddenly Chirac turned to the car and put a question to the sailor, who shook his head, whereupon Chirac gave a gesture of submissive despair to the man with the watch, and in an instant the whole throng was in a ferment. "'The victuals!' cried the man with the watch. "'The victuals! Name of God! Must one be indeed an idiot to forget the victuals? Name of God! Of God!' Sophia smiled at the agitation, and at the inefficient management, which had never thought of food, for it appeared that the food had not merely been forgotten. It was a question which had not even been considered. She could not help despising all that crowd of self-important and fussy males, to whom the idea had not occurred that even balloonists must eat, and she wondered whether everything was done like that. After a delay that seemed very long, the problem of victuals was solved, chiefly, as far as Sophia could judge, by means of cakes of chocolate and bottles of wine. "'It is enough! It is enough!' Chirac shouted passionately several times to a knot of men, who began to argue with him. Then he gazed round furtively, and with an inflation of the chest and the patting of his fur coat, he came directly towards Sophia. Evidently, Sophia's position had been prearranged between him and Carlier. They could forget food, but they could think of Sophia's position. All eyes followed him. Those eyes could not, in the gloom, distinguish Sophia's beauty, but they could see that she was young and slim and elegant and of foreign carriage. That was enough. The very air seemed to vibrate with the intense curiosity of those eyes. And immediately Chirac grew into the hero of some brilliant and romantic adventure. Immediately he was envied and admired by every man of authority present. What was she? Who was she? Was it a serious passion, or simply a caprice? Had she flung herself at him? It was undeniable that lovely creatures did sometimes fling themselves at lucky mediocrities. Was she a married woman? An artiste? A girl? Such queries thumped beneath overcoats, while the correctness of a ceremonial demeanour was strictly observed. Chirac uncovered and kissed her hand. The wind disarranged his hair. She saw that his face was very pale and anxious, beneath the swagger of a sincere desire to be brave. "'Well, it is the moment,' he said. "'Did you forget all the food?' she asked. He shrugged his shoulders. "'What will you? One cannot think of everything.' "'I hope you will have a safe voyage,' she said. She had already taken leave of him once in the house, and heard all about the balloon and the sailor aeronaut and the preparations, and now she had nothing to say, nothing whatever. He shrugged his shoulders again. "'I hope so,' he murmured, but in a tone to convey that he had no such hope. "'The wind isn't too strong?' she suggested. He shrugged his shoulders again. <gasps> "'What would you? Is it in the direction you want?' "'Yes, nearly,' he admitted, unwillingly. Then, rousing himself, "'Eh, well, madame, you have been extremely amiable to come. I held to it very much that you should come. It is because of you I quit Paris.' She resented the speech by a frown. "'Ah!' he implored in a whisper. "'Do not do that. Smile on me. After all, it is not my fault. Remember, this may be the last time I see you, the last time I regard your eyes.' She smiled. She was convinced of the genuineness of the emotion which expressed itself in all this flamboyant behaviour, and she had to make excuses to herself on behalf of Chirac. She smiled to give him pleasure. The hard common sense in her might sneer. But indubitably she was the centre of a romantic episode. The balloon darkly swinging there, the men waiting, the secrecy of the mission, and Chirac, bareheaded in the wind that was to whisk him away, telling her in fatalistic accents that her image had devastated his life, while envious aspirants watched their colloquy. Yes, it was romantic, and she was beautiful. Her beauty was an active reality that went about the world playing tricks in spite of herself. The thoughts that passed through her mind were the large, splendid thoughts of romance, and it was Chirac who had aroused them. A real drama existed then, triumphing over the accidental absurdities and pettinesses of the situation. Her final words to Chirac were tender and encouraging. 
He hurried back to the balloon, resuming his cap. He was received with the respect due to one who comes fresh from conquest. He was sacred. Sophia rejoined Carlier, who had withdrawn, and began to talk to him with a self-conscious garrulity. She spoke without reason, and scarcely noticed what she was saying. Already Chirac was snatched out of her life, as other beings, so many of them, had been snatched. She thought of their first meetings, and of the sympathy which had always united them. He had lost his simplicity now in the self-created crisis of his fate, and had sunk in her esteem. And she was determined to like him all the more, because he had sunk in her esteem. She wondered whether he really had undertaken this adventure from sentimental disappointment. She wondered whether, if she had not forgotten to wind her watch one night, they would still have been living quietly under the same roof in the Rue Breda. The sailor climbed definitely into the car. He had covered himself with a large cloak. Chirac had got one leg over the side of the car, and eight men were standing by the ropes, when a horse's hooves clattered through the guarded entrance to the courtyard, amid an uproar of sudden excitement. The shiny chest of the horse was flecked with the classic foam. "'A telegram from the Governor of Paris!' As the orderly, checking his mount, approached the group, even the old man with the watch raised his hat. The orderly responded, bent down to make an inquiry, which Chirac answered, and then, with another exchange of salutes, the official telegram was handed over to Chirac, and the horse backed away from the crowd. It was quite thrilling. Carlier was thrilled. "'He is never too prompt, the governor. It is a quality,' said Carlier, with irony. Chirac entered the car, and then the old man with the watch drew a black bag from the shadow behind him and entrusted it to Chirac, who accepted it with a profound deference and hid it. The sailor began to issue commands. The men at the ropes were bending down now. Suddenly the balloon rose about a foot and trembled. The sailor continued to shout. All the persons of authority gazed motionless at the balloon. The moment of suspense was eternal. "'Let go all!' cried the sailor, standing up and clinging to the cordage. Chirac was seated in the car, a mass of dark fur with a small patch of white in it. The men at the ropes were a knot of struggling, confused figures. One side of the car tilted up, and the sailor was nearly pitched out. Three men at the other side had failed to free the ropes. "'Let go, corpses!' the sailor yelled at them. The balloon jumped, as if it were drawn by some terrific impulse from the skies. "'Adieu!' called Chirac, pulling his cap off and waving it. "'Adieu! Bon voyage! Bon voyage!' the little crowd cheered. And then, "'Vive la France!' throats tightened, including Sophia's. But the top of the balloon had leant over, destroying its pear shape, and the whole mass swerved violently towards the wall of the station, the car swinging under it like a toy, and an anchor under the car. There was a cry of alarm. Then the great ball leapt again, and swept over the high glass roof, escaping by inches the spouting. The cheers expired instantly. The balloon was gone. It was spirited away, as if by some furious and mighty power that had grown impatient in waiting for it. There remained a few seconds on the collective retina of the spectators, a vision of the inclined car swinging near the roof like the tail of a kite. And then nothing. Blankness blackness. Already the balloon was lost to sight in the vast stormy ocean of the night, a plaything of the winds. The spectators became once more aware of the dull booming of the cannonade. The balloon was already perhaps flying unseen amid the rack over those guns. Sophia involuntarily caught her breath. A chill of loneliness, of purposeless, numbed her being. Nobody ever saw Chirac or the old sailor again. The sea must have swallowed them. Of the sixty-five balloons that left Paris during the siege, two were not heard of. This was the first of the two. Chirac had, at any rate, not magnified the peril, though his intention was undoubtedly to magnify it. 3. This was the end of Sophia's romantic adventures in France. Soon afterwards the Germans entered Paris by mutual agreement, and made a point of seeing the Louvre, and departed, amid the silence of a city. For Sophia the conclusion of the siege meant chiefly that prices went down. 
long before supplies from outside could reach Paris, the shop windows were suddenly full of goods which had arrived from the shopkeepers alone knew where. Sophia, with the stock in her cellar, could have held out for several weeks more, and it annoyed her that she had not sold more of her good things while good things were worth gold. The signing of a treaty at Versailles reduced the value of Sophia's two remaining hams from about five pounds apiece to the usual price of hams. However, at the end of January she found herself in possession of a capital of about eight thousand francs, all the furniture of the flat, and a reputation. She had earned it all. Nothing could destroy the structure of her beauty, but she looked worn and appreciably older. She wondered often when Chirac would return. She might have written to Carlier or to the paper, but she did not. It was Neeps who discovered in a newspaper that Chirac's balloon had miscarried. At the moment the news did not affect her at all, but after several days she began to feel her loss in a dull sort of way, and she felt it more and more, though never acutely. She was perfectly convinced that Chirac could never have attracted her powerfully. She continued to dream at rare intervals of the kind of passion that would have satisfied her, glowing but banked down like a fire in some fine chamber of a rich but careful household. She was speculating upon what her future would be, and whether by inertia she was doomed to stay for ever in the Rue Breda when the Commune caught her. She was more vexed than frightened by the Commune, vexed that a city so in need of repose and industry should indulge in such antics. For many people the Commune was a worse experience than the siege, but not for Sophia. She was a woman and a foreigner. Neeps was infinitely more disturbed than Sophia. He went in fear of his life. Sophia would go out to market and take her chances. It is true that during one period the whole population of the house went to live in the cellars, and orders to the butcher and other tradesmen were given over the party wall into the adjoining courtyard, which communicated with an alley. A strange existence, and possibly perilous. But the women who passed through it, and had also passed through the siege, were not very much intimidated by it unless they happened to have husbands or lovers who were active politicians. Sophia did not cease, during the greater part of the year 1871, to make a living and to save money. She watched every sou, and she developed a tendency to demand from her tenants all that they could pay. She excused this to herself by ostentatiously declaring every detail of her prices in advance. It came to the same thing in the end, with this advantage, that the bills did not lead to unpleasantness. Her difficulties commenced when Paris at last definitely resumed its normal aspect and life, when all the women and children came back to those city termini which they had left in such huddled, hysterical throngs, when flats were reopened that had been long shut, and men who for a whole year had had the disadvantages and the advantages of being without wife and family anchored themselves once more to the hearth. Then it was that Sophia failed to keep all her rooms let. She could have let them easily and constantly, and at high rents, but not to men without encumbrances. Nearly every day she refused attractive tenants in pretty hats, or agreeable gentlemen who only wanted a room on condition that they might offer hospitality to a dashing petticoat. It was useless to proclaim aloud that her house was serious. The ambition of the majority of these joyous persons was to live in a serious house, because each was sure that at bottom he or she was a serious person, and quite different from the rest of the joyous world. The character of Sophia's flat, instead of repelling the wrong kind of aspirant, infallibly drew just that kind. Hope was inextinguishable in these bosoms. They heard that there would be no chance for them at Sophia's, but they tried nevertheless and occasionally Sophia would make a mistake, and grave unpleasantness would occur before the mistake could be rectified. The fact was that the street was too much for her. Few people would credit that there was a serious boarding-house in the Rue Breda. The police themselves would not credit it, and Sophia's beauty was against her. At that time the Rue Breda was perhaps the most notorious street in the centre of Paris, at the height of its reputation as a warren of individual improprieties, most busily creating that prejudice against itself which, over thirty years later, forced the authorities to change its name in obedience to the wish of its tradesmen. When Sophia went out at about eleven o'clock in the morning with her reticule to buy, the street was littered with women who had gone out with reticules to buy. 
but whereas Sophia was fully dressed and wore headgear, the others were in dressing-gown and slippers, or opera cloak and slippers, having slid directly out of unspeakable beds and omitted to brush their hair out of their puffy eyes. In the little shops of the Rue Breda, the Rue Notre-Dame de Lorette, and the Rue des Martyrs, you were very close indeed to the primitive instincts of human nature. It was wonderful, it was amusing, it was excitingly picturesque, and the universality of the manners rendered moral indignation absurd. But the neighbourhood was certainly not one in which a woman of Sophia's race, training and character, could comfortably earn a living, or even exist. She could not fight against the entire street. She, and not the street, was out of place and in the wrong. Little wonder that the neighbours lifted their shoulders when they spoke of her. What beautiful woman but a mad Englishwoman would have the idea of establishing herself in the Rue Breda, with the intention of living like a nun, and compelling others to do the same? By dint of continual ingenuity, Sophia continued to win somewhat more than her expenses, but she was slowly driven to admit to herself that the situation could not last. Then, one day, she saw in Galignani's messenger an advertisement of an English pension for sale in the Rue Lord Byron, in the Champs-Élysées quarter. It belonged to some people named Frensham, and had enjoyed a certain popularity before the war. The proprietor and his wife, however, had not sufficiently allowed for the vicissitudes of politics in Paris. Instead of saving money during their popularity, they had put it on the back and on the fingers of Mrs. Frensham. The siege and the commune had almost ruined them. With capital they might have restored themselves to their former pride, but their capital was exhausted. Sophia answered the advertisement. She impressed the Frenchams, who were delighted with the prospect of dealing in business, with an honest English face. Like many English people abroad, they were most strangely obsessed by the notion that they had quitted an island of honest men to live among thieves and robbers. They always implied that dishonesty was unknown in Britain. They offered, if she would take over the lease, to sell all their furniture and their renown for ten thousand francs. She declined, the price seeming absurd to her. When they asked her to name a price, she said that she preferred not to do so. Upon entreaty, she said four thousand francs. They then allowed her to see that they considered her to have been quite right in hesitating to name a price so ridiculous, and their confidence in the honest English face seemed to have been shocked. Sophia left. When she got back to the Rue Breda, she was relieved that the matter had come to nothing. She did not precisely foresee what her future was to be, but at any rate she knew she shrank from the responsibility of the pension Frenchum. The next morning she received a letter offering to accept six thousand. She wrote and declined. She was indifferent, and she would not budge from four thousand. The Frenchams gave way. They were pained, but they gave way. The glitter of four thousand francs in cash and freedom was too tempting. Thus Sophia became the proprietress of the Pension Frenchum, in the cold and correct Rue Lord Byron. She made room in it for nearly all her other furniture, so that instead of being under-furnished, as pensions usually are, it was over-furnished. She was extremely timid at first, for the rent alone was four thousand francs a year, and the prices of the quarter were alarmingly different from those of the Rue Breda. She lost a lot of sleep. For some nights, after she had been installed in the Rue Lord Byron about a fortnight, she scarcely slept at all, and she ate no more than she slept. She cut down expenditure to the very lowest, and frequently walked over to the Rue Breda to do her marketing. With the aid of a charwoman at six sous an hour, she accomplished everything, and though clients were few, the feat was in the nature of a miracle, for Sophia had to cook. The articles which George Augustus Sala wrote under the title Paris Herself Again ought to have been paid for in gold by the hotel and pension keepers of Paris. They awakened English curiosity and the desire to witness the scene of terrible events. Their effect was immediately noticeable. In less than a year after her adventurous purchase, Sophia had acquired confidence, and she was employing two servants, working them very hard at low wages. She had also acquired the landlady's manner. She was known as Mrs. Frensham. Across the balconies of two windows, the Frenchams had left a gilded sign, Pension Frensham, and Sophia had not removed it. 
She often explained that her name was not Frenchman, but in vain. Every visitor inevitably and persistently addressed her according to the sign. It was past the general comprehension that the proprietors of the Pension Frenchman might bear another name than Frenchman. But later there came into being a class of persons, habitués of the Pension Frenchman, who knew the real name of the proprietors, and were proud of knowing it, and by this knowledge they were distinguished from the herd. What struck Sophia was the astounding similarity of her guests. They all asked the same questions, made the same exclamations, went out on the same excursions, returned with the same judgments, and exhibited the same unimpaired assurance that foreigners were really very peculiar people. They never seemed to advance in knowledge. There was a constant stream of explorers from England, who had to be set on their way to the Louvre or to the Bon Marché. Sophia's sole interest was in her profits. The excellence of her house was firmly established. She kept it up, and she kept the modest prices up. Often she had to refuse guests. She naturally did so with a certain distant condescension. Her manner to guests increased in stiff formality, and she was excessively firm with undesirables. She grew to be seriously convinced that no pension as good as hers existed in the world, or ever had existed, or ever could exist. Hers was the acme of niceness and respectability. Her preference for the respectable rose to a passion, and there were no faults in her establishment. Even the once despised showy furniture of Madame Foucault had mysteriously changed into the best conceivable furniture, and its cracks were hallowed. She never heard a word of Gerald, nor of her family. In the thousands of people who stayed under her perfect roof, no one, not one, mentioned Bursley, nor disclosed a knowledge of anybody that Sophia had known. Several men had the wit to propose marriage to her with more or less skilfulness, but none of them was skilful enough to perturb her heart. She had forgotten the face of love. She was a landlady. She was THE landlady. Efficient, stylish, diplomatic, and tremendously experienced. There was no trickery, no baseness of Parisian life that she was not acquainted with and armed against. She could not be startled, and she could not be swindled. Years passed, until there was a vista of years behind her. Sometimes she would think, in an unoccupied moment, "'How strange it is that I should be here, doing what I am doing!' but the regular ordinariness of her existence would instantly seize her again. At the end of 1878, the exhibition year, her pension consisted of two floors instead of one, and she had turned the two hundred pounds stolen from Gerald into over two thousand. End of Book Three